There we go. Good evening and welcome to the June 9th, 2020 regular city council meeting. If you would like to speak, complete a request to speak form located at the entrance to the council chamber and submit the completed form to the Sergeant at Arms. When your name has been called, use the microphone at the lectern on the audience's right and either state your name and address or name and city. Speak to city council as a body. Do not address the mayor and city council members individually. Be mindful of the timer at the front of the room and wrap up your comments before your speaking time ends. The time limits are posted on the request to speak form. An applicant, representative, or person who has legal standing to support or oppose a quasi-judicial matter will be permitted enough time as reasonably determined by the City Council to create a record before the City Council. So thank you for joining us this evening and we'll begin the invocation with Pastor Terry Dye from the First Baptist Church of South Brevard. If you wish to participate in the invocation, please stand. All right, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are thankful that we live in a land of America. Father, I pray for our city council and those that are in leadership to decide those things that are important to our community. Father, I pray for our state government, our governor, our federal governor, our president, and those also that are important to our society. Father, I pray that in these days we live in, Lord, that we will not join evil, but will overcome evil with good. And Father, thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ that came to die for our sins that we get of life eternal. Lord, I pray that you bless this meeting tonight in a special way. We thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Dye. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, Mr. McEwen. Councilmember Tim Thomas. Here. Councilmember LaRusso. Present. Councilmember Minus. Here. Councilmember Debbie Thomas. Here. Councilmember Sanders. Here. Vice Mayor Alfrey. Here. Mayor Meehan. Here. Next is proclamations and presentations, and I have two, so give me a few minutes while I uh, hobble down. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Proclamation declaring June 13, 2020 as Family Health and Fitness Day and accepted by the Parks and uh, Recreation Director is Nikki Codwell. Oh, hey, very good. Thank you. Roberto and Liberto and Carrie Curry. Okay, very. thank you for coming. Proclamation City of Melbourne, Florida, whereas Parks and Recreation Amenities are vital to the health and wellness of communities across the country, including the city of Melbourne. And whereas these amenities provide inclusive spaces where people of all ages and abilities can focus on health, wellness, and physical activity. And whereas living close to parks and other recreation facilities is consistently related to higher physical activity levels for both adults and youth. And whereas city parks provide a connection to nature, which studies demonstrate relieve stress, tightens interpersonal relationships, and improves mental health. And whereas, in recognition of the benefits of parks and recreation facilities and activities, the National Recreation and Park Association has designated June 13, <clears throat> 2020, as Family Health and Fitness Day to encourage families to utilize these city facilities for their benefit and enjoyment. Now, therefore, 
be it resolved that I, Kathleen H. Meehan, Mayor of City of Melbourne, Brevard County, Florida, do hereby proclaim June 13, 2020 as Family Health and Fitness Day in the City of Melbourne and encourage all citizens to celebrate this occasion by going out and enjoying our parks and recreation amenities. <clears throat> Witness my hand in the seal of the city this ninth day of June, 2020, Kathleen H. Meehan, Mayor. So congratulations and thank you for a fantastic parks that we, I think we have over 22. 40, okay, 40, <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for that proclamation. It is very important that our parks play a part in people's health and wellness and we, we strive to, to make them great. So thank you. All right, thank, thank you. you. Like a picture? All right. Do we have um, someone would take a photo? <laughs> okay. Thank you, Kevin. Yes, thank you. All right, here thank you, you go. Thank you, thank you. Next one. Where's Cheryl when you need her, right? Thank you. All right. <laughs> Next is proclamation declaring June 19th, 2020 as Juneteenth, accepted by Brian Dorville. Oh, is he outside? Yep. Yeah. That's right. Thank you, Kathy. Maybe I can sing a few notes, but then <laughs> people will be throwing tomatoes at me. <laughs> okay. Cool. All right, very good. So I'll go ahead and read it. Proclamation, City of Melbourne, Florida, whereas on September 22nd, 1862, President Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation notifying the states in rebellion against the Union that if they did not cease the rebellion and return to the Union by January 1st, 1863, he would declare their slaves forever free. And whereas June 19th, 1865, referred to as Juneteenth, is considered the date when the last slaves in America were free. And whereas as the symbol for end of slavery, Juneteenth has become a celebration of freedom for many African Americans. Whereas Juneteenth serves as a historical milestone reminding America of the triumph of the human spirit over the cruelty of slavery, honoring those who survived the inhumane institution of bondage, and demonstrating pride in the legacy of resistance and perseverance. And whereas Juneteenth is now celebrated annually across the United States on the weekend nearest June 19th and is the oldest celebration of the end of slavery in the United States. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Kathleen H. Meehan, Mayor, City of Melbourne, Brevard County, Florida, do hereby proclaim uh, June 19, 2020 as Juneteenth in the City of Melbourne. Here. Yeah. Yeah. And witness my hand the seal of the city this ninth day of June 2020, Kathleen H. Meehan, Mayor. Thank you for coming. All right. All right, here you go. Yes, you can. It's Carter, if you want. Yeah. Next is Denise Carter. Hello, Denise. Good to see you. And, yes, go ahead. <coughs> Okay, I'll go ahead and say a few words. Uh, National Home Homeownership Month is in June, 
And uh, in honor of National Home Ownership Month, we asked if we could show a video of the Sunwood Subdivision Project. The video was made to promote the SHIP program and was submitted to the Florida Housing Coalition as a housing success story. Habitat for Humanity of Bavard County collaborated with the City of Melbourne SHIP program, along with a host of corporations, several churches, organizations, and West Shore Junior Senior High School on this project. What makes this project unique? The leveraging of public and private resources that went into these homes, since corporations, churches, organizations, and the Junior Senior High School contributed to this project. This was foreclosed property that was vacant and now being used uh, for a good purpose. Uh, one home was the women's bill and uh, we had the education component already existing in the Booker T. Washington neighborhood. The after school and summer, summer camp programs provided by Bavard Neighborhood Development Co uh, Coalition, Neighbor Up, and Melbourne PAL are assets to these families as the two programs provide free after-school tutoring and minimal costs for summer camp. Thank you to Habitat for Humanity of Bavard County for their work on this project and the videographer, uh, Matt Harrison. And I wanted to thank the city staff that supported this project, the city manager, the city attorney and her staff, and um, city council the uh, community development director, our boss, my boss, uh, Cindy, Cindy Dittmer, and um, her staff, which includes our division, the housing and urban improvement division, the finance and engineering departments, and the building division. We could not have done this project without staff and council support, so thank you. Thank you, Ms. Carter. From foreclosure and blight to 15 new homes in the Sunwood subdivision, Caught in cycles of unpredictable rent increases, overcrowded conditions, homelessness, or lack of access to affordable financing opportunities, 15 families live with a constant burden of uncertainty, stress, and fear because of their housing situation. Habitat for Humanity of Bavard County collaborated with the City of Melbourne SHIP program, along with a host of corporations, churches, and organizations to provide a solution by building low to moderate income priced homes in Melbourne's Sunwood subdivision. These families were faced with numerous obstacles in finding and owning a new home, but they persevered and gladly did whatever was required in hopes of becoming homeowners. Our life before Habitat was hard. It was a constant struggle. Whether to pay our phone bill, our food bill, our water, or power, we struggled every day financially, emotionally, spiritually. It was hard not only on us, but on our kids as well. We were never there for school events or to help with homework. They were sleeping when we got home at night and off to school before we left for work in the morning. We started our journey with Habitat. We never knew what to expect. Three years after we started, we finally got our home. After a small mortgage and smaller utility bills, we were finally able to save a lot of money and start our business. Thirteen of the 15 homes were funded using SHIP funds from the Florida Housing Finance Corporation. The City of Melbourne contributed $302,500 in down payment assistance during a three-year period under the City's Purchase Assistance with Sweat Equity Program to this project. The total project cost $1.7 million. As part of the down payment, each homeowner contributed $1,500 along with 250 sweat equity or working hours. The homes are two, three, and four bedrooms rooms with garages and the homeowners receive a 30-year interest-free mortgage. The average appraisal for the home is $168,000. The average monthly mortgage is less than $700 or more affordable. All of the homeowners had to attend financial management, home ownership, and home maintenance classes. Housing is a wonderful thing. Hope is a marvelous thing and the two work together. This project brought a lot of hope for families in Melbourne. Thank you, Ship, for providing hope. Very good.
Very good. Thank you, Ms. Carter. Next is A5, approval of the minutes uh, of May 18th, special meeting and May 26th, 2020, regular meeting. Council, what is your pleasure? Madam Mayor. Uh, Mr. Thomas. Recommend approval. Second. Second. All right, I have a motion for approval of the May 18th, 2020, special meeting and May 26th, 2020, regular meeting by um, Mr. Thomas, second by Vice Mayor uh, Elfrey. Discussion? Seeing none, those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, and I vote aye, and the motion passes. Item number six is Shannon Lewis, City Manager's Report. Thank you, Mayor. Um, before I begin, I would like to um, turn this over to the City Attorney for a moment. I have some very good news that I want to share with you all. I'd like to invite Frank Scaglione to the podium here. And come on up. This is the new assistant city attorney that we hired. He has started on uh, Monday. Monday. So I wanted to allow him to give a brief introduction about himself. All right. Thank you, Ms. Dolly. Good, good evening, Council. Um, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure to start working here. Um, <clears throat> I was originally an attorney in San Antonio. Um, I went to school at St. Mary's University, and I worked for a firm called uh, Strasburger and Price, which eventually became Clark Hill Strasburger. Uh, there I did commercial or insurance defense and uh, employment litigation. So this is a, a big change for me, but it's a really good change. I'm, I'm really enjoying the work that, that I'm doing here. Um, my, uh, my family and I actually lived here in 2016 when my wife was stationed at Patrick Air Force Base. And um, I was flying back and forth on the weekends, commuting between San Antonio and Satellite Beach. She got tired of that, took a job at Lackland. And as soon as she moved out there, we immediately made plans to start Moving back here uh, took about three years, but um, well, we're finally back. She's getting another job at, La at uh, Patrick again, and um, uh, we're just we're very excited to be here. I was in the Air Force also uh, for about ten years, flying B-1s uh, in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan before uh, becoming a lawyer. All right, thanks, for standing. Welcome. Welcome. I love San Antonio, especially the Riverwalk. Oh, <laughs> I can't believe you're. Well, I love. I love. I like Melbourne. Our, All right. I like our river better, but it's nice <laughs> okay. There too. Okay. Well, I do. Good too, answer. Good answer. Yeah. All right. Thank you for Thank you. being here. Thank you. Appreciate All right. Oh yeah, Miss L Mr. Larusso. Thanks, uh, Allison. How does this change uh, the pecking order for us? Same it as ever was. I try to do a lot of um, cross training in our department. So uh, even though attorneys tend to assist with a particular department, we all know how to do all of it. So we'll continue to do that. Just looking for the proper, uh, you know, a pathway here. Yes. You know, that's all. So, Thank you. I Mayor? appreciate right, it. Yeah, Congratulations on your new position, sir. So, so my question is, can he also be assistant city engineer or do we need one or city engineer? <laughs> I mean, you said he can do it all. <laughs> I'll let, the, I'll let the city right manager now. handle that question. Okay. Well, thank you. Oh, yeah, that's right. You know we're going to haze you, right? I mean, so you know. Okay. Something right. tells me he can take it. Yes. <laughs> All right, Ms. Lewis. Thank you. Two transactional items I want to, to bring to council's attention and to the public. First of all, I just want to clarify, you know, we still have the city council chamber set up for social distancing. Um, we know that some groups come together. We've been spaced out this way for several months now. I just want to make sure it's clear to council and to the public that uh, we know we may be at capacity currently in this room, but we will ensure that every individual that's here to speak tonight under public comment has that opportunity to do so. So it may be a little clunky at times while we help pe get people into the room and out of the room. Um, but I do want to make sure that the public knows that they will have that opportunity to speak this evening. Um, secondly, from a transactional standpoint, at a recent city council meeting, the city council authorized the manager to expend up to $75,000 on the water line uh, along Strawbridge Avenue. Uh, it appears, in, after discussions with DOT, that we do have to have um, formal design uh, and inspection and construction administration services. So we have authorized that. It's underway. That's going to be about $24,000, which is in the city manager's report. At this point, we don't have the hard construction costs, but the engineering staff and the deputy city manager are indicating that it's likely to be about the $75,000 mark since council will not meet again after tonight until July in order to keep this project moving forward. I would need to seek council's authorization to increase the ex uh, expense limit from seventy-five thousand to one hundred or one hundred and ten thousand dollars. 
Uh, yeah, Mr. LaRusso. Yeah, th this is you, Mr. Well, yeah, no, and, and I, I think, well, the council knows uh, already what it's for. It's a, it's a water line extension, puts us a fire hydrant there on uh, in front of the uh, Java. Uh, Java Bar. Um, I, I I think that's a great move. We're already doing all the infrastructure work, uh, and uh, I think it's time instead of doing it, and you know, another year down the road, we have to tear it out again because somebody else needs to. You know, we need to upgrade at that time. So I'm all for it. All right. Yeah. So Mary, uh, uh, can we so. can we just uh, give a a a, a one-time pass uh, yes. to uh, yes, the right. uh, number that the uh, city manager is asking for? I think we need a motion. Right? Yeah, if, if we could we have that. a vote to expend up to that maximum level, that would be appreciated. I'll Thank make you. that motion. Second. All right, so Vice Mayor Elfrey made the motion and second by Ms. Minus. Discussion? Seeing none, those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, and I vote aye. And the motion passes. Okay, I was going to clarify for what the actual expenditure was within that motion. Um, are we going to do 110? Yeah, well, well, are you comfortable at 110? Yeah. Yes. I mean, just, yeah, it may yeah, not be 110, but. Right. Yes. Okay. One, yes. And we'll Is make that it agreeable up with Ms. Minus? Yes. Okay. Then I'll amend the motion for 110. And, okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. If you say it fast, it doesn't sound like a lot. You know, so. All right. Yeah. All right. So you got it. Thank you, uh, Mayor and Council. And in light of all of the actions and activities and events that have occurred over the past couple of weeks, um, I wanted to ask the police chief to come up and provide City Council with some information as it relates to um, the police department and our policies. Yeah, and Ms. Lewis, we need to also uh, let the audience know that in our city, uh, the police chief reports to you. Um, so as a uh, city manager, most cities don't. I think city of West Melbourne, um, the whole council um, is reported. They report it to the chief. So, but in our city, we're different. So yeah, we do operate under the council manager form of government. As, as you're all aware, the mayor and city council members are elected um, by uh, the constituents and you hire employees, you hire the city attorney and myself, and then all of the employees under the council manager form of government work directly for the city manager. All right, very good. So chief, you're on. Good evening, Mayor, Council, uh, Dave Gillespie, Chief of Police, City of Melbourne. Uh, so in light of the recent events in Minneapolis and subsequent to that over the last couple weeks in different cities, even yesterday with some comments that were made by an FOP uh, representative, um, it brings us back to really open to a place where we see and it opens the wounds of racial divide and reminds us of the inequalities of social justice and the sensitivity of police conduct in our country. And I can tell you that the incident that occurred in Minneapolis, I don't think you'll find any police chief or any officer that would support what happened there and the actions of those officers. It's not something we train in here in our agency. It's not something that's in any policy. This was just something that shouldn't have occurred. And obviously it was a tragic result. I can tell you that um, since that's happened, we've done a number of things in the agency, uh, but we have to do a number of things in the profession. Uh, we've reviewed policies, procedures, training programs, the curriculums, uh, increased diversity within our organization to re better reflect the community that we serve. Uh, but even more, it's time for law enforcement to really start talking about police reform. We talk about different things that make change, but we come back, we were just here a few years back with Ferguson, and here we are again today. We don't wanna go through this again in the future. So I think it's time for us as leaders in law enforcement to really talk about the reform that's gonna protect the community and our officers as well. And so I take this responsibility very seriously, and I can tell you that the investment that we have here in Melbourne with our uh, community with specifically our African-American community, our minority community, is something that we work very hard to embrace and to actually really develop and forge a bond and a trusting relationship so they know where we're at, they know our policies, we're transparent and we wanna always be that way. But incidents like this ruin years of progress. In eight, almost nine seconds, you know, we're going back to a time where we've put a lot of work on both sides to make progress and yet it's eroded and you see what happens throughout the community, throughout the country and the riots 
and the different discourse that we've had. Um, I can tell you personally here, as soon as this occurred, I want to meet with our local leaders. I, I immediately met with uh, Joe McNeil, who's here today in the back. And is James here? I don't know if James Minus is not here, but I met with James and also Bishop Gordon uh, to be able to make sure they understood that we didn't agree with what happened, that our policies don't allow that to happen, that they understand what we're doing here internally with our training curriculums and what's important for me to make sure that they understand what we're doing. Um, we've been at a number of the different, um, the candlelight vigil, uh, the, the prayer service that we had here on Front Street, uh, attended the community forum this past weekend uh, in Coco with the other police chiefs and the community. It was a very well-run um, meeting. I uh, attended uh, or participated in a Facebook Live program with Big Brothers, Big Sisters. And with that, uh, one of the other participants was Alton Edmond, who was the facilitator in the COCO meeting um, there. And so we've also looked at our policies. I looked at our policy as far as whether we utilize the vascular neck restraint. It's not really addressed in our policy, but we have trained on it. So I suspended the use of it, and that was done last week. And so we'll take a look at that uh, a little closer take a look at what other agencies are doing and what is best practices and what's going to be best for our for our community and for and for our agency um, we were already working on revisions to our use of force policy our taser policy those have been uh, in the progress with all of our uh, reviews because we are in the process of re uh, getting our, our reaccreditation so um, those policies are just they have been already under review and so we should be able to um, push them out very soon. Um, we've had several protests in the city. All of our protests have been very peaceful, uh, despite what social media says and the things that are, are on social media. The mall didn't burn down. The businesses on O'Galley were not looted. Uh, we've had a very good uh, ability to communicate with the leaders of the protest, to be able to talk to them in advance, and we will continue to do that because we still have every day, we have different protests or walks or marches or what have you. Uh, I'll take this moment to, uh, to put a plug in for Thursday night. We have our own march at Joseph Davis Community Center starting at six, and then we will walk around the block, Brothers Park, We'll come back to the community center at seven o'clock and then we'll ho hold our meeting. We believe we can have about 125 people inside the facility. Uh, we'll use uh, social distancing, take temperatures and, and, and all that, but we wanna make sure that our people are heard and that's something that's very important for, for me and for uh, you know, our, our officers to hear uh, from the community. Um, I can tell you that uh, some of the things that as we look forward, you know, what are some of the things that are going to help us be able to move forward? And the first thing is going to be that relationship and an ongoing relationship with our community, our minority community here locally. I think that is one of the most important keys. The other thing is the review of the policies. We also are taking a look, as you know, I was stood before you in uh, the fall of last year and talked about body cameras. And uh, I think everybody on council supported us getting body cameras. And that's something that we've been in, that has been in the works and we continue down that path. So uh, we're gonna continue that. Uh, we are at the point where we need to sit down with the union and talk about, there's some issues with policy that we just need to work through. And as we do that, then we'll be able to begin a pilot program. So um, that's one of the other things that uh, I think will help us. And then, I, I did uh, some of the meetings that I had that we've been to, they can't be one-time events. They have to be ongoing, they have to be continuing. I know I, I talked with Joe, I think I'm meeting with Joe, uh, maybe too much, he asked if we could cancel our meeting this later this week. But um, we're gonna post, we're gonna continue that every couple weeks or months so that we continue that, that dialogue. And then lastly, I wanted to say, there's a number of things, I'm proud of the community, the way they've handled things, the way they, they really embrace the police department despite all of the things and the narrative that's going on around this country. And so I'm very proud to, to serve in a, in a community that embraces their police department, regardless of what's going on. But also I wanna say that I wanna commend our police officers as well. 
because this has been a tough year through COVID. Uh, policing doesn't stop. They're still responding to all sorts of different types of events. And through all of it, they haven't blinked an eye. They continue to serve every day. And I can tell you that I'm very proud of the way they've handled themselves through the COVID and then also through, uh, you know, the, the aftermath of Minneapolis and all the different events that have come through. Um, we have a professional organization and we have some outstanding individuals. And I just want to say in general, feel very proud to serve with each one of them. So I'll open it up for questions. Thank you, Chief Gillespie. Any questions for Chief Gillespie? Madam Mayor. Yeah, Mr. Thomas. Yeah, I, I would just like to say, just to kind of highlight uh, um, one of the Chief's points is, uh, I went to the prayer vigil, uh, the first one at Front Street, I guess it was a week ago Sunday, uh, that was uh, sponsored by Reverend Laws' church. And then also went to the one uh, this this past Sunday that was sponsored by Elevation Church. And again, the, the multicultural, multicultural uh, lots of races there. Uh, and the, the spirit that was there was just really, really incredible. People coming together in unity um, and really just praying um, for change and praying for justice for those that were involved in that and just uh, really praying for one another in our city, you know, that uh, mm -hmm. we're going we're gonna to get through this and things are going to be better and we're truly going to tr treat each other with dignity and respect. So um, um, both of those events, and the Chief and I talked about, were really kind of like model events, I think, for the nation to see. Of course, you're not going to see that in the in the media anywhere, but uh, they were really well well done, and and the people were very, uh, very uniting. So yeah, very good. I wish I was there. I was in spirit because of my broken ankle. It was real hard to get through the grass, but yeah, it was good. Anyone else? All right. Thank you, Chief. That's Thank you. Good report. Uh, anything else, uh, Miss Lewis? All right, seeing none. All right, public comments. Item seven. Okay, yes, and we also have 7.1 to be added to the agenda, and this is on the We Can't Breathe protest march and peace rally. All right, so do I have any sign-up sheets? Yeah, item seven, public comments. Peter Perone, you have three minutes, and followed by Charles Demings. Uh, Mr. Perone, right over here, sir. Thank you. Name and city. My name is Peter Perone. I'm a lifelong resident of Melbourne, Florida. Right. And I actually currently work for the county. Um, hey, that's okay. I, I right. just want to say, I, yeah, I apply to the city. Oh. But uh, <laughs> I just want to say a lot of my concerns um, just got answered by the chief. And I believe that was actually quite sincere. Um, however, I don't think the punishments fit in the crime here because not only is what he said ridiculous, the, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming everyone's familiar with it, with what was said by the oh, FOP. by the FOP, yes. 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 Um, we received a lot of besides <laughs> Besides of what was said in regards to race as well as other things, if that is, Brevard County was the number two trend on Twitter in the U.S. that day. <laughs> Has Brevard County ever been that high on Twitter? And it was for all the wrong reasons. And if that becomes the national perception of what we accept here, that's going to affect our tourism, which affects our budgets, which could affect our jobs, which to me, I think people need jobs. I think people that are elected, such as our council, our mayor, our sheriff, who in light of all this has issued a suspension Anyone who doesn't support the removal of not only what was said as an FOP representative, he was the FOP president of the city of Melbourne chapter. No, not the no. city of Melbourne. No. no. Well, okay, maybe not the, the Melbourne chapter of the FOP. No, no. Brevard County. Yeah, it was Brevard County. So I, I'm under the impression there was, there was a Melbourne chapter. Don't draw, don't draw down that line. It's not the city of Melbourne. Okay, well, okay. the point is he represents Melbourne police, he represents the sheriffs, does he not? No, he does not. No. Oh. Melbourne. No. So what does the FOP represent? FOP, separate members. I'm, I apologize, Mayor. It's, yeah, it's go your, ahead, it's, Mr. It's, Lurie, it's so. I, I get a little emotional about this because we're getting thrown under the bus. On well, I things. think that's our right to. Our right. There's just Mayor. not, they're just wrong. Okay. Wrong. So, so what I want to know is why is the suspension so far the only action that's been taken for something that literally affects everybody in this county? Everybody in this city, why, why is why is suspension is just 
in anyone's mind. Because I can tell you right now, if you go search through everyone's opinions, that's not that's not what everyone's going for here. Everyone agrees that there should be a removal. And honestly, Chief, you sounded so sincere and nice. You should consider running for sheriff. All right. Vice but I do thank you all for your time. Sir. Hold on. Vice Mayor uh, Alfred. Hey, how are you doing, sir? Um, I'd like to address this real quick because I was in law enforcement for about 20 years. Um, I immediately heard that and I was I was appalled. I immediately issued a statement of his removal, not only as from the uh, FOP president, but in law enforcement. I made that perfectly clear on not only on social media, to, but to the news. And I, appreciate I don't that. stand for that. I'm not happy with that. Matter of fact, it makes me very angry because I spent 20 years in community policing doing a lot of good things to have some guy and, I, and I'm going to I'm going to bite my tongue right now to pretty much shatter it in what a Facebook and a social media post. I think I think it was uncalled for. And you know what? I, we have the steps that have to be taken. He does not represent Melbourne. Matter of fact, our chief, I spoke to our chief after that. He had the Melbourne car and our chief immediately requested that he remove that because he does not. He is not affiliated with the city of Melbourne. They are not even the bargaining unit. It's a PBA. So he, there's no affiliation. So immediately uh, the chief did that, and I appreciate it. But I want to tell I you right I appreciate that as well. But I, I want to let you know that I will tell you how I feel about it. Because, again, I work many late night shifts away from my children uh, and, and think I did a lot of good. And I'm very proud of the, the job I did just to have something like that go down. So I did call for it, and I stand by that. Uh, by that call. And I realize I came off a little hot. I think no, no, you guys you are elected. Right you and guys you are doing sure, a I'm fine job. You. This thing just really got everything boiling for me. And I, you know, we elect you guys to make these tough decisions. No. And I appreciate you guys sure. hearing me out. I'm hotter than you are right now. I promise you. I'm not very happy. And you have a right to be. And, but I want to let you know that we stand with you on that. I think I we all do. That. And regarding the suspension, I can't speak or will speak for the sheriff's office. I do know there's steps when it steps. And hopefully, Hopefully, I get my wish. Okay, sir? I appreciate you guys' yeah. time. Thank you. And Mayor, Mr. I, LaRusso. I, I, and, sir, I, I came off. It's all good, man. You guys got a tough job. We're fighting this on 100 emails a day and 40 phone calls a day on exactly what you're talking about, and we have no control over that. But we do have control over what our chief is doing and what he stood there and said. And I appreciate and everything so he said. He sounded not, very sincere, and I FOP appreciate that as well. Represent I'm sure everyone here did. Individual does not represent the city of Melbourne, okay? Heard so, that. And, and I think we're, as, as a body here, I think. Undoubtedly. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're, we're a little bit more, you know, um, tightened up than that, okay? So I, uh, reached out to Miss Lewis, who's the city manager, and asked the chief to make a statement out on uh, the police department's statement about about that very issue. So if you go out to the Melbourne Police uh, Facebook, his statement is out there. I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Thank you. Right. I mean, I guess. Thanks thank you. Here, though. Yes, and thank you for coming. Thanks for coming. Charles Dimmings. <laughs> Good evening, Charles Demings, Melbourne, Florida. Good evening, Madam Mayor and City Council members. My name is Charles Demings. I have been a homeowner in Melbourne for 26 years. I'm a 20-year veteran of the United States Air Force. During my career, I have logged thousands of miles to many countries while on flight status. I also spent two years stationed in Germany. During those times, I never experienced racism. My encounters with racism happened to be in the nation I was born in and defended with my life. Why should I have to worry about encounter with a policeman while running an errand, but I do. I am pro-law enforcement. I respect and appreciate our policemen and the department. Meeting an officer tells me nothing about the, his character or integrity. I believe those two things start right here. How do you allow our police department to operate and function? Do you insist and demand our department to live up to the oath they swore to? Is their code of conduct ingrained into their everyday performance? Does equal justice apply to all citizens of our city? Is a chokehold part of our use of force matrix? 
How about meet resistance with the least amount of force necessary? Are we truly trying to hire more minorities or just checking boxes to receive federal funding? I would like to see more officers engage me at my mailbox as I pick up mail if you're on a slow roll or not and not a call. Why not stop for just a minute? Let me see your face. We don't have enough community policing. I know this is not Mayberry, but I would like my community to know our officers. You say you will want you want our help, but you don't avail yourselves to us. How can I trust you when all I see are tenant windows? I am a volunteer coach at O'Galley High School and have been for 14 years. Never have a policeman come out to our football and basketball practice just to talk and meet our young students, not even the resource officers. There may be a future policeman in the group, but I guess we'll never know. Again, I am pro-police. I do not believe in defunding the police department. They need more human and interpersonal skills training. How about the one, how may I help you, sir, instead of what do you need? Is there a rule in our police department that our officers cannot smile? Our officers meet the worst society has to offer, but they should never forget the golden rule. Treat others the way you would like to be treated. Everyone is presumed innocent until proven guilty. It is not their job to be jury, judge, and executioner. And to our good officer, your oath does not stop at a uniform. If you see a fellow officer break the law, you must report it. First, he is no longer your fellow officer. He is a criminal. Second, it's your job. You took an oath. The good officers and the police union must be willing to rid the department of officers who break the law. They leave a stain of public distrust on the, on the badge, the department, and the city. Thank you. God bless Melbourne and the United States of America. Thank you, Mr. Demings. Next is uh, Lauren uh, Osborne. Hello. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good yeah. Time. It's been a long time. It sure has. It's been a long time. I opened a salon since I've seen you last. <laughs> I heard. Yes. Okay. Uh, so I'm here first and right. foremost. Names. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Lauren Ogborn. Okay. And I'm from Melbourne, and I'm here to represent the Brevard Peace, uh, Peacekeepers. Uh, we are an organization that banded together of friends who saw a need, um, and we are here to meet that. The peaceful protest that was held at Canova Beach, that was uh, that was my effort along with my friends. And uh, we actually invited the police and made sure that everything was safe. We were met with uh, threats and racist uh, remarks and opposition, um, of which you can see on the TV. Um, there is a list of names that was given to the chief of police that we have heard nothing about. Um, so I'm here to say those names aloud for you. Uh, first, we have uh, Ross Colburn, um, who made a threat on Facebook. Uh, I'm sorry, Cameron Goodyear. Um, may she properly be rewarded for her choices. He also said someone's wrong place is uh, wrong time is my dream come true. Tina Nichols commented that she uh, would love to be a sniper atop the roof and uh, take down some vicious dogs. And we're talking, they were talking about us as pro peaceful protesters. Um, uh, Matt Spear uh, believed to be, uh, or commented on Cameron Goodyear's post saying someone with a gun needs to step in and shoot these effers. Uh, Chad Matthew, uh, this is when you need to have a firearm. Evan Hot said, uh, let's come together and pound some effing heads. Let's show these, uh, I don't know what I'm allowed to say, the P word, right? Oh. Uh, we are strong and they are weak. Thomas Wankowski said, looking forward to it, we need some target practice. Uh, Karen Colby uh, went on uh, Facebook Live and made a video and where she had said that uh, they needed to go to the Walmart and get uh, uh, rubber bullets and shoot at the protesters. She also called for a neo-Nazi group called the Proud Boys to come after us with bags of rocks, insisting that I need to get insurance. Um, now, okay. State Representative Randy Fine was seen on Facebook Live saying, don't let them know I see this. That has been shared, and I expect an answer about that. 
he's saying that it was uh, fake news, funny enough. Uh, Karen Colby, a.k.a. Uh, Colby Karen on Facebook, actually called the Walmart saying that I was going to burn them down. So uh, not only did she make a false uh, uh, police report, but uh, there were also a pallet of rocks and, or I'm sorry, a pallet of um, bricks that were found at the beach. And the police uh, were informed by Florida Wildlife that uh, now the police had to go out there and remove those bricks from from the beach, and uh, in my opinion, that wasted our taxpayer dollars, and I couldn't imagine being an officer out there in the Florida heat having to load a pallet of bricks off the beach that were intended for peaceful protesters. Now, my second matter is uh, Gregory Edwards. We are here to demand Sheriff Wayne Ivey release the video. Um, there is absolutely no reason that that video should not be released and we are going to be standing and protesting and saying his name until we see that video. So I would love to have uh, the city council stand with us and ask Sheriff Wayne Ivey to release the video of Gregory Edwards, a combat veteran who had PTSD, now is a wife of a person who has mental disorders. My husband has schizophrenia and I've had to deal with the police before. You know what happens when they're having a schizophrenic meltdown? They say, is he threatening suicide or is he threatening to kill you? And if those two answers can't be answered in front of a police by my husband who is in the middle of a schizophrenic meltdown, then he is left with me. So I want you to understand that mental health needs to be addressed immediately with the police. Now we've seen the sad story of the little boy with autism who was um, harassed by the police officer and he wasn't verbal enough to, uh, to react and, under, and, and understand what's happening first of all, but in order to explain, hey, I, I have autism. So um, th thank you, that's my time, I see that. All right, thank you. Uh, so what you have read about the on the Facebook, has that been re, uh, sent over to the police department for uh, a report? Je yes, Jessica Travis, uh, she is a lawyer. She has taken all the names down, and I actually have the, the, uh, the statement that she sent to the chief of police. So uh, we still have not received an answer on that, and that is uh, uh, Antoine Hart was arrested for telling people to go burn down City Hall. What is happening with these white people? Prove to us there is no white privilege in this situation. Someone said they were going to throw bag, or calling on a neo-Nazi group to throw bags of rocks at peaceful protesters. This is unacceptable, and I will not. I will come to every meeting until we get an answer on this. Thank you very much. With respect, thank you. Mr. LaRusso. I just have a question. You're one of the two coordinators of that uh, Canova Beach. Uh, uh, there is, are is two main coordinators, and then there's a team underneath us, yes. Okay. So um, I've, I've heard a lot of uh, all the negatives here. Tell me what, what are the negatives that you've heard, sir? Yep. Uh, because uh, Lieutenant Scott Mostert is in my phone and has been on board with me can since I ask the beginning. A question? Of course you can. Okay. So tell me some of the positives that came out of that uh, uh, that protest and the uh, demonstration that happened at Canova Beach that I was right across the street from. Okay. So the positives. Oh, you were there. Interesting. 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 Sure. Okay. So the positive. Excuse me. You asked. You asked. So I'm going to reply now. So tell, you're going to let me reply. Me some of the. Good stuff that Some of the good stuff that happened about that. Well, all over the news and media, we can see that there have been protesters uh, that are not able to contain themselves and have a peaceful protest. We are allowed to exercise our First Amendment right. Now, my first concern was that we were not going to block any of the businesses, which we were actually, somebody, Karen Colby, got up and said that we were going to be blocking the businesses and going over the causeway. So she was causing concern with people that had no need for concern. So um, that being one, I called and made sure with the police who we, where we were allowed to park, what was public, what was not, where they would prefer for people to stand. And I made sure that my side, as much as 
I possibly could. And you can go on our Facebook page, which is the Brevard Peacekeepers. It's, I kept it simple. You can go on there and see me speaking at, at everyone. I am not here to stand against Republicans. I am here to tell my fellow protesters, you will not say anything under my watch about President Trump. You will not disrespect my town. You will do not, not disrespect the police. We are here to show that we are not happy with the systematic racism and the police brutality that has been overlooked for way too long. Now, in reference to where he was standing, there were belligerent drunk people going in and out of Key West Bar threatening us and going into the street threatening us and trying to coax us to come fight them. We have it all on video. Ma'am, ma'am. Go ahead. I, I asked a question. Uh, and I don't want to uh, uh, elongate uh, the, uh, uh, the the lack of opportunity here. Mm. Uh, but my question was: What know, was positive? Yeah, because we proved and, to you that and, we can be and, peaceful. And you flipped it back into the negative. We proved to you that we can be peaceful. We proved that Karen Colby that her attacks on me were false. Time out. We're not calling out anybody. I mean, d d yes, specifically, I, I want to know about the the, the, the ten thousand foot. Tell me about 10,000 foot. You had 300 people there. Yes. You had black, white, all races yes. there that were that were uh, uh, that were demonstrating and protesting uh, police brutality. Yes. Uh, in, in, a, in general. OK. Yes. I mean, based on, you know, what we've experienced. I'm 64. So, you know, maybe I've experienced, you know, most of us were there if I can. So what I'm asking and I don't mean to, you know, get into a debate with you and I apologize to my fellow council members, but. What was the positive that came out of it? Well, uh, for me, I know personally that there was a, an elderly black woman that was standing behind me, shivering in tears at the support of her community. So for that one woman alone, I will continue to stand. For the mother-in-law of the widow of Gregory Edwards that is standing outside ready to speak with you, I stand. For my son who wants to go to these protests and stand up for his black and brown friends, I stand. I'm exercising my First Amendment right, and I'm making sure that people do it peacefully. Absolutely. That's the good that comes out of this. Right. I'm an activist, and I will continue to be active, even with that smirk. No, it's not a smirk. Oh, I mean, gosh. you're you're very you condescending, know, if I may. Not smirking. You're my quite God. condescending. You know, don't, what don't good judge came of this? Like you want to be judged yourself, okay? Judge me, don't, please. No, don't don't say I'm smirking because I'm not. I'm, I'm listening and I'm smiling and I'm and I'm and I'm engaging with what you. good came of what happened on your side what good came of people shouting go back to Africa I didn't hear that I'm sorry okay well we well, I'll remind you on Facebook we have plenty of video footage and so does Florida today that's great that's great. So look, I'm, I'm only. You sound trying desperate to, to squash my voice. So, Mr. LaRusso, the only thing I'm trying you to look do heated, is engage. sir. Hold on, please. I've got speakers, and there you go. we move on. Trying to engage in a, in a friendly conversation and try to, mm. uh, you know, drill down to it so that we, as a council, can can better understand. I thank you so much for your respect, Mayor, and the rest of the council, mm. and uh, we'll, we'll be speaking. Yes, I just uh, want to ask Mines, a question. Anybody else have a question? Yes, I'm sorry. All of all of the names and all that you mentioned. Yes, ma'am. Uh, when were those given to the police chief um, or I to can the tell police you right department? Now. When did they happen first, and then when were they reported? To okay, the so uh, the Travis Law Firm uh, sent these off. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm not very technologically savvy with this stuff. <laughs> um, she sent this off. I can see the date here on uh, the fifth. She sent this off on the 5th, and I have it all here. If you'd like me to email it to you, you could have a copy yourself. Uh, she has given me permission to release those names. She was actually trying to uh, give the police the opportunity to handle it um, the way that they would like to. But since we're not hearing anything about those, and you guys move so swiftly to arrest Antoine Hart, we're wondering, what are you doing here? You're making it look really bad.
Okay, if people. I may, I, I don't think, I think that was the uh, the government, uh, that was uh, the county, rather? Of course, no, no, I'm just bringing it to your... City, so that's that's the difference there. So that's why I'm asking, when were they, when the, uh, were those... When were all of these threats made? They were made a few days before. Open Police Department. Right, they were all made, uh, they were all made aware to them the same time that she sent all of this off. She actually CC'd the, um, hold on, I can tell you who all was on that list. Okay. Um, no, it's not. It's it's okay. Yeah. I'm just no, no, no. I'm talking about the people that it was sent to. Okay. I've got Phil Archer, state attorney. Uh, I've got Sheriff Wayne Ivey, Brevard County Sheriff's uh, Chief Mike Cantaloupe. Cantaloupe. Oh. Okay. Uh, uh, Joseph Lasada, Chief of Police. Uh, David Gillespie, Chief of Police, Agent Christopher Castillo. And like I said, I've been in contact this entire time with Lieutenant Scott Mostert. Okay. Thank right. you. Very good. Thank you. Any other questions? No. All right. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate this opportunity. Peaceful. So thank you so much. Yep. Absolutely. And I will continue. If I'm part of anything, you can guarantee that it's peaceful and that we're going to respect the government. We're going to respect the businesses and we're going to respect uh, the police 100 percent. Yeah. Cause so I, yes. I was uh, concerned about closing down the businesses in what? fear of no, what may happen. So I'm glad that we're working it together. No, ma'am. In yeah. fact, in fact, uh, I, I looked at it as this. If Key West had come out and handed out coupons, they would have had 350 more customers because we were all thirsty and hungry. And I used to be a patron of that bar, and I will never go back, and neither will a lot of the people who saw what was happening. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you Thursday. Okay. Next is Josephine Hunter. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hold on. All right. Uh, Margarita uh, Vanilla. Now, she may be outside. Oh, there you are. All right. Come on down. So I need your name and city, please. My name is Margarita Roger Bonilla. I live in Washington, D.C. I'm down here to support my daughter, Kathleen Edwards. And forgive me, okay. uh, I just have a headache. Um, I just wanted to make a statement. Um, there was a lot of things going on, a lot of things that's uncontrollable, and I just feel like the day that my daughter called me and said that Greg was arrested, Greg Edwards, and I will never forget that day. I told her, he'll be fine because now the police have him. They'll take care of him. That's ex that was my words. They will take care of him. And she called me back and he's in the ICU unit. I can't forget what I told my daughter and I didn't expect this because I was relying on the police to help me, to help my daughter. I, I didn't say I was gonna, sorry. What I'm trying to say is that we need the police. We need each other, but we need transparency. We need to be fair to each other. We don't need any of this hostile, hostility that's going on. I mean, I feel like right now, I, I'm glad to get the support. It's almost two years, and now all of a sudden this is coming out. We, we didn't get the support, um, and I, I'm grateful for it. But at the same time, I feel like my daughter made a request, and I don't see anyone addressing it. She just wanted to see the footage as a widower. She wanted to see her last moments of her husband. That's all she asked. And for no one to, even as a community, like I don't, I don't know this, the local, localities around here or anything, but just to get to, together and Privately, privately, even say, you know what, we can meet and I can do this for you. That's your wish. Nothing. It's, it's nothing. And now I feel like just now, I'm sorry, I appreciate the marches and everything. But to me, it's, it's, I think it's getting out of hand. I really do. And then even when I reviewed some of the um, 
the information that was submitted to me. Some of these officers, one year, two years, three years, they didn't even have the experience. They didn't even have the training. One of the officers was just, just came back from tasing another person at public, was put on leave and came back. Did he come back? Before he came back, did he have the proper training? It's not even fair to them. So I don't even know what is going on down here, but I think something needs to be done so that this tragedy won't happen again to no one because we need each other. You know, this community need, to, need each other, you know? And then for Phil Archer to, to agree to this aggr aggressiveness, I, 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 I'm in poll, no one, no one should have to go through anything like that. Okay. And, and that's all I have to say. All right. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, Josephine Hunter. Good evening. Every hand in the council. Um, I stand before you wearing many hats. Hey, darling. Um, as Lady J on the radio, um, I'm here representing part of the MLK Coalition as well as the Brevard Inclusionary Alliance. We have requested assistance from the council in allowing us to have a march on June 30th, June 20th, excuse me, June 20th leaving from the new MLK Boulevard to the auditorium. We are asking if the council will waive the permit time frame because we know that it's a short time. We're asking that it be expedited as well as waiving the fee and working with us. Uh, we are asking for um, preferably a transit bus, if that's possible. Um, we just did a march in Coco, and it was a countywide march. I heard this gentleman ask for some good news. We had over 2,500 2, peaceful march, no incident, you talk in diversity. Just all the rays of the beautiful colors that God created. They were all represented. It was a wonderful thing, a beautiful thing. I had the opportunity to... Uh, um, MC the program afterwards, before we all went over to the town hall uh, where they had uh, the law enforcement um, question and answers, where we had four chief of police there. So our Chief Gillespie was there, as well as uh, Chief Moya and Chief Lasada and, and Chief uh, Kenlope from COCO and, and uh, Rockledge, those chiefs marched with their city in Coco. So we had the chief of police, we had uh, their, fire, their, their departments there giving out water and stuff. And we liked that same support from our city. They had a transit bus that support, you know, that transported the people to the start point. So once they walked back, they didn't have to try and walk back to their vehicles. And we liked that same support from our city for our, our public that is hurting right now. Okay. you know, that have seen some things and have gone through some things. And uh, we are trying to bring unity and strength in our area. Um, that being said, the young lady who just spoke, um, that email was forwarded to me as well um, regarding the things she reported. And I personally forwarded it to Chief Gillespie on June 6th. And he did respond, letting me know he received it. So um, she said the 5th. I know the 6th he got it. And uh, let's see what else. I do have a, a, um, a poem I'd like to play for you all, if you will allow me. Also, one more thing, because this young lady mentioned with the uh, policing and stuff, you all realize that every city in the state of Florida has did away with the neck restraint except Brevard County, and our sheriff just renewed his policies with that in place, correct? Yeah. As far as I know, yes. Okay, okay, because... Uh, that's not a good one. I was looking at it the other day. Um, that's something that I, I don't, and I, I spoke with Chief Gillespie at the uh, panel, and he said that it is not in their policies. They do train on it. None of the other four ch police chiefs even train on it. He said he suspended that um, right now, and we would love to see that go away completely. So this is what I'd like to play. If I plead with you, will you let me leave? can't 
take a deep breath and hold it for a minute. But just know that in your next breath, my life will be gone and will be no longer in it. For eight minutes and 53 seconds, my breath tries to breathe, but no relief on my neck. You just keep watching for the moment that you see my breath leave. Cry for me, sigh for me, but don't you dare die with me. My breath is now with you, and it's longing to see black men free. Free from racial profiling and free from the hysterical 911 calls. Free from the bondage of white superiority and free from society's racial pitfalls. I deserve better, and you should believe that you deserve better too. But if I don't first believe it, then I will never be able to convince the rest of you. What happened to me, we all know it's just not right. But in this country called America, black is not free and white is just treated as right. But what's right when a man is dying under the weight of your bended knee, sworn to protect and sworn to serve, just outright killed me. And you say to me, trust the police? The man was resisting arrest? I say thank God for the video, but what about all the rest? All of the other black men who died while screaming for their lives. A bag of skipping to me? We all know it's just not right. But in this country called America, black is not free, and white is just treated as right. But what's right when a man is dying under the weight of your bended knee, sworn to protect and sworn to serve, just outright killed me? And you say to me, trust the police? The man was resisting arrest? I say thank God for the video, but what about all the rest? All of the other black men who died while screaming for their lives. A bag of Skittles still catches my attention and brings tears to my eyes. God bless you, Trayvon Martin. What I gotta do to make America love me? What do I have to do to make America care? Because when the white cop had his knee on my neck, everyone was so paralyzed with fear, they all just stood there. When fear grips us all, you better know that doing something might cost you your life. But something this wrong needs to be addressed nationwide, and my life has to be worth your fight. Why? Because I can't breathe. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Hunter. Uh, Alberta Clink Scales. followed by Dana Jackson. All right, so we will be discussing that uh, item 7.1 for um, the protest, march, and peace rally. Um, good evening, my name is Alberta Klinkscales, Melbourne, Florida. I am here to support the MLK Coalition and the Brevard Inclusionary Alliance on their request to have an expedited permit for the march that they're planning for June the 20th, as well as for the waiver of the fees and the supplying of the transit bus, as was requested by Ms. Uh, Josephine. Um, I wanted to answer that question also about the positive effects of these marches. And the positive effects of these marches is that it shows that there is a severe need, a critical need, for us to start to reimagine what policing looks like and to come up with strategies where community folks are also a part of this policing. There's a lot of people who are mental, mental health clients who, when a police is called, that players, the community is a part of it, where um, the mental health professionals and the other people who are providing services. Good evening, my name is Dana Jackson, and I am here on behalf of the Edwards family. Um, I am a friend, I'm a neighbor. I am also a veteran, 25 years, close to 25 years. Um, we have been friending Ms. Edwards uh, during this whole deal in the last 18, 18 months. Um, it's a travesty of what has happened. Greg had PTSD. The West Melbourne police knew that because the wife told them he had PTSD. Um, I'm kind of just wondering where is the de-escalation training? In the military, we get trained how to deal with certain things. And I'm just wondering, where was that de-escalation training? I understand there was an incident, 
but I'm sure we didn't have to use a neck restraint. He was already down on the ground. And then an officer put his forearm into his forearm into his head. But that did not kill Greg. We thought Greg was going to be Baker acted. His spouse thought he was going to the hospital to be taken care of. So she had no worries. She was wrong, unfortunately. It wasn't for hours later, hours later, that Miss Edwards found out that her husband was in critical condition. No phone call for a few hours. Where is the compassion in the police officers to call and let her know that he's been hospitalized. I live in Grant. I'm not even a Melbourne city. I don't belong to Melbourne. I live in Grant. And we drive all the way up to Rockledge Hospital. That's where her husband was. I, I just, I beg to Sheriff Ivy to do the right thing. He hasn't done it for 18 months. To, do, to release the video, release the video, release the video. That's what the spouse would like. Miss Edwards would like to release the video so she can see what happened to her husband. Just like every one of you in here and Sheriff Ivy, if, he, if his family was in a situation he would like to see what happened to their spouse or loved one in those last few minutes of his life. They knew he had PTSD, but they did not treat him like that. And the articles display what has happened between booking and getting to booking. I'll leave it to the papers for that. But it took seven officers I believe seven officers to so-called subdue him. They kicked him, tased him and held down the tase gun. Not even within the limits of a tase. So we do this eight minutes for Mr. Floyd. Just think of being tased that takes your breath out of you being tased. They pepper sprayed him. They put a spit hood over his face. They handcuffed him to a chair and not once was he provided medical care. In Florida today, you will see, if you read the article, it will tell you detail by timeline as much as they could of exactly what happened to Greg. And it actually put me in that spot right there next to Greg. It was so vivid that I could actually see what was going on with Greg at that moment. But not once did anybody provide medical care to him. They did not wash it off his face. Apparently that's policy. Did not check him handcuffed to the chair. They're supposed to check him. Did not check him after he was tased. Did not check him and left him sitting there for 16 minutes approximately through some window that they could barely even see through. And according to one of the articles, a deputy says, yeah, we really couldn't see through the, the window, but he doesn't look too good. Why is that? Maybe they need to see that a PTSD person should not probably be tased and they could have handled it a little differently if we had de-escalation training. Maybe we didn't have to go this far. But he was found unresponsive. And according to one of the articles, they don't have mental health clinicians in the jail. So who is there to take care of them? The supervisor, according to one of the records, the supervisor told a deputy to call 911 for help because he was coding under arrest at CPR. And that person didn't even call it incorrectly. No one told this deputy that 
There was an inmate in distress. Who is it? I'm not sure. Where do you want us? I'm not sure. That supervisor failed to give that 911 call the proper information. They thought it was a deputy. They showed up and said, oh my God, this guy's coding, according to the Florida Today. So around 357, he's, or he's at Rockledge, but the spouse doesn't know. Why is that? Would you like to sit for four hours, five hours, thinking your husband's at a mental health facility or at the hospital getting mental health care? To come to find out that he is dying in a bed, restrained to a bed, restrained. Where is he going? He's not going anywhere. The only thing I can say out of this thing is I was able to meet the family members and we all came together. And I have to say this, he did have family come from out of state. Do you know why they came from out of state? They came of out of state to give him support for the incident not knowing they were walking into this, mind you. They didn't know they were going into a hospital to have to say their goodbyes. Nobody should have to go that, go that route and not have to know that their family dies. In the Army, I was a casualty assistance officer. And when a soldier passes away, I have to take care of that spouse. I get assigned to a spouse with a chaplain and I am so thankful for my army experience that I was able to kick into gear and call back to my San Antonio friends and say, what do I do? Because he was out, so it's a little different. What do I do? What do I need to do? How do I do this? And I was able to start that process. But it is unfathomable about what Sheriff Ivy has done there's not been one apology, maybe today because of the FOP stuff going on, maybe. He needs to release the tape. If you can have a deputy show a video and give a tour of a video of your jail cell and you're not worried about security reasons then, then why should you worry now? If you can show a video about your scared straight program, then why can't you show the video? We want to know what's happened in the booking. We don't want it all in the jail cell where he wasn't at. We want people to be held accountable for what they did, not just to be let off and okay, well now you're, you get to walk away because that's what's happened. Some deputies got to walk away from the, from the situation. I don't know if they were fired, but somebody has to be held accountable to what has been happening in the jail cell with Gregory Edwards. I wanna know where the compassion is. I'm so livid about the fact that you did not have the decency to call the spouse and tell them that he's in the hospital and we need you here now. It eventually happened but not for a few hours. And I'm wondering, my question is, did they use that time because they wanted to get their investigation going? This is the other thing. Why should Sheriff Ivy be allowed to investigate himself? Amen. He should not be allowed to investigate himself. He should have had to been, and I, I get it that I guess each department gets to invite people in to do investigations. FDLE said they had to be invited. That needs to change. We need to change those laws. We need to change those laws, especially when it's dealing with other deputies and it's in your house. You need somebody else to police your house and make sure it's clean. And that's what's going on and around the world today is there's too many rogue police officers out there, but there are good ones. I will say that there are ones doing what's right. 
but I know when they get, when I'm a soldier and I, those National Guard soldiers out there doing what they're supposed to do because that's their order. Just like as a soldier, I can't say anything about the president of the United States, why I'm active duty. I can't do that. Those National Guard have to stand ground. Some of those people out there may not have known that. Yes, they wanted them to march with them and everything else, but they have certain orders or they can be held accountable. Okay, so Ms. Jackson, ma'am, your point, I mean, are you gonna- Yes, ma'am. We need, we need mental health- All right. Mental health reform. Okay. And dealing with people with PTSD when they get arrested, we need mental health reform. We need FDLE to come in and investigate. We need people to be held accountable and we need to get rid of that neck restraint. Okay. All right. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Thank, Thank you. you, Ms. Jackson, for coming. Mayor, um, uh, have you Mr. had the Lewis same conversation with the county commission as well? Uh, have you had the same conversation with the county commission as well? I'm sorry. Okay. Come back. That's right. where it lays. Yes, sir. Okay, I, I'm just asking, you know, so. Vice Mayor Alfrey. Ma'am, and May, first off, thank you for your service as a fellow veteran, and first. Mr. Thomas, no, thank you for your service. And uh, I just wanna say um, what I can promise you today, we're, we're the city of Melbourne. Yes, sir. And I understand there's a lot of hurt. Matter of fact, a lot of people don't know stuff about me. I have a biracial family. I have a, matter of fact, a black nephew that's a deputy for the sheriff's office. I mean, he's family, he's my, my nephew, and, and I, and I, I uh, you know, and spending 20 years in law enforcement is tough. It's tough to hear that, you know, what a lot of people paint, you know, all law enforcement is bad. I was very proud to go and serve the community and, and try to build bridges, you know. And, and I just want to say that I'm very happy that we have the chief and, the, and the, I, even the council that we have. We have a very diverse council. And we do meet and we go to, you know, we discuss, you know, what we can do better. The chief is always doing better. He's meeting with the community. Um, you know, I've been kind of a change agent and, you know, we've got a new city manager and a new staff because I felt uh, that we needed to go in a different direction. And, and we are. And I just want to let you know that I feel that this council, you know, we, we are doing that because we're just a small body of government. I mean, I, I know you spoke about certain officers. We don't have any control. We don't hire most of the people you talk about. I don't even know who they are. I hate to say that, but I'm kind of stuck in my own world with my family and my businesses and stuff. But I completely understand and, and uh, if anything, I want to thank you for coming up because hopefully that Melbourne will be part of that change. We need to be. And we start here. I mean, we start home. I mean, Thursday night we'll be, you know, we'll be walking. I'll be there and we'll have that discussion because the change starts here. But I want to let you know that you know, I just don't want the, all the government to be painted with a broad brush. I mean, because I can't speak for the sheriff's office or the county commission. It's all totally different government, different elected officials. And I think if you're watching social media, we don't agree with half of them. That's the reality. We don't get along with half of them. And that's the truth. So I just want to let you know I completely thank you for coming. And, and I, I, I respect what you got to say. And, you know, again, we do need change. And that's, how, that's why we're working very hard to, to do that. Yes, Amen. sir. And I also I like recommend... to see the change of the body cams. Body cams. Oh, yeah, uh, can definitely. I speak on that? Matter of fact, I spoke to the chief today. That's something that our council unanimously agreed on about a year and a half. Was it been about a year and a half ago or something? A year? In October, well, and, and now, right now, we're in the, um, in, uh, we're basically, we're in a policy stage. They're shopping and stuff. I spoke to a cocoa officer today. I called him about, about the body camera. Matter of fact, the news contacted me, and they wanted to interview me. And they said, what do you think about the body camera? Some officers say no. I said, absolutely, we should have them. You know, documentation is key. The videos are important. You know, absolutely. I had nothing to hide when I wore a uniform. Matter of fact, I wanted that video. Um, well, see, so, when a person is in, in an incident by themselves, if the police officer has the cam, well, he's protecting himself, but also that person doesn't have a witness on their side either. Well, so that cam becomes right. of what happened. Well, and so that would have helped. It would have helped for um, West Melbourne and it would have helped. Well, I'm not going to argue with that. I can tell you the chief warm up in Maryland. He even mentioned, he said he likes them. And, and we, we are working as a council for that because we believe in that. We hopefully are a different government than a lot of them around here and doing the right thing every day. And again, my personal cell phone number is on the city website. People call me 10 o'clock at night. And I'd rather talk to people than eat. I mean, I'm just saying, but uh, I'm here. We're all here. And hopefully we see uh, most people on Thursday night if they'll come out. 
Yes, sir. Thank you. Ms. I, I didn't see Sheriff Ivey's on that on, on that uh, flyer. So Ma we'll, we'll uh, see. So, Ms. Jackson, I would recommend that you call, you know, the commissioners. There's five of them. And then also you can attend the meeting and under public comments. Mm -hmm. That would be perfect. Mayor? You know, Mayor. so, yeah. Tim Thomas. All right, Ms. Tom Mr. Thomas. Yeah, and I'll just say, uh, uh, your job as a casualty assistance officer, uh, I'm also Army, and um, I had a, a very close friend that was killed in Iraq, and I was tagged by my chain of command to be his casualty assistance officer. And uh, that's, that's nobody wants that job. And uh, so uh, I thank you for your service, and very well spoken, and, and you have all legit points tonight that we all need to work on. So thank you, thank you for your service. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Jackson. Thank you for your time. All right. Next will be 7.1, and that is uh, the council discussion and action regarding a request by application for the We Can't Breathe protest march and peace rally scheduled for June 20th, 2020 to waive fees and requirements and provide transportation. Um, so who's going to report on this? Uh, Ms. Weiser? Good evening, Kathy Weiser, City Clerk. Uh, so this item relates to an application that the City Clerk's Office received yesterday uh, from Mr. Rodney Edwards. He's representing the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Coalition, and they would like to conduct a We Can't Breathe protest march and peace rally on June 20th. Uh, the march would begin at noon, and it would start at the intersection of NASA Boulevard and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. Participants would walk south on MLK Boulevard, turn east on Hibiscus Boulevard, and then end up at the Melbourne Auditorium. A rally would follow in the parking lot of the Melbourne Auditorium, and that would be held from approximately 1 p.m. until 4 p.m. As described in the application, participants would park at the Melbourne Auditorium and then be transported in some fashion to the March starting point, which again is back at NASA and MLK Boulevard. This item uh, was placed on your agenda because the applicant uh, is making a request for the provision of certain services and the waiver of certain fees and requirements. There is no issue with regard to timing or deadlines with this application. There is no issue with regard to the event or the type of event. It's here uh, before you because of the request. Uh, the applicant is here this evening, I understand, and I think at this point it would be appropriate to ask the applicant to come forward, basically describe the event for you, and then um, ask you clarify for you exactly what services they're asking for or what they would like waived, what they would like provi provided, and then staff can go from there to answer any questions okay. that you have. All right, so Rodney Edwards. Welcome, Mr. Edwards. Good evening, Mayor. Council, I appear before you, uh, Rodney Edwards, the president of the Dr. Martin Luther King Coalition. Uh, the coalition has had a very peaceful and harmonious relationship with this council uh, for more than 30 years. Um, and although we have a First Amendment right uh, to protest and to petition our government, as the president of Dr. Martin Luther King Coalition, I thought it would only be right and fair for us to put you on notice and to seek uh, approval from the council instead of getting out there. I think that uh, what we saw last weekend in Rockledge and Coco, uh, we had probably about four or 5,000 people um, that attended that protest. And I feel that if we got that same type of participation here in the city, that it would only be fair uh, to the city as far as liability and other issues like that if we work together um, to try to make sure that we make this march as peaceful um, and as safe as possible. Um, and so what we're asking um, is that you assist us with some of the things, as you know, we do the MLK March every year um, so we're quite familiar with some of the requirements that, that you guys uh, put on us for holding our marches uh, in the way of permits, uh, the salaries of the about nine police officers for the day, um, the cost of renting out the auditorium. And at this time, we're asking that those be waived. 
I think we paid somewhere in the neighborhood of about four or five thousand uh, dollars every January to have the MLK March. Um, and I think that in this situation, uh, with what we're doing and what we're trying to get accomplished, uh, I would hope that the city would be able to absorb uh, some of those, especially with the police officers, because we actually want uh, the city to join in in this march and be a part of it um, and, and participate with us. Um, the, the issue with the transportation, we noticed up in the Rockledge uh, Coco March that they had Space Coast Area Transit transporting people back and forth from the beginning of the march to the end of the march. Um, as you know, the location where we're beginning our march and anywhere pretty much on Dr. Martin Luther King Boulevard is pretty sparse uh, when it comes to parking and space to assemble. Um, and at this point, the only place that we could actually assemble safely would be the Sears parking lot. Uh, but that's not city owned property um, and we don't own the property as well. Um, so. We don't want to actually um, cause some type of conflict or issue uh, if we have everyone park their cars in a Sears parking lot um, on private property. So those are the issues that one of the reasons why we're asking for assistance with um, some type of uh, city sponsored transportation or either county sponsored transportation. Um, the other reason why um, we wanted to get the city involved too is because we think for the safety of this march that we should have uh, the streets blocked off. Um, we don't want to put that many people walking down the sidewalk. Um, and I think once we get on hibiscus, we'll have to cross over um, Babcock. Um, and so we think that if we have some police assistance, uh, that would be a, a great benefit to ensure the safety. Um, we have, as normal, um, applied for a $2 million insurance policy uh, to cover any uh, Thing that may happen with the march, um, which is our normal um, request. Um, so we have secured that um, if the council allows us to proceed forward. Um, we did ask to have it in the parking lot. Um, so we didn't know if the council would allow people to have use of the restrooms. So another thing that we would have to do is to get a uh, porta potty. So we're just coming to the, to the city asking them if you would partner with us uh, to make sure that we have a, the safest march we can here in the city of Melbourne. Okay. Madam Mayor. All right, yeah, Mr. Thomas. Just a quick question, sir. Yes, sir. Um, at the uh, Coco uh, March, how many Space Coast transportation buses did y'all have for that to help transport people? I believe they said they had seven, and it didn't transport the entire time. It was just from the uh, staging area to the beginning. So it's like one trip or, or, you know, it wasn't like constantly the whole entire day. Gotcha. And what was the what was the number of people that marched in that one? I've heard different numbers. I've heard what I believe is probably close to about 4,000 people. 4,000. You expect the same size crowd? Here? That's what we're that's what we're thinking that we would get about the same. Okay. Great. All right. Anyone else? Any yeah. questions? Yeah, Mr. LaRusso. Um, I'm just a numbers guy, okay? So I, I, I got to ask, and because I have to uh, represent the dollars in the city, um, but I know it's an emotional aspect. So I, I just have a couple of questions mm -hmm. that may seem cold, but they're not, okay? Just, I got to click them off for that girl out right there with the, with the pink jacket on so that she can figure out how we're going to do this thing. Um, we, you know that we have, um, that we've uh, exhausted all our grants and aids. Okay, so we have no money in that bucket. So we have to find that money to someplace else. And the the um, the wisdom of the council and and our um, uh, and our staff will find that as well too if if we go forward with that. Um, the additional grants and donations um, are there. You you've mentioned Space Coast uh, SCAT uh, S C A T. Uh, you mentioned uh, porta potties. Uh, a couple of th have you reached out to some of these other uh, private industries and public industries uh, to help with this process for what you're asking for right now? Yes. So basically what we're asking you for is we're not asking you for necessarily the porta potties. We can reach out to other individuals. Uh, we've gotten a thousand dollars from Glover Oil. Um, who has committed to help us put on the sponsorship. Uh, the MLK Coalition, we have our, our own funding, um, and we have formed another alliance um, that you heard spoke, spoken about earlier today, the Brevard Inclusionary Alliance. Um, and we're talking about getting sponsorships from those members, um, including uh, 
many of our black attorneys here in the county. Um, so we're whatever the count, the city feels that it's going to be too much, then the MLK coalition and these individuals would make up the difference. And that's where I'm going to it. I mean, you know, it's, it's it, you know, everything. Uh, some people like to dump it all on our shoulders and say, take care of it, please. But no. it sounds like you've already been working all of the, the different avenues and everything else. Um, so uh, one of the, the the last question I have to ask, though, is that is this something that we should be looking at as a yearly event? I don't think this would be a yearly event per se to do this march. Um, I know the MLK coalition march every year for MLK weekend would yeah, be yeah. an uh -huh. annual march. Um, but I think this is something uh, for me and many of the people in the community. I think this is something for us to start the dialogue, um, to start the dialogue with our local officials. Um, I heard the chief say something earlier and it kind of tinged me a little bit. There are, I don't know what the number is, but let's say there are 100,000 African Americans in this city. When issues come about, it, it bothers me when I hear you say you reached out to the black leaders. We haven't elected anyone to be our black leaders. So, I think that by doing this and by, I think we're gonna support your, your event on Thursday. Thank you. Um, I think it's important because yes. um, Yvonne supports everything we do. But I think that when we're limited to 140 people, you're missing an opportunity to actually be heard and get the buy-in from the public. Because when you make a phone call to three individuals, we don't know what was said to those three individuals. It's very difficult for them to speak for 100,000 people. And so I think that at this point in time, a lot of us have been talking. This is a Rosa Parks moment. This is a Emmett Till moment where a lot of people are going to be judged by what did you do? What didn't you do in this moment? And so that's what we are looking forward to. The MLK Coalition, the Brevard Inclusion Alliance that we're beginning, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at being not just marches and rallies, but what is the strategy going forward? What is the end goal going forward? How do we get, how do we as a community get a public space with you? So, sir, that's that that goes to the crux of, of my question is, you know, like, so I'm, I'm trying to check off the boxes for us so that we can get to the ultimate answer. You know, because these are going to be questions that are going to come back to us. Absolutely. Do we want to do this? Do we want to do that? Do we want to do this? Because we, you know, give the blessing over the over the holla, uh, shall we say, right. you know, to, to, to spend these dollars. Um, so uh, you've answered the questions. I, I appreciate Totally, and um, we're here. We're here. That's all. That's all I can say. You okay. know. All right. I got Miss Minus. Okay. Right. Um, Mr. Mr. Edwards, how are you? I'm doing great, Councilman Minus. How are you? Glad you're in Melbourne and not Palm Bay. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. okay. We're, it's okay. we're friendly we're, neighbors. That's yes. Right. Yes. <laughs> right. I. Uh, that's. Um, I say that because it, he's also right. in. Uh, and it's the biggest city. Yeah. And, he's the. Uh, and one we're of the, the second biggest. But yeah. yeah. All right. He's an assistant uh, attorney there, yes. so I just plug you for Palm Bay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's all family. It's all love. <laughs> for for the parking, um, you said that you need um, scat buses, or and, and and that's that's county also. Where will the people be parking um, in order to get on the bus? What 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 areas have you, you? You're not in the Sears parking lot, and you're not at Kaiser, or where we're, where where are they going to be parking at? We're looking for them to park at the Civic Auditorium, and then be transported to the starting place, and then and end at the auditorium. Back. Okay. Okay, and that would be what, just a one time or maybe a couple of hours or so that? Yeah, I think because um, in Rockledge, it, it probably was about 45 minutes because mo once most people started, the buses started going and it wasn't that far of a, of a distance. Uh, I think for us, it'll probably be even closer. Um, 
the, the turnaround will probably be even quicker because we're only going probably, I don't know, maybe a mile, mile and a half. Okay, that's, um, so you said from 12 to four and maybe you need the uh, the street block for about an hour. You said yeah, it's just only... that one major street. There are several streets uh, on Hibiscus going to um, the auditorium, right? Right. So I think that the only time that the streets would need to be blocked is during that transition from uh, MLK and NASA to uh, the auditorium. And I think we have uh, the tallest short guy uh, in the city who leads most of our marches, and he, he, he pretty much marks at a pretty good pace. Uh, we usually do from we usually go from MLK Library mm -hmm. to the auditorium in about an hour and a half. So I don't think it's going to be uh, anywhere near that length of time. OK, it's about half. OK. All right. I'm um, I'm very excited. Um, I think this is uh, very worthwhile and um, uh, Councilman, I do not think this would be annually to do anything like this. Hopefully we don't have to do this anymore where we're having protests because of someone died uh, because of uh, police violence. Um, so hopefully this is um, um, the one time yes. a one shot deal and um, that, you know, that we, we can, uh, I'm asking for the support of council if we can. All right, Mr. Thomas. Yes, sir. Mr. Edwards, now, if, uh, if you have access to the bathrooms at the Civic Center, then you wouldn't need the, the porta potties. Is that correct? If you correct. have access? Correct, correct. Okay. Okay. And, and, and ma'am, I'll just say, you know, we have uh, a fantastic uh, coordination relationship with the African American community, uh, whether it be in the Martin Luther King March, whether it be the renaming of airport to Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. And I think this is something that we need to support, um, you know, and uh, waive the fees, waive the insurance, provide use of the auditorium. Uh, the only the only question I think I have is uh, the SCAP buses or county buses, then how would we how would we pay for that? That would be the thing that, uh, you know, I think that we need to try to figure out and try to support that with the SCAP buses as well. Okay. All right. So, um, uh, Vice Mayor Elfrey. Um, you, you see how people are protesting differently throughout the country. I mean, we're a model. We really are. We have some wonderful leaders, including yourself, sir. Um, I, I definitely am in support. Um, I would like to, you know, of course, there's always how do you pay for it. Um, I would almost, you know, entertain a motion to, to uh, use, I mean, pull for maybe next year's funding for the, uh, for grants and aid or something okay. for this, because that's that's something that we could pull pull for. Because at the end of the day, it, it you are right. It's how are we going to be judged? Well, again, I'm just as disgusted up here as you are down there. I mean, technically to, to put it, because I'm not very happy with the way things have been going on or the way the way the division is our, in our country. Uh, again, if, if we're really going to put our money where our mouth is, I mean, you know, again, we need to. You know, we need to support, and I do fully support. So that I would entertain that motion that we we grant, a, you know, a grant and take it from next year's uh, uh, grants and aid. Um, I uh, yeah, I'm in agreement, but I think we have a reserve set aside. Have we used that reserve exactly. on that yes. grant? I aid? thought we used that reserve already. A second, though. have we used that reserve? Uh, oh. I believe that we have, and um, okay. just for, for council, and I can certainly bring uh, the city clerk back up, Ms. Weiser, and when we looked back at the MLK March this past year, I think those direct costs were about $1,500. And, um, you know, that's something if you want that to come off of grants and aids next year, obviously it has to be funded in this current year budget. And if this is the direction that council wishes to go, we can certainly provide the avenue to get there. Um, and so that, that's what we were looking at for a similar event. As it relates to the buses, um, I would like to ask Ms. Weiser to come back. She did have a conversation with the Space Coast Area Transit. And so uh, she could provide a little bit more information from what they shared with us. Oh, I had a question for Mr. Edwards, yes, but I also have Mr. Barnes who would like to talk, and then I would like to bring Kathy up after. All right, so Mr. Edwards, you said you want to do a rally. When you get back to the auditorium, is there going to be speakers yes. and stuff like that? So you were thinking to do that on the outside of the auditorium? Yes. Okay, so... Then I don't like I don't no. like that idea. I like for you to be inside the yeah. auditorium. So and yeah. 
I think the problem that you're going to have is that if we have four or five thousand people, yeah, they're not going to fit in there. They're not going to fit in the inside because of uh, social distancing. Yeah. Correct. Okay, that's and, why you're having it on the outside. Right. Okay. So we've we've contracted with a company that's going to provide a stage. Okay. Um, so we've already paid for that. Okay. So there will be a, a stage and a stage? platform set up. Um, okay. And, All right. That's and the mayor, answer to my question. All right, uh, Vice Mayor. One thing Alfred. that bothers me is having portage on. So, I mean, I mean, let's let's be realistic here. I, I want to make usage. I mean, it's, the, the auditorium is the people's auditorium, and it needs to be open and the bathroom be available. I mean, I'm just not into the portage on thing. I'm just that's my personal okay. opinion. All right. Very good. May I ask how yeah. many people does nice. the auditorium hold? Do we know? Oh gosh, I think it was like. 20. 1500 yeah so the auditorium there's there's a, several different capacities there's just the raw square footage capacity so what we look at in each instance is what the floor plan is going to be and based on that floor plan then the um, fire inspector and fire marshal can develop what the maximum occupancy is based on that floor plan so we work with applicants on a regular basis depending on what they're trying to do in the facilities okay, okay. Standing. all right I think we're in agreement ma'am all right and, and the one last thing I would ask, I would ask if that's all right, Mr. Edwards, um, you're going to handle the social distancing issue. That, that is on you. I mean, yes. we're, we're in yes. agreement on that. Yes. Okay. And we're going to mandate yeah. masks. That's it. something that kind of we have to ask as government, you know, that's because that's what we're pushing. But as long as we're good there, I mean, I'll, under, I'll, I'll make the motion that we, we take the money uh, uh, appropriately needed from the next year's uh, grant. Fund it now. But from the next year, is that grant the name? Second. All right. So, um, all right I, I second. You, all right. Hold on, because I got another speaker oh, to um, okay. bring up. I, I, yeah. I, Wait a minute. Uh, I line up our table. Okay. Thank all you. right. I didn't hear you. What'd you say? Mr. Zimmerman. Uh, Mr. Zimmerman, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very good. For Mr. Edwards, uh, Mr. Larusso. Uh, thank you, and and I knew if we just took a, just a few moments just to bring <laughs> the temperature down, that we right. could probably find a couple of more dollars if we needed it, rather than to go into next year's budget because next year's budget is going to be ugly, ugly yeah. because of the COVID. We all, yeah, okay? we all know. We that. already know that. Yeah, right, but so, we also but, got reserves too. So exactly, you know. exactly, exactly. But, okay. but however, um, uh, I, 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 Mr. Zimmerman, th uh, thank you so very much. Uh, I think that because it's on the twentieth, which is. Uh, Oh, today's the ninth. Yeah. So we're we're eleven days away, you Next know, basically of, of getting this thing done. I think a couple of phone calls. There's seven of us up here. I, I'll bet seven of us could raise a hundred to five hundred bucks a piece, just with a phone call. It's not for it's not for a campaign. It's for this. Okay. okay? So rather than to pull money out of the. Um, uh, out of uh, the budget that we don't know what's going to look like next year, and to truly be a community effort, not a city effort, but a community effort. How about we do this over the next two, three days? We get together with our our, our staff. We can we can always have this motion that's approved yes. and gone, we and we motion. can have it as a as a backdrop. But we can go out to our community members and 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 ask. And and I'll and I'll step up as my company. Up, I'll, I'll throw in a hundred bucks. Okay, right. so right. that's me. And okay. mayor. Yeah. And last thing, and I also. and it's a no secret. I donate my salary back that I make up here to the community. I don't I don't I don't do this for money. There's no money up here. No. So my monthly salary I will be donated to you guys as well. Thank you, right. sir. Thank you, sir. Right. We've got ways of making this work, yes, you know? Sir. We don't have to always push the government button. Correct. We're a community. <laughs> We're here, okay? All right. So I hope that you will join us in the Oh, place. no, we'll be there. I'll be ahead of you. Okay. Thank I think you. I'm faster That's than you. I, want to make sure. <laughs> I hope you can, because I can't walk very far, so I hope you can carry <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other questions or for Mr. Edwards? Okay. No, my no. cell phone number is on the web city website. Please reach out tomorrow. Okay, no problem. Thank you. And, mine, and mine is on, I mean, j just call and, and tell me where I need to drop up to check. Okay. Okay. okay, no problem. Okay. Thank you, sir. Do it You're now. welcome. Thank you, everyone. All right, so the next speaker is Edward Barnes. We live in a great city. Awesome. Members of the City Council, 
My name is uh, Minister Edward Barnes, and I currently reside here in Melbourne. I come in support of the MLK coalition. I just simply want to say that we cannot run away from our conscience by not doing the right thing. No justice, no peace. I echo the words of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. The only justice in America for the black man is just us. This speech is not about race, nor is, nor is it about race or black and white. It's about doing what's right. When it comes to race, it makes me wonder, was Barry white? Was Clint black? Was George straight? Was Marvin gay? Was Ray blind? I guess it makes Stevie wonder. <laughs> Somewhere I heard, when you kill my father, you kill my history. When you kill my son, you kill my future. Somewhere I heard, I read, a man without a history is like a tree without roots. Again, this is not about race, but when it comes to racism, it's like bleach works perfect for whites, but destroys color. Racism is an ugly thing. I thank God I don't have that gene. The only thing that, when it comes to, the only thing that, let me put it this way, the only thing that should be separated by colors are clothes. We all live in this world together. We all need each other. I'm no better than you, and you know better than me. I'm looking up to you, and you looking down to me. But in the eyes of God, we're all equal. God sits high, and he looks low. We all will stand before him and give account on what we do. I'm not going to preach. <laughs> but I just want you to know, don't run away from your conscience. Uphold the oath that you swore to and do the right thing. Because again, it's not about black and white. It's about doing what's right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Amen. Barnes. All right, so I have a motion by Vice Mayor Elfrey and second by Ms. Minus on uh, supporting, whoops, excuse me. Uh, I did say, sorry, I lost. Um, no, I was you just did reminding you that you had a speaker still. On oh, deck. okay, yes. <laughs> All right, Ms. Weiser, and then we will all right all right uh, so with regard to the space coast area transit uh, we had an opportunity to speak with the transit director about uh, the the march the protest the rally that occurred in rockledge and coco and we don't have an opportunity to send the applicant mr edwards to space coast area transit because then Space Coast Area Transit would be in conflict with uh, uh, charter buses. Rather, what happened was the Rockledge Police Department contacted Space Coast Area Transit and said, based on the number of people and just the logistics of getting them to the, 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 from the staging area to the start point of the march, we are in need of buses to, tran to transport folks during this event. Space Coast Area Transit 
they viewed that almost as mutual aid. And so they responded to the police department with that request. Okay. And so in Melbourne, so we hear what you're saying with regard to the event, okay. then what would happen would be that the police chief's office in Melbourne would reach out to Space Coast Area Transit. There's no guarantee they'll hear the request and they will run it through their chain of command for approval. And then at that point, our office would coordinate with Space Coast Area Transit on the plan so that we have a coordinated effort to get people to that start point um, in a safe manner. Just so you're clear on how the okay. SCAP buses came about. Hmm. So we, we can't send Mr. Edwards directly to Space Coast Area Transit or it would be um, an an absolute no. They they would not even be able to entertain that request. Okay. Um, with regard to the expenses, uh, yes. the MLK uh, march that happens every year in January, those costs run a little over seventeen hundred dollars. So I don't see an issue with what's happened here this evening. We found out that the auditorium is not rented on that date, and so the restrooms could be made available. So the cost there would be. Um, whatever the uh, whatever. Uh, wage is for a parks employee to work at the auditorium to make those restrooms available. Okay. So that's not impossible. That would be good. Mm -hmm. All right. Madam Mayor. Yeah, uh, Mr. Thomas. And also, if we couldn't get the seven buses that they had for Cocoa Rockledge, I mean, if we got five, and you could still do enough, you know, ferrying back and forth, we could get everybody there. So I'm hoping we could get seven. But. Well, at this point, um, SCAT, has that event under their belt okay. and so they can bring us information so if their answer to the police chief is favorable that they're able to do this they can also help coordinate us with us and bring us ideas as to what worked what didn't work right. and what's the best method yeah sure all right miss minus i'm going to ask a question um this would go through the scat not through the county commission it won't have to go to county commission for approval right or what will the uh, the scat director or whomever approves this based on our of. conversation today we believe that the request should go from the police chief to the transit director mr nelson Scott nelson and then okay. from there perfect. he will run it through his process perfect okay Great, thank you. Okay. It, it would be similar to an applicant for an event coming straight to you, the elected body to ask for approval rather than starting back at the staff level to take it through the approval okay. process. Okay. All right. Thank uh, you. Mr. LaRusso. Do you feel comfortable in, in moving forward in what we're talking about with all the 10,000 foot uh, uh, conversation right now, SCAT, uh, uh, the, the auditorium? I mean, again, 11 days, well, tomorrow will be 10. So we don't have any issues in our office uh, with regard to the timing of the event. Let's we're, get it done. We're, we're fine the, with that. The it's done. Police department was fine okay. with it. Traffic engineering was fine with it. Our office has zero issues with it. Okay. Right. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. <clears throat> Weiser, for that information. Mayor. That was great. Uh, Ms. Thomas. I'm really excited. I think this is a great way for us to reach out into the community and, and show that we are unified and that this is an important topic that needs to be discussed and seen. Um, I would only say based upon um, the motion that was made here, yes. since things have changed a little bit since yes. that motion well, was put out motion. there, um, I would suggest that uh, once we have those numbers down, um, including now with money that's been donated and may come more money that might come in the future, maybe coming back to us then afterwards if there was any excess over that amount and then we can decide yes. where we're going to pull that money from. All right, so I, I think we need that answer tonight. I mean, where are we going to pull the money? Well, I, I would say, based on what I'm hearing from council and your decision moving forward, if there was some type of deficiency in what was raised, that's within, with with the um, indication from you all tonight, that's within my expenditure limits. So I would just go ahead and make that, that happen. All right, very good. Mayor. Yeah, Ms. Uh, Sanders. I just want to sum some things up because, again, there was a lot of things said, and I think this is a great opportunity for us to all work together as a city and a community. Um, we are going to have the police chief reach out to SCAT about the buses and the transportation, correct? That would be SCAT's preference, yes. Okay. And they would view that almost as a mutual aid request. Okay, and then we're going to open up the restrooms at the auditorium for the citizens to use that attend. Correct. Correct. Good. Okay, Good. and in that money, um, thank you, Highline, um, 
the police, the money that is going to cost for the police to be there to close off the streets, that's included in that 1,500-ish? So no. we have not had an opportunity to run the numbers on this event, but what we did look at was the January Peace March. What were the total costs of that event? And the total cost of city services for that event were $1,717. Okay. On top of that, the coalition paid for rental of the auditorium. The auditor For the June 20th event, the auditorium is not rented that day. It, it's not rented out. So rather than the cost of rental of the auditorium, it would be the cost of one or two parks people, not my call, to be there mm -hmm. uh, to make the restrooms available. Perfect. And to secure, you know, to secure the facility at the end of the event. Right. Okay. Great. So, Thank so, you. Mayor, if, if yeah. I may, ma'am, uh, then I'll just, uh, I'll you just, motion? yeah, I'll, I'll actually, uh, then I guess I'll, I'll back my motion down. Okay. And then, because I guess we'll discuss it. Is that correct? What I'm hearing? No, and we'll you discuss, already. So then I'll, need, I'll stay with the motion. Want, we need the motion. Yeah. I'll, I'll keep the motion. I just whatever. Yeah. I'll keep the motion then. All and right. Then I'm and sure then Ms. Uh, second, second. By, yeah. by Miss Minus. Mm -hmm. All right. Any further discussion? Mayor, uh, just, yeah, Mr. Uh, just clarify for uh, for my foggy head. Um, so the motion is to be able to back up anything that the um, uh, that the community can uh, that is a deficit from what the community mm -hmm. steps up to, and we give the city manager the approval to go ahead and write right. that uh, whatever Out that of her authority uh, based on <clears throat> on her cap of being seventy five thousand dollars, and then she can go ahead and. <laughs> I don't think it would be $75,000, no, no, no. but her cap not. is 75 grand. Right. So if we're shy a thousand, if we're shy yes. $800 for this, based on what she, what we've approved for the manager to be able to, Correct. to right. okay. That's, That's right. my motion. All right. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Everybody in an agreement. Yeah. All right. Those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed. And I vote aye and the motion passes. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. There. Yeah, uh, Vice Mayor Alfrey. Can I make a request that, for Mr. Zimmer, Zimmerman that we fly to the agenda item number 16 and, and put that ahead? Sure. Is that okay, yeah. Mr. Zimmerman? I mean, I, you've been very patient and you've been very helpful tonight, so instead yes. of us waiting through new um, business and let such. Let me go through some unfinished business, and which is two that items, okay, Mr. and Zimmerman? then we'll move his uh, item up. All right, very good. Uh, unfinished business, item number eight, ordinance number 2020-36, Ms. Allison Dolly. Yes, ma'am, an ordinance of the City of Melbourne, Brevard County, Florida, relating to the Police Officers Retirement Trust Fund, creating a share plan for police officers of the City of Melbourne, amending Chapter 44 of the City Code entitled Retirement and Pensions, amending Article 6, Police Officers Retirement Trust Fund, amending Section 44-223, Contributions, and Section 44-224, Benefit Amounts and Eligibility, providing for severability and interpretation, providing an effective date, and providing an adoption schedule thank you miss dolly um this let me go right back here uh this is a public hearing do i have any sign up sheets all right i'll close the public hearing and we have jeff town from director of finance here thank you very much madam mayor city councilors we don't have anything to add to second reading all right thank you very much any questions for mr town all right seeing none uh, Council, what is your pleasure? Mayor. Uh, Ms. Thomas. Move for approval ordinance number 2020-36. Second. I have a motion for approval of ordinance number 2020-36 by Ms. Thomas, second by Mr. <coughs> Thomas. Discussion? All right, this is uh, second reading. It's going to require a roll call vote. Council member Tim Thomas. Aye. Council member LaRusso is not present. Council Member Minus? Aye. Council Member Debbie Thomas? Aye. Council Member Sanders? Aye. Vice Mayor Alfrey? Aye. Mayor Meehan? And I vote aye and the motion passes. Item number nine is ordinance number 2020-37. Ms. Allison Dolly. Yes, ma'am. An ordinance of the City of Melbourne, Brevard County, Florida, relating to the Firefighters Pension Plan, creating a share plan for the firefighters of the City of Melbourne, amending Chapter 44 of the City Code entitled Retirement and Pensions, amending Article 5, Firefighters Pension Plan, amending Section 44-167, Contributions, and Section 44 dash 168 benefit amounts and eligibility to add reference and operation details to the share plan. 
providing for severability and interpretation, providing an effective date, and providing an adoption schedule. All right, thank you, Ms. Dolly. This is under financial services, and it's Jeff Town. Uh, again, Madam Mayor, we have no further comments on second reading. All right. Uh, anything for Mr. Town? All right, seeing none. This is a public hearing. Do I have any sign-up sheets? I'll close the public hearing, bring it back to council. What is your pleasure? Madam Mayor. Uh, Mr. Thomas. Recommend approval of ordinance number 2020-37. Second. All right, I have a motion for approval of ordinance number 2020-37 by Mr. Thomas, second by Ms. Minus. Discussion? All right, seeing none. This is second reading. It's going to require a roll call vote. Councilmember Tim Thomas? Aye. Councilmember LaRusso? Aye. Councilmember Minus? Aye. Councilmember Debbie Thomas? Aye. Councilmember Sanders? Aye. Vice Mayor Alfrey? Aye. Mayor Meehan? And I vote aye, and the motion passes. All right, so we are going to move item 16. Mm -hmm. Item 16 um, is public hearing. Okay, so let me get right to that item. Um, all right, this is under community development. And here is Doug Dombrowski. Uh, welcome, Doug. Good evening, Madam Mayor and Council. Several months ago, um, the developer, Sam Zimmerman, had uh, provided us notice that the Highline project was intended to be completed by July 1st of this year. So that's great news. And we're here because of council support for this project all the way through and it which will soon be resulting again in 20 million dollars of private investment on a piece of property that was tax exempt formally uh, this project is going to have a lasting positive economic and fiscal impacts for the city and this also happened within an area that was designated as an opportunity zone under the Trump administration, so we're happy about that too. Item 16 is for your consideration of four resolutions related to the Highline Master Redevelopment Agreement, which you approved, which City Council and the CRA Board approved in 2017. Uh, this item does have uh, request six approvals, three as the CRA board and three as city council. The first consideration will be for resolution 3933. This is a joint resolution seeking approval of a second amendment to the master redevelopment agreement. Within the original master redevelopment agreement, uh, there was flexibility for the city engineers review of the uh, and acceptance of the stormwater utility system. And this amendment simply redefines the description of that underground stormwater utility system uh, that, that did get constructed. Um, specifically, it identifies the manufacturer of that stormwater uh, facility system. During the pre-development period when the master redevelopment agreement was being put together, the developer was going to use a company by the name of Triton Stormwater Solutions and the accepted and permitted uh, stormwater system is manufactured by ADS StormTech. Both the city engineer and the public works and utilities director accepted the change and it was permitted. Uh, this amendment is important because you want your master redevelopment agreement to reflect what's actually been installed. Um, obviously, uh, for maintenance reasons and for securing warranties for the labor and materials. Resolution 3931 is the joint resolution uh, for the finance of a CRA revenue bond of 2.4 million. This is related to the grant incentive that was approved under the master redevelopment agreement in 2017. Uh, the timing of this grant uh, was to ensure that the investment did get constructed before we provided the grant. So all come July 1st, the project's complete, the developer will receive this grant. So this resolution incorporates the filing first. It provides the authority to release an RFP uh, request for proposal to issue a $2.4 million bond for this project. And I will explain for all of council that this bond is being paid for 
the tax dollars generated specifically from this project that got developed. And that's Exhibit C of the resolution. Uh, this uh, resolution acknowledges the city's annual commitment to budget and appropriate non-ad valorem revenue. And that's through an interlocal agreement between the CRA and the city. This provides a backstop for the CRA and helps market and makes the request for proposal much stronger as it goes out to market. Uh, I must say that this is not the city's commitment to budget and appropriate is not a full faith and credit backing of the city. Um, the interlocal agreement um, within this resolution also does affirm that the city may advance funding as a temporary bridge to secure permanent financing in the case that perhaps the RFP goes out and none of the proposals are acceptable, the city may then advance the funding so that we can uh, follow through with our um, contract with Mr. Zimmerman. This resolution also provides for a three-party agreement, uh, lo uh, loan agreement between the lender, the city, and the CRA, and that's found substantially in, in the form attached in Exhibit B. That, um, that agreement outlines all, uh, all the obligations of the three parties. And lastly, it pro it pro this uh, resolution provides the city manager um, upon uh, consultation with bond council, the city's financial advisor and the finance director to uh, have the authority to uh, enter into the agreements, uh, accept an eligible proposal and enter into the associated agreements on behalf of the CRA and the city. And finally, the last two resolutions, 3934 and 3935, these are budget resolutions um, that are necessary to establish a budget to receive the bond proceeds within the CRA, which subsequently will be transferred into the Capital Improvement Fund. And these resolutions also amend the revenue portion of professional services within Capital Improvement Project 18177, which was the Highline project established in 2017. And it utilizes $75,000 of prior year's uh, CRA funding to pay for professional services. In 2017, we were going to bond the $75,000 for professional services. But since the CRA does have available money, it makes more sense to pay for those with the prior year surplus rather than to finance that debt over time. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. And I know the uh, Assistant City Attorney and the Finance Director are here as well. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Doug. Any questions for Doug? All right. Very good. I have two sign-up sheets uh, under public comments. Uh, Mr. Sam Zimmerman. I'm really just here to answer any questions. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Zimmerman. Uh, any questions for Mr. Zimmerman? All right. And also, Laura Young, Esquire. Thank you, I won't take up too much of your time. My name is Laura Young with the law firm of Dean Mead. Um, our address is 7380 Morrell Road, Suite 200, Vieira, Florida, 32940. And we are still there and we are still open. <laughs> hey, very good. <laughs> very good. Um, I just want to, to thank everybody on the council and mayor tonight. I know we are in a difficult time right now on many, many levels in the professionalism that you all have shown as well as your staff throughout this entire time and they have been continuing to work just like you guys have has been um, refreshing and uh, very much needed um, this project i know uh, some of you were not on council back in 2017 when this project started its life um, well it got approved by city council it started many years before that but yeah. um, it was a it was a very difficult task to put all the moving parts together and your staff has been one of the best I have ever worked with. Um, they put together a team of consultants as well as their in-house uh, staff members to make sure it got done right. They worked very hard to make sure the city and the CRA were protected. They worked tirelessly to make sure they were not um, 
spending the funds of the CRA in a way that would be um, uh, looked at unfavorably or that would put them in a position to say, oh my gosh, we've lost all this money and the developer didn't fulfill his obligations. They put together a public-private partnership that worked and we are almost at the very end of it and it's very exciting to see um, it come on the tax roll and for everything to get finalized. Then one of the last parts is for the CRA to come through um, with their financing that they had planned on, on doing from the beginning if the developer lived up to his obligations and he has. So it's been, it's been a wonderful project to work on. It definitely will be a public-private partnership that's probably cited throughout the state of Florida as a success story because we all hear about the ones that aren't success stories. Um, we don't often get to hear about the ones that are success stories. So. I'm also here to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, Sam and I and, and staff and all their consultants have been working on this project for many, many years, and we are here to answer any questions, and we, we hope that you continue um, and, and believe in this project and are here to fulfill the commitments that the city and the CRA agreed to make. All right. Thank you, Ms. Young. Any questions for Ms. Young? Mayor. Yeah, uh, Mr. LaRusso. I was not here in 2017. However, I know that the uh, council voted five to two on this project. So uh, having said that, uh, I'm uh, just asking my fellow council members if uh, uh, their concerns are um, um, have been um, smoothed out. Are, is everybody okay with, with what's going on right now? I mean, you know, given the, the, the finance challenges and now the change in the bond, you know, that uh, uh, Doug uh, had talked about, 75 out, 75 in, you know, that kind of stuff. Yep. So is everybody... Yep. Mayor? Um, yeah, because we would have asked the questions, Mr. LaRusso. Well, Miss. All right, Miss Meehan, I, I, I'm asking the question right now as to whether or not the other two members who were on this council are happy with what we're going through right now because they voted against it, okay. and so now yeah, that's what I'm asking. Okay, because I All wasn't right. here in 2017. All right, so Vice Mayor Elfrey. Yeah, absolutely, and I've, I have had had the chance and the, the uh, pleasure to work with Mr. Zimmerman and see his product has been outstanding. I was one of the ones that initially voted against it, and I made it perfectly clear because our former city manager had put that this would have a $4 billion annual impact to annual impact to downtown Melbourne instead of million. Um, he did not want to kind of clean up his paperwork and not to mention um, uh, I, I think, and I believe uh, if I remember correctly, I did cite that in his, his his evaluation. That does that is the only reason. Also, he would not bring, put up all the infrastructure projects that this actually Highline was doing. He just knew that he had the four votes instead of, in my opinion, just trying to really put down what this project really is, an amazing private partnership uh, between the city and Mr. Zimmerman. He's done great work, and, and yeah, am I, I'm ecstatic over it. I think it's an outstanding uh, uh, build, and again, uh, I want to thank him for being here and doing what he did tonight. He's, he's a good man, and you know, got to kind of know him a little bit, and you know, I'm honored to, to know him, and I, I support it 100%. Memory. All right, Mr. Thomas. Yeah, also I, I voted against it as well, uh, but uh, after that vote was taken, uh, that was the direction of the city council, and we have we have voted on many other things that are Highline related uh, since 2017 that I have supported, and I know uh, Mr. Alfrey has supported as well. So yeah, there's there's no doubt we're gonna support this tonight. All right, all right, Ms. Mayor. Minus. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I just wanna say that um, I re I recall when um, this came up, um, I met with uh, Mr. Zimmerman and um, he promised me that what I saw was what I was going to get. And I ride by it every day. And I will say that he is a man of his word. I supported it then and I wholeheartedly support it now. So um, I'm, I'm very excited that we um, that the two nay votes um, are positive votes and uh, I'm looking forward to this moving forward. I just want to add, he's open for tours if anybody would like to come yes, see I'm the waiting my dinosaur. turn. <laughs> yeah, right. I would not go because you may want to live there. I'm just telling you <laughs> right now. I know what he was doing. He's, he's getting me to penthouse suite. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. LaRusso, if I can just say one thing, I think some of the concern back in 2017 was there were a lot of what ifs. What if the developer doesn't actually do what he's supposed to do? You know, how is this going to impact the city if we don't get this great project that's been promised? Um, but now we're here to tell you you're getting it. So those, I, hopefully, those concerns are all alleviated from the 
from the council that's mm -hmm. here tonight. Okay. Thank yeah, you. Mr. LaRusso. Thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, I, I was not here in 2017, as I said. Um, my job is to drill down back into what the decisions were before to come up now is where we're at and ask those hard questions. Um, I have not met with Mr. Zimmerman personally. I've not been invited to the uh, to Highline, uh, but I hope to see it someday. Uh, but however, uh, I will tell you that um, uh, that I'm satisfied with with my fellow council members' uh, uh, respect and their honor uh, about what they're talking about for downtown right now. So that was my. We we appreciate it's, you it's drilling down on those questions. Those, it's my job to ask those questions. Wasn't here. You were. Why did you vote no? Now you're voting yes. No, we appreciate so that. Go. We certainly don't want anybody questioning the board later. So the more you drill down on those questions now, Not either in the, in the minutes, the better. All, all right, Ms. Thomas. Some bodies. Um, I just like, want to thank staff. Staff, you've gonna, done an incredible job. When this first came up to council many, many, many years ago, um, it was just a thought. It was just something being thrown around. Could this possibly happen? Could this this possibly become true for our downtown area? And uh, when the first discussion started happening with it and everybody tr started trying to figure out how financially we're gonna make this work um, and make it good not only for um, the company, Mr. Zimmerman, and the business, but make it good for the city and make it good for the residents. And I think that everybody came together very well and was able to do that. I think this is just incredible. I think it's going to be incredible for a long time to come. I think it's going to help us have future development, not only in the downtown Melbourne area, but in the O'Galley area. We've now shown a model that works. We now know exactly how it works. We know how to do it step by step. And I thank you, Mr. Zimmerman. You stay patient. I know this wasn't easy for you, and, and I really appreciate that. So I'm very excited. Yeah. Well, thankfully, the global pandemic has not slowed down the finishing of the construction. Okay, yeah, very good. So uh, when is the official opening? Get updates from the construction company okay. every day, but we still expect it to be July 1st. Okay. And there will be. That's what I thought you were asking yeah. about the groundbreaking party. <laughs> okay, very good. Ruben and is uh, Miss uh, Wendy um, gonna be there? Okay, very good, all right. All right, I'll close the public hearing and we will, if council, if there's no objection, we'll convene as the Melbourne Downtown Community Redevelopment Agency for the following items. Item A is resolution number 3933. Council, what is your Mayor. pleasure? Ms. Minus. I move for approval of resolution number 3933. Second. I have a motion for approval of resolution number 3933. Um, Get to it. Uh, by Ms. Minus, second by Vice Mayor Elfrey. Discussion? Seeing none, those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, and I vote aye, and the motion passes. Resolution number 3931. Council, Mayor. what is your pleasure? Ms. Minus. I move for approval of resolution number 3931. Second. I have a motion for approval of resolution number 3931 by Ms. Minus, second by Ms. Thomas. Discussion? Seeing none, those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, and I vote aye, and the motion passes. Item uh, C, resolution number 3934. Council, what is your pleasure? Mayor. Ms. Minus. I move for approval of resolution number 3934. Second. I have a motion for approval of resolution number 3934 by Ms. Minus, second by Vice Mayor Elfrey. Discussion? Seeing none, those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, and I vote aye, and the motion passes. And without objection, council will reconvene for the following items. Uh, resolution number 3933, council, what is your pleasure? Mayor. Ms. Minus. I move for approval of a resolution number 3933. Second. I have a motion for approval of resolution number 3933 by Ms. Minus, second by Vice Mayor Elfrey. Discussion? Seeing none, those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? And I vote aye, and the motion passes. Resolution number 3931. Mayor. Ms. Minus. I mean, excuse me, Ms. Thomas. <laughs> Move for approval of resolution number 3931. Second. All right, I have a motion for approval of resolution number 3931 by uh, Ms. Thomas, second by Ms. Minus. Discussion? Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? And I vote aye, and the motion passes. Resolution number 3935. Mayor. Ms. Minus. I move for approval of resolution number 3935. Second. All right, I have a motion for approval of resolution number 3935 by Ms. Minus, second by Ms. Thomas. Discussion? 
Seeing none, those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, and I vote aye, and the motion passes. Congratulations, Mr. Zimmerman. Thank you. Thank you. All right, the building looks awesome. I drive by it almost. Right. I'm waiting for my tour. Yes, we got to do a tour. That's right. All right. Now let's get back on schedule. We are under new business, item number 10. All right, so let's get right to it. Item number 10. Item number 10 is, uh, oh, here we go, Spinoli. All right, so this, I'm going to let you read it. Okay. Save time. <laughs> Jennifer Spagnoli, Assistant Director of Public Works and Utilities. This is task order number REI 059 to the continuing consultant contract with Reese Engineering for hydraulic modeling and permitting services associated with the design of the new Western Forest Main to the D.B. Lee Water Reclamation Facility, project number 320. We're currently um, just finished design and went out to bid with the um, new gravity interceptor, which would be the first piece. And um, so while that's going to be under construction, if approved by council at the next meeting, um, this will be the first section of the Western Force Main, which would go along the Mosquito Ditch between Apollo Boulevard and Croton Road. Uh, the new Western Force Main has been in our master plan for some years. It would be a um, future route from lift station six, Leewood area subdivision. Um, so kind of down Croton to the end of the Western Force Main where this would stop. That way we could alleviate some of the flow that now um, has to go to one lift station that goes under the creek. And um, this would actually be a new route where we wouldn't be under the river. Uh, from there at the, um, at Croton and Apollo, well, at Croton Road, at the end of the Mosquito Ditch, the future would be to go further west, pick up more flow from John Rhodes area where we're, we're um, already at capacity in some of the pipelines and then would be able to take future flows um, even further west to come to D.B. Lee. So the scope includes survey design permitting bidding services for approximately 6,100 linear feet of 30-inch force main and funding is available within the Water and Sewer Capital Improvement Bru Budget Project 32320, New Western Force Main to DB Lee WRF, and requesting approval of task order number REI 059 to Reese Engineering Inc. of Winter Springs, Florida for the New Western Force Main to the DB Lee Water Reclamation Facility, project number 32320, in the amount of $104,340. All right, thank you, Ms. Spinoli. Any questions? On this project, yeah, Ms. Uh, Thomas. On something like this, I know we're only in the beginning phases of it, but how long will it take to actually be done? Well, this one will take, uh, I think it's 200 days or 240 days for 200 days for design. Right. Um, so, following year, and that's how we've budgeted this project because uh, it's been budgeted in phases for the future. Um, so, this year is the uh, gravity interceptor construction next year will be the construction for this portion of the western force main then the following year probably um, down Croton to it extend to it from lift station six area and then there's also basically the whole north end of the city could come this route instead of the current route okay great thank you All right. any other questions All mayor right. Yeah, Ms. Sanders. Is this in any way going to help that um, flooding problem that we have over near Parkway and out there by Turtle Mound, out there? No. Okay. One could only hope. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Seeing none, Council, what is your pleasure? May Item number 10. Yes. Move Ms. for Minus. approval. Uh, Ms. Thomas, sorry. <laughs> Move for approval of task order number REI 059, Therese Engineering Inc. of Winter Springs, Florida, for the new Western Force Main to the DB Lee Water Reclamation Facility, project number 32320, in the amount of $104,340. Second. All right, I have a motion for approval of item number 10, as stated in Council's package by Ms. Thomas, second by Ms. Minas. Discussion? 
Seeing none, those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, and I vote aye, and the motion passes. Item number 11, Ms. Spinoli. Task order number REI 060 to the continuing consultant contract with Reese Engineering for the design of hydraulic modeling and permitting services associated with Lip Station 46 Force Main Replacement Project number 32220. Lip Station 46 is located near the intersection of Wickham and Post over by the college or university. Um, the existing Force Main's eight inch cast iron and it's been in service a long time and cast iron and sewer gases don't really mix well. Mm -hmm. So um, it's time to be replaced. And um, it was recommended in the wastewater transmission and collection master plan. Um, the scope includes survey design, permitting and bidding services to replace approximately 3,925 linear feet of eight inch force main um, to extend from the lift station to manhole number 135. Um, act, where it currently, um, from the force main where it currently dumps into a manhole was closer. It was only uh, a little over 2,000 feet. It's a very shallow manhole and there's a lot of odors. So um, we wanted to extend it another 1,755 feet to go to a deeper manhole that was further along. So um, the fiscal of the budget is not adequately funded and a budget transfer in the amount of $51,000 from project number 32015, various lift station force mains, replace sewer force mains is necessary to appropriate funds for this project. Requesting approval of task order number REI 060, Therese Engineering Inc. of Winter Springs, Florida in the amount of $100,570 and a budget transfer in the amount of $51,000 from project number 32015 into lift station 46 force main replacement project number 32220. Thank you, Ms. Spinoli. Any questions for Ms. Spinoli? On yes, this back. Yeah, right. this is, I mean, what do I not see here? Because this, this is district one, but on the front it says district five. Is that just a typo? It must be. Yes, yeah, sorry. Okay, no problem. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited about it, but I was just making sure that it didn't it didn't go way on the other yeah, side. That's wow, yeah. that's huge! All right. God forbid anything should happen outside your district. Oh my God! All right, good catch. Hey, I'm I'm happy. <laughs> I'm ready to make a motion. That smell, that's what's been going on up there in area one. All right, so council, what is your pleasure? Item number eleven. Madam Mayor. Mr. Thomas. Recommend approval of task order number REI 060 to Reese Engineering Incorporated of Winter Springs, Florida in the amount of 100570 and a budget transfer of $51,000 from project number 32015 and the lift station 46 force main replacement project number 32220. Second. All right, I have a motion for approval of item number 11 as stated in council's package by Mr. Thomas, second by Vice Mayor Elfrey. Discussion? Seeing none, those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, and I vote aye, and the motion passes. Item number 12, Ms. Spinoli. Task order number CDM 048 with CDM Smith for hydraulic services associated with re-rating the Grand Street Water Reclamation Facility deep injection well. Uh, the city was just recently issued their new operating permit, which lasts for five years from the DEP. Hmm. However, they made a recommendation um, that they would like us to try to upsize or <clears throat> increase the capacity in the deep injection well. We're currently only rated for 14.92 million gallons per day. However, the size of the well is bigger, but that was what they sized it, and that's what they granted us before. But we had um, a couple of exceedances over the five years of the velocity that was going down the well when we had some emergency high rain events. So they've recommended to us that we should go through the process of um, getting it re-rated to the higher amount, which would allow us to have higher, during higher flow rain events, we could put more down the well without exceeding our permitted limit. Um, in order to do the re-rate, a specific injectivity test must be completed, and this test requires the services of a licensed well driller. 
Flow is injected down the well and is monitored by an acoustic flow totalizer, and pressure is also monitored with a transducer that's temporarily installed. And the data would be collected and submitted in a report to FDEP for approval. The scope consists of CDM managing the project, including procuring the licensed well driller, providing the oversight during the injectivity test, and submitting the um, report to DEP. This work was, uh, this project was not funded because we were only just requested by the DEP, and they actually put a line item in the permit for this being done. Uh, so a budget transfer from water and sewer operating contingency, 94100536-590310 to water reclamation other professional services account 63100535531990 is requested. Approval, requesting approval of task order number CDM 048 to CDM Smith Inc, Maitland, Florida in the amount of $225,428 for the re-rating of the Grant Street WRF deep injection well and a budget transfer in the amount of $225,428. Thank you, Ms. Spinoli. Any questions uh, for Ms. Spinoli? All right, seeing none, Council, what is your pleasure? Item Mayor. number 12, Ms. Minus. I move for approval of task order number CDM 048 to CDM Smith Inc. of Maitland, Florida, in the amount of $225,428 for the re-rating of the Grant Street WRAF deep injection well, and a budget transfer in the amount of $225,428. Second. All right, I have a motion for approval of item number 12, as stated in Council's package by Ms. Minus, second by Ms. Thomas. Discussion? Seeing none, those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, and I vote aye, and the motion passes. Item number 13 is uh, going to be engineering, and that will be Mr. Keith Cunningham, acting city engineer. <laughs> Good night, Welcome. Mayor and Council. All right. Thank you. This task order with Busted Mayor Engineering Group is for ecological surveying, geotechnical engineering, bidding, and construction administrative services for the Spring Creek Baffle Box. And uh, we evaluated a, a drainage basin of about 110 acres, mm -hmm. and we found a location uh, downstream of, uh, of this, uh, this basin that would facilitate the location of a, a Baffle Box that would reduce <coughs> the total nitrogen and total, total phosphorus uh, as part of that requirement for the Savor Indian L L River Lagoon project. Uh, we figure this would potentially remove about 1,000 1, pounds of total nitro nitrogen and 248 pounds of total phosphorus. The work will be completed within 300 days from the notice to proceed. The fee for the scope of service is shall not exceed $94,200. Funding is available within the capital improvement project budget of uh, project number 20020, Spring Creek Baffle Box Project. The recommendation from staff is to uh, recommend approval of the task order BMEG 257 to the continuing contract with Boston Mayor Engineering Group in the amount of 94200 for professional services associated with the Spring Creek Baffle Box Project, project number 20020. I'll be happy to answer any questions. You Thank you, have. Mr. Cunningham. Any questions for Mr. Cunningham on this project? Oh, Mr. LaRusso. Thank you. Um, are we using the same company that we've used uh, all along for uh, the Baffle Box yes, uh, challenges? That continuing consultant, yes. OK, great, thanks. Any other questions? Seeing none. Council, what is your pleasure? Mayor. Mayor. Yeah, Ms. Sanders. I move the approval of task order number BMEG257 to Busted Meyer Engineering Group, Inc. of Merritt Island, Florida, for the Spring Creek Baffle Box Project, project number 220 in the amount of $94,200. Second. All right, I have a motion uh, for approval of item number 13 as stated in council's package by Ms. Sanders, second by Vice Mayor Elfrey. Discussion? Appreciate the uh, confidence yes, in my district. Thank you, guys. <laughs> All right, we're a team. Okay, so those in favor say aye. Aye. 
Those opposed, and I vote aye, and the motion passes. We are under consent agenda. Mayor. Items A through um, E. Now, item number D was pulled. I'll put it back on. You put it back? Okay. Yes, ma'am. That's what All I right. wanted to say. Okay. Thank you, Mr. LaRusso. So, items A through E. Council, what is your pleasure? Mayor. Uh, Ms. Thomas. Move for approval of consent agenda A through E. Second. All right. I have a motion for approval of uh, consent agenda A through E by Ms. Thomas. Second by Ms. Minus. Discussion? Seeing none. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? And I vote aye and the motion passes. Item number 17, ordinance number 2020-38, building signs. Ms. Allison Dolly. An ordinance of the City of Melbourne, Brevard County, Florida, relating to signs extending above the roof line of a structure, making findings, amending Appendix B of the City Code entitled Zoning, amending Article 4 General District Requirements, amending Appendix D of the City Code entitled Land Development Code, amending Chapter 11 Signs and Advertising, amending Section 11.04 Definitions, amending Section 11.20 Signs Permitted in Zoning Districts, providing for severability and interpretation, providing an effective date, and providing an adoption schedule. Thank you, Ms. Dolly. This is under community development. Ms. Cindy Dittmer. Yes, this is the first stream of an ordinance amending Appendix B, Article 4, and Appendix D, Chapter 11, the sign code of the city code. I want to start off this evening and just show council a couple of um, pictures. So um, prior to 1990, our city code for our sign code, uh, we had allowed what some of us may have been around long enough to remember is roof signs. So if you can see what I've got up there, there there's minute. one and then and there's another booth. one. Wow, um, you those sort of that picture. Came out of style and um, we actually prohibited them in our sign code um, back in the late 1980s, almost to 1990, and gave like a five year time frame. So all the roof signs um, in the city, you know, had, had gone through. And I think that was mainly for aesthetic reasons. Uh, back in that time is the different architecture and styles and things have changed. Um, so have our signs. Uh, today we allow um, basically ground signs. Those are your detached signs typically up near the road. And we also allow your typical wall signs. Um, you can see the, the Home Depot there. Um, basically building signage that is, and I call it it's building sign, not a wall sign, that's up on the actual um, facade of the building. And those are the two um, types of uh, signs that are allowed in our sign code today. Uh, so we had an applicant, Mercedes of Melbourne, who came to us early this year um, with a different kind of sign that when it was look, looked at by city staff, it was determined that it actually fit fit into the definition in our current code to actually be a roof sign, which a roof sign is prohibited. And let me just show you real quick um, what was um, proposed. So this is the Mercedes dealership on NASA Boulevard. And if you'll note the big black wall there that comes above the roof, um, part of the definition of roof sign is a, a sign that is above the roof. So today, that's a current picture. There's not the Mercedes logo at the very top of that, and that's what the applicant would like. I'll show you a rendering of that, but just so you can get a feel of that wall sort of protrudes through the roof, and the mm. proposal by the applicant, as you can see there, is the Mercedes logo uh, to be above the roof line. So that's where, when staff met with them, he said, you know, it's gonna require a change in code. So he applied to have um, the code uh, changed with the sign code. So staff's gone through, we've looked at it, we've looked at other codes. There's not a concern um, that we have about allowing signs above the roof line. We were concerned that, you know, there was some type of limit. You know, we don't want somebody to build a 70 foot tall something and then stick a sign up on top of it. Um, so uh, what we've proposed within the, um, the ordinance tonight, I'll make sure that won't happen. And it seems it might be something that we're starting to see more of. This is actually the rendering of the um, dirty dog car wash that will be on Babcock in 192. And we just, this just came in recently and they've also got a similar effect where they've got a sort of a portion of the building that doesn't really need to be there that, that goes upwards and has the, the signage on that. So that also would fit within this new sign code uh, change. So basically there's three changes that's in the ordinance for council this evening. 
Um, one, we're, we're actually defining what a parapet wall is because that came up in the discussion. It wasn't really defined. Um, and then we're allowing that a building sign um, may be above the roof line, but not more than 15 feet from the roof line height. And then we're also prohibiting electronic signs above the roof line. We didn't believe that aesthetically we wanted to get, you know, um, big electronic flashing signs up above the roof line at a, at a height that that could be um, possibly distracting even more to the to the motorists in, in their cars. So um, with that, the Planning and Zoning Board did vote unanimously to recommend approval of the proposed amendments within the ordinance and staff would recommend approval ordinance number 2020-38 based upon the findings contained in the Planning and Zoning Board memorandum. Thank you, Ms. Dittmer. Any questions for Ms. Dittmer? Mayor. Go back to yeah, the, to, to my, the uh, original applicant. Ms. Thomas. Uh, the, uh, Excuse oh, me, uh, Mr. LaRusso, I'm, I have Ms. Thomas as the head of the board. The floor. Um, I just wanted to say a few months back, um, Mr. Rowe, Shea Rowe, uh, contacted me. And uh, once I sat down and spoke with him and he showed me the renderings and the pictures, it made perfect sense to me that this is something that we should, we should do. So um, I'm in full support of this and I thank staff. Staff worked diligently to work hard with him to make this something that would be good for the city. All right, very good, Ms. Thomas. Um, Mr. LaRusso. Can you go back to the original, uh, the that one? So your contention is uh, within this ordinance is to not allow that uh, uh, insignia to be more than 15 feet above the original roof line. Is yes. that what you're saying? Yes. So even if that, even if that uh, a black, um, like wall went up, um, up 40 feet or 50 feet, it could no, it couldn't a, be. A building sign could only be 15 feet above the roof line. And just for perspective, that's proposed at nine feet above the roof line, the Mercedes logo. So we, we gave a little bit more room for, you know, some different architectural styles and elements that may come into play. And just to, uh, to uh, quantify again, one more time, the, uh, we're not, uh, saying okay for the uh, digital signs, the uh, ones that change every 10 seconds or Correct. one minute, wh whatever it is. They would nowadays. not be allowed above the roof line. It's just a, it's just a, a static sign right there. Yep. Okay. Yes. Thank you. I appreciate May. it. All right. Ms. Sanders. So if I'm looking at this right, and I'm just going to call it the big black wall because that's what I see it as right now, um, that wall is okay. We're just okaying the fact that the sign goes on it. Correct. So the wall is a okay. the wall is fine it's it's a you know building wall it doesn't exceed the 48 feet that's allowed in this zoning district so the wall is fine it's when you put the logo which is a sign on that wall then that becomes a building sign and that's where we ran into the problem with the code gotcha i'm in support of it anyone else all right this Here. is a pub oh, oh sorry go ahead this is a public hearing um do i have any sign up sheets no i'll close the public hearing Bring it back to council and Ms. Thomas. Uh, move for approval of ordinance number 2020-38 based upon the findings contained in the planning and zoning board memorandum. Second. I have a motion for approval of ordinance number 2020-38 by Ms. Thomas, second by Vice Mayor Elfrey. Discussion? Seeing none, uh, those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, and I vote aye and the motion passes. Item number 18, um, let me get right to that. All right, is community development, and here is Denise Carter. Good to see you, Denise. Hi. This is a request for approval of the Emergency Rental Mortgage and Utilities Assistance Program Policy. HUD requires policies and procedures for their programs. Since this is a newly created program, policies and procedures have to be approved prior to this program starting. The Emergency Rental Mortgage and Public Utilities Assistance Program aims to prevent homelessness among households by providing temporary assistance for up to three months of rent, mortgage, and or public utility payments. The maximum monthly assistance will be $1,600 and will be paid directly to the owner, landlord, or property manager, or City of Melbourne Water Utilities. The city, the city will use $233,590 from the Coronavirus Act Relief and Economic Security Act under the Community Development Block Grant CV program to fund this new program. The program will be launched on Monday, uh, June 15th. Staff recommends approval of the Emergency Rental Mortgage and Public Utilities Assistance Program. All right, thank you, Ms. Carter. Any questions for Ms. Carter? 
All right, seeing none, council, what is your pleasure? Me. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, public hearing, do I have any sign-up sheets? No, I'll close the public hearing, bring it back to council. What is your pleasure? Mayor. Uh, Ms. Minus. I move for approval of the Emergency Rental Mortgage and Public Utilities Assistance Program Policy. Second. All right, I have a motion for approval of item number 18 as stated in council's package by Ms. Minus, second by Ms. Sanders. Discussion? Seeing none, those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, and I vote aye, and the motion passes. Item number 19 is, um, is community development. Ms. Uh, Denise Carter. Yes. This is a request for approval of uh, an amendment to the citizen participation plan and a substantial amendment to the FY 2010-2020 20 Community Development Block Grant Action Plan. On March 27, 2020, the Coronavirus Act Relief and Economic Security Act was signed to respond to the growing effects efforts of the historic coronavirus public health crisis. As part of the act, community development block grant entitlement communities were awarded an additional allocation of funds known as CDBG-CV. And the um, the city of Melbourne will receive $327,517 that must be used to, to fund activities that prevent, prepare for, and respond to the COVID-19. Um, the Citizens Advisory Board discuss and listen to comments on the proposed, proposed citizen participation and action plan amendments at their May 18th meeting. The proposed citizen participation and action plan changes were advertised on June 4, 2020 for public comment as allowed by HUD, by HUD waiver, uh, and a public hearing before City Council is the final step in the formal amendment process. The public comment period ends Tonight, uh, written comments received on the funding were included in your agenda package. Um, they were all, all positive. They just stated what um, some of the needs were. Um, it, um, the recommendation that the funds from that meeting came out were for um, the emergency rental mortgage utilities program, and we funded that with the majority of the funds at $233,590. Uh, public services activities were requested from Bavard Neighborhood Development Coalition and um, Melbourne PAL. Um, staff recommends $44,800 for them, and then 15% of the funds will be used for administration at 49,127, bringing the total to $327,517. Approval um, of the amendments to the citizen participation plan, I'm sorry, and substantial amendment to the FY 2019 CDBG action plan and authorization for the city manager to su submit the plan for inclusion in the Bavard Home Consortium's Consolidated 2019-2020 uh, Action Plan and to execute all necessary documents. That's what uh, staff recommends. All right, thank you, Ms. Carter. Any questions for Ms. Carter? Yes. Um, yeah, Ms. Minus. Okay, the 44,000, is that um, 22.4 each for PAL in the doc? Um, that's what staff is recommending. Okay, yeah, I'm saying they, they're gonna, 50-50 yes. is what they're gonna yes. get, okay. You said 15% that's gonna be for administrative and then it's gonna be 5% that's left. What is that uh, gonna be in the savings or that's in whole? Or? We, uh, staff was trying to put uh, as much money toward emergency rental mortgage utilities and that's where all the money, the rest of the money went. So the other 5% went to emergency rental mortgage and utilities. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. All right, any other questions for Ms. Carter? All right, seeing none, this is a public hearing. I have two sign-up sheets, Trevor Howard. Well, it's good to see you, Mr. Howard. Good evening, Council. Good evening. We've had an interesting night, haven't we? <laughs> uh, yes, sir. But, it's, but it's all good, it's <laughs> all good. So, Mr. Howard, yes. um, just name and city. Yes, Trevor Howard, Melbourne, Florida. Okay. Thank you again for hearing us tonight. I just want to thank you uh, for the opportunity for being able to request funding for Neighbor Up Brevard. I sit as the director for Dorcas Outreach Center for Kids. 
and basically we have a few areas that we are looking for help in far as in addressing some of the needs that our families and youth have encountered since COVID-19 stay-at-home orders. Since COVID-19 stay-at-home orders issued by Governor DeSantis, 60% of the families that are being served at the dock has either lost jobs or have, have received reduced hours at work, which hit a lot of the homes to where it left families scrambling for support and for help. And what I'm very thankful for is the Booker T. Washington neighborhood coming together to provide food and, and supplies for the families within our community. With that being said, far as in the DOC program, we're looking for areas and funding for our teen and college age tutors. Obviously, we've been doing a lot of distant learning and um, using Zoom to mentor our kids and so forth, but now they're back with us. We officially opened up for our, for our summer camp program June 8th, which was this Monday. And we have teens that we have who we use also along with staff to tutor the kids and work with them. Though we've experienced a COVID-19 slide, we are also afraid of the summer slide as well. So we're working tirelessly to making sure um, our kids are getting I, I'm a, I, adequate support. Number two, we would need cleaning supplies and safety for, for safety precautions. So for items such as a rectangular tables, disposable masks, thermometers, disinfectant materials, and also additional cleaning services. Though we as staff um, work hard to make sure that we are sanitizing and disinfecting, we want to be able to hire a cleaning service to come in and do a thorough deep cleaning um, by the end of the week to make sure everything is set for the following week. Thirdly, we would like to increase our staff hours for summer camp um, that deals with I am the only full time director and the doc program and I have two part time staff that work under me and the part time staff each work 24 hours per week without regular volunteering more hours will be required on the part of the time staff for summer camps. So we're increasing hours because of again um, the COVID-19. And last and certainly not least, do just like many other um, non for profit organizations during this time, they lost an opportunity to receive funding through fundraisers. And as you know, we consistently have two fundraisers at the, um, during the year, one during the springtime, which is our anchor breakfast, and, and another during the fall time, which is our Friends Fest. Well, unfortunately, due to COVID-19, we were not able to conduct our anchor breakfast, which we have moved to other means to go on an online uh, type of anchor breakfast, which is pretty neat. You all should be able to see that with the, in July, sometime in July. But because of that, we this event normally represents our anchor breakfast around about $90,000 and, and priceless introductions to our new donors. Obviously, we have potentially lost being able to receive that income. So what we're doing is we're asking you all to, as you've done all of these years, to continue to come by our side, to, to come alongside of our families, our neighborhood, our organizations, to really help our families that are in need at this time. You, if you all have any questions, I'm here to answer. Thank you, Mr. Howard. Thank you, Mayor. Any questions? One. All right, yes, Mr. Sir. Russo. Hi. How are you doing, um, sir? Uh, the uh, deep cleaning company that you're talking about, uh, are you going to get? Uh, they're, they're popping up all over the place. Correct. Okay. So, how are you going to um, um, establish that uh, they're you know qualified, they're certified, right? Cetera, what, you know the di you know the the specs on what they're going to do and that kind of stuff. Yes. Well, what we do is is the whole criteria in making sure that we get the proper cleaning service is that we one look for those that are soliciting their businesses. Um, also through referrals and from that point on we bring them in let them know what is it that we're asking we have a thorough uh, checklist of things that we need done in our center and then they provide us a quote um, and so we normally sample around about five organizations five companies and then go from there but they must be able to provide their licensing in order to be able to serve and provide services to our organization so perfect and now you know that once you know the, the clean the deep cleaning is done someone can walk in and and, and still have that virus on them and, and it's all over. Correct. You know, so how do you follow up behind that? Okay. Well, what we do right now, we've already enlisted protocols as far as in dealing with COVID-19 that's pre-operational and also post-operational of our services. So basically what we're doing now is that we are thoroughly cleaning each area that our child, children and also staff are working in repeatedly one after another. 
but and going forward to making sure that um, those things are taken care of. First and foremost, um, if you can take all the precautions that you can and, and that you will, and that's the whole goal. But in case if something like that does happen, say someone does come in contact with COVID-19, then we shut down operations for, up, uh, for about approximately 14 days in order to do a thorough assessment of whether or not we can reopen again, which put families out of difficulty, but safety and health is first. Well, and the only reason I bring this up, Trevor, uh, uh, is because um, in uh, my business, restaurant business, that I've got 100 clients out there that are, that are uh, experiencing the same challenges. Yes. And so they open up, you know, we're in phase two right now. We've got 50 percent that we can go out there, uh, 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 you know, uh, capacity outside as long as social distancing is happening. Yes. Um, but there are companies that will come in and there is, I think it's called an APT. I'm not quite, uh, I'll, I'll have to uh get back on that but they but companies that will come in for a hundred bucks uh -huh. and swab certain areas that would be um perceived as high impact areas and shove it into the machine and it'll tell you right there and then whether or not you've got a a, a challenge or not okay. so going forward i would yes i would first of all i would be uh, um, very uh, uh supportive of, of, of that issue um, but I think that the, the follow-up is probably more important than the actual deep dive, mm -hmm. you know, so that every week or whatever um, can happen through that. And, and I'll work through that with, with staff or, or however we got to do it. But, uh, but I'd like to put some, uh, some dollars in place for that follow-up each and every week, each and every two weeks, whatever that I appreciate like. that, yes. Uh, because I, I, yeah. I see it constantly, every single right. day. I mean, I, I have clients of mine that have, they've got their places cleaned they come back a week later they're finding the stuff they're finding it again so, uh, so well, i don't one want of the, that to happen to you and your children and i appreciate that sir um one, one of the things that we do do during the current school year is that we have the uh, current cleaning service that we had to work with during the school year and they would come every week sure. to clean both the youth center and then we will have the teen center but i agree with you 100 percent. that's very important to us right and now. i'll and i'll push that information down to thank uh, you sir uh, to our, our staff and then they can relay it to you of course appreciate yeah. it very I'll much i'll take care of that for Thank yeah. you, sir. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Howard. Well, thank you, Mayor. All Council. Right. Next is Marthenia Jones. Good to see you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm Marthenia Jones, um, Melbourne, Florida. Um, first of all, I want to thank you all for supporting Melbourne Powell, and also I want to thank the city manager for pushing through our roof. We have a new roof, and yes. it's not leaking anymore. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you for that. We really did. Mr. Alfred do it for you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> He's the best roofer in town. What are you talking about? <laughs> he is. He is. <laughs> um. Uh, just in time for summer camp. Summer camp starts June 15th. Also, we've been affected by the COVID as, as well. All of our programs are shut down. We, we don't, we're not going to have a basketball program, football, oh. or chilling in at this time. So we're on hold, but we are going to open up for um, summer camp. What we did was reach out to uh, Northside Presbyterian Church. We partnered with them because we were only going to take 20 kids. So I reached out to Northside and I just offered them, I said, hey, we're only going to reach 20 kids. There, there, there's a need for more kids to come to summer camp. So what we're going to do, we're going to house 20 kids at PAL. We're going to have ages 9 to 12. And Northside, we're going to have ages 5 to 8 there. So we're going to have 20 at PAL and 20 at Northside so we can accommodate 40 kids. So I thought that was a great partnership there. Um, how the uh, COVID has affected us. We have a loss of income from all the activities. Kids are not getting the proper tutoring from our after school and our co college tutors. And also our hours from our employees have been cut. I had to um, lay off one of my employees mm -hmm. at this time. So the funds will help us to, you know, hire her back, hire some um, after school te teachers for our after school program as well. Um, we're going to use the funding for um, tutors, transportation. We want to expand our computer room. What we want to do is um, 
um, grab more computers, not just for the kids, for the, for the parents as well, so they can come in and look for jobs. They can also use the computers to apply for food stamps. We're going to also have that um, avenue for the parents as well. We want to also um, get educational supplies. We want to get cleaning supplies and masks for the kids. And we want to, I don't have to go out and hire a cleaning person. I am the cleaning person. So I don't have to do that part. I have all the cleaning supplies and I do that myself. While, the, while we were down and out for the COVID, what we were doing was um, having the kids come by for grab and go meals. So we ended up feeding 6,130 four meals to the community Monday through Fridays mm. from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. every day. So we're going to start that program back up June 15th. Any questions? All right, very good. Any questions for Ms. Jones? Mayor. All right, Ms. Thomas. I just want to say you're doing a terrific job. Thank you. Melbourne Powell is very near and dear to my heart, and I'm, we're very blessed to have you in there running mm -hmm. this. And thank you for making sure that the kids were still getting fed. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank very you. Mayor. Yeah. Ms. All right, Ms. Minus. Yes, I I too agree um, that Ms. Jones, Ms. I call her Ms. Martinia, you know, is doing a great job as a director there, um, with the youth and everything. It's just awesome. Um, the church, uh, are you supplying everything to the church, or, or are they, you know, hey, I'm they have the kids them. and they're taking care of them. I'm so supplying you are. everything. I'm supplying the cleaning supplies, everything. Everything I have at my facility. It's going to be accommodated at their facility as well. I hired one of their um, church members. I hired the pastor's daughter. She's going to oversee that facility. Also with Officer Butler, she's going to be there, and one of my staff members that's going to be at that facility as well. So we're going to have three, three staffs at that okay. facility. Okay, so you're in total control of everything. Okay, thank you. It always is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And Thank also, you. I had arranged with Mark Pylock through the uh, American Muscle Car Museum to do a field trip. That yes, was that, that was, was last great. year. Yes. So yes. that was awesome. Yes. All right. Very good. Thank you. All right, Council. What is your pleasure? Item number nineteen, Mayor. Uh, Miss Minus. I move for approval of the amendment to the Citizens Participation Plan and substantial amendment to the fiscal year 2019-2020 CDBG Action Plan and authorization for the city manager to submit the plan for inclusion in the Brevard County Home Consortium's Consolidated Fiscal Year 2019-2020 Action Plan and to execute all necessary documents pertaining thereto. Second. All right, I have a motion for approval of item number 19 as stated in council's package by Ms. Minus, second by uh, Ms. Thomas. Discussion? Seeing none, those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, and I vote aye, and the motion passes. Item number 20, let me get right to it, is uh, the golf course operations. And here to restart off would be uh, Jeff Town, Director of Finance. Jeff, you're on. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Let's talk about golf. Um, tonight, Nikki Caldwell, the Parks, Recreation, and Golf Director, and I will be tag teaming this item. We have been working side by side all year long, uh, even when she was interim and now uh, the director, uh, on golf operations, the finances, the future, short-term planning, long-term planning, uh, budgetary issues, staffing issues, and the like. I'm going to be addressing uh, the memo. We're both going to be talking about the memo, which is in your packet starting on page 256, if that helps. I'm going to address the operations and financial conditions of the golf course this fiscal year to date. Ms. Caldwell is going to take over and discuss staffing both city employees and contract employees and our request of the city manager and city council to correct the staffing makeup of the golf courses to address the greatest operational needs, which we, will, which we believe will produce nothing but positive results for the golf course. Ms. Caldwell and I will also talk about internal controls relative to cash transactions and our serious consideration of potentially eliminating those after we poll um, people who actually golf at the golf course uh, and also in discussions with you. Uh, I'll then um, take the discussion uh, on the need to close the golf course enterprise fund as we've talked before with the city's internal, uh, no, external um, independent auditors into the general fund. I'll conclude our remarks with a brief discussion about short and long-term planning and where, we're, where we stand now. And after you've had a chance to have discussion on our presentation, we're going to ask you to take five, action, um, five actions. Um, operation and financial conditions of the golf course. It's been a tough year. I mean, we started off with some 
issues associated with the greens because of Hurricane Dorian. Uh, we were off for a little while there. Um, we had to close the course because of the rainy, wet, awful conditions that were there. Uh, we missed a couple uh, treatments of such as aeration and having to deal with some fertilizers. And we ended up uh, having about eight of the 18 uh, greens at Crane Creek be in really rough conditions with fungus and um, just other issues associated with um, grass conditions on the greens themselves, on the playing surface of the greens. When you have bad greens, you have less golfers. It's just a fact. People don't want to play on bumpy greens. They don't want to play on uh, greens that are either temporary greens because you had to shut down the greens. And that really hurt Crane Creek's revenues this year. Um, we also had COVID. Uh, we also had uh, situations where um, it's now starting to get hot. So it's been tough. It's been a tough year for Crane Creek, which is usually a dominating revenue producer out of the two golf courses for the city. Um, a lot of golfers just have told us that we've gone elsewhere. Some transferred over and played uh, Mallard's Landing, which was great, still kept it in the city, and others went elsewhere. Others went up north, uh, a little bit south of here, but we lost groups of 20 golfers who regularly played every Saturday at Crane Creek uh, to other places because of the condition of the green. Uh, Crane Creek revenues through April 2020 are down about 167,000 from where they were the same period last year. That's huge for Crane Creek. Um, we think it's an anomaly. In fact, we've had more golfers come back. Our revenues have been uh, stronger uh, since then, but it's only been the last month or so since the greens have been kind of fully restored. We had eight originally, then it was five that had kind of taken some time to recover, and then it was down to two or three, and now all the greens are in really good playable condition. But now we're during the hot season of the summer where a lot of our seasonal residents have gone home uh, to their winter homes or what have you, and we have less rounds of golf because of the temperatures that are out, uh, that are here at this time of the year. I mean, the good news is that the greens have recovered. Um, the tough news is that they recovered at the time frame in which uh, we have just less golfers. Um, on top of that, as you'll remember, the contractor for the restaurant at Crane Creek uh, didn't fulfill its obligation, and we were behind on the uh, getting the, the restaurant back up in full operation. It is now up in full operation, but it took a while only because of COVID and also trying to obtain the liquor license was very challenging uh, to get it back in our name. But that is good news. Uh, we're back in operation there. Um, we've had a number of equipment failures as well. Um, it seems like we've been kicked while we were down this year. Uh, we had some machinery and equipment that has been down. We've also had to uh, take care of some irrigation systems, the control systems at one of the courses. Um, and it's just one of those things that you, when the irrigation controls go down, you fix them. Uh, you don't have a choice. You find the money within the bottom line and you, and you get it done. We also had some restaurant equipment fail. Um, recently, an ice maker has uh, failed, so we replaced that. While we're showing a profit of about, a, I mean, all that being said, we're still showing a profit in the Golf Course Enterprise Fund right now of about $160,000. And that was as of the end of March. Um, but I want to caution City Council, we're usually a little bit higher than that at this time. And we see steady decline. And because you still have to maintain the course, you still have to mow the grass, uh, our expenses in May, June, July, August, and September are always higher than the revenue that comes in. Our winter months, we earn the money. We keep it going for the golfers who want to keep playing in the mornings and late in the evenings. Um, so even though we have a positive um, profit right now, uh, bottom line of the golf courses, uh, we'll probably spend most of that down by year end just by the nature of how the golf course functions uh, financially during this tough summer months. I'm going to turn the podium over to Ms. Caldwell for her to discuss uh, staffing related items and then uh, I'll be back in a minute. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. I'm Nikki Caldwell, Director of Parks, Recreation, and Golf. So as you know, over the past few years, we attempted to balance the budget without a subsidy from the general fund. City staffing levels were reduced and more contracted employees were utilized. However, this has been detrimental to the operations of golf. The untrained staff and high turnover rate created declining course conditions, which has resulted in a loss of revenue. Our highest priority is to create a golf course superintendent position, which we currently do not have in the budget. 
if the courses are in excellent shape, they would attract more players, resulting in increased revenue. This would cost approximately $12,475 for the remainder of this fiscal year. We recommend not filling the golf course manager position at this time. Keep that on hold for a while longer. And after an in-depth analysis of the internal control structure relating to supervision, operations, and money management, it is essential, we feel, that four things happen immediately. We recommend hiring an additional clubhouse supervisor, so we have one at each golf course. Right now we have one, and he tries to manage both golf courses, and it's um, not very successful at this time. The annual salary and benefits for this position are approximately 56000 a year. We'd like to also hire a maintenance worker one at Crane Creek. This is one of the positions that had been replaced with a contract employee, which has hindered effective maintenance operations. The position is an integral part of the grounds maintenance crew and should be a permanent, effectively trained city employee. Replacing a contract employee with this permanent position would be an additional $1,000 a month. We are considering, as Jeff said, eliminating cash transactions at both courses. This would eliminate opportunity for theft, create quicker check-in process, and reduce the amount of bank-related work. We would like to poll our customers over the next month or two and see what their opinion is regarding that proposed change. And our fourth request regarding um, all the hiring, the clubhouse supervisor, the maintenance worker, cash transactions, the last part of this is provide the city manager with authority to develop, modify, and maintain a fee structure, promotional programs, special programs, and marketing strategy for the courses. I'm going to turn it back over to Jeff. Just to elaborate a little bit on what Ms. Caldwell said on one of the items that the clubhouse supervisor, we've put that particular person in an impossible situation. I mean, he's running the entire golf operations, also running one golf course, you know, in terms of being present at one golf course, supervising all of that staff, trying to do the budget, trying to do budget transfers, trying to make sure that the new software is up to date, uh, is upgraded um, with uh, help of another staff member. We put so much burden on this one person that it's just impossible for him to be successful. We, we, we haven't done him justice. Uh, he's excellent at what he does. It's just we've put way too much responsibility on one person, and it's just been overload since we've done that. We haven't had the golf course manager for a, a little over a year, I think, now. So he's done a valiant job trying to keep it all together with you know, help from Nikki, myself, and others um, to try to do the best job that he can. So I just don't want to make it seem like he's he's failed. He hasn't failed at all. It's just the way in which the structure was set up. Um, we've talked about the Golf Course Enterprise Fund being self-sufficient. That's the key to being an enterprise fund. It has to operate with all the assets associated with it, be able to replace assets in a timely fashion when they're due, keep up with all the maintenance, um, have a fee structure that supports the operational expenditures, bring in enough revenue in order to have the fund really if it was a for, it's almost as if it was a for-profit business. It runs very similar to how a for-profit business is set up. You record depreciation, all the costs associated with the indirect cost rates that we talk about, the IT allocations. Um, this golf course just doesn't do that. It can squeak by with what we've done operationally by <clears throat> moving a lot of the employees to manpower employees or contract labor. But we've, and we've said this all along, there's no money for capital. There's no money to replace the irrigation system, which is a big expense. There's no money to replace the greens, which we need, desperately need to do as well. The greens were last replaced in 2002, 2003 timeframe at both courses, several hundred thousand per golf course. Um, those need to be done. Um, and carts and equipment, they just need to be replaced regularly. Mowers, I mean, we had to bring a parks and rec mower over to the golf course this year until we could try to figure out did we have the money or didn't we have the money in order to replace a mower. I mean, those are 
clear indications that this is no longer an enterprise fund. The city audit, independent auditors firm, uh, Kyle Riggs Ingram has said that for the last two years. This year, I think they were the strongest about it. Um, there are financial statements. They make recommendations, but it's really our responsibility as city council, city staff, to do the accounting the way it should be done. It's time to close the golf course enterprise um, into the general fund. How that would work is we'd set up separate divisions in the general fund so we could still track Crane Creek, still track Mallard, still track the restaurants at both locations, and kind of their non-departmental, if you will, the annual uh, passes and that type of thing in a separate division. So our goal is to set that up, effective June 30, move the budget over into the general fund, get rid of the IT allocation, that will just now be go back into the IT budget, get rid of the indirect costs, such as portions of my time, city manager's time, uh, Ms. Caldwell's time that we charge as we talk about that indirect cost rate every year, move that back into the general fund, um, and then really track it for the purpose of saying, hey, where are we? How are we doing operationally? And we'll still do a lot with capital. We'll have fixed assets in the main fixed assets along with all other city assets, still tracking them to the golf course so that we know when the replacement schedule has to be up. So we can still track it as if it's in an enterprise fund, but appropriately deal with it in the general fund where it should be. Um, by doing this, I want you to know that th this doesn't impact anything that you want to do in the future with the golf courses. We've talked about whether or not Mallet's Landing is going to be successful in the long run. We're going to talk a little bit in a minute about uh, other opportunities outside the box thinking, big shots, top golf, that type of thing. By moving into the general fund, it doesn't take away the city council's ability to decide differently on the golf courses in the future. This is merely an accounting treatment of how we're going to transact the business of the golf course. Um, included in your packet is the required budget amendment resolution to close the enterprise fund and move the budget to the newly created divisions within the general fund. And this budget amendment includes the necessary funds for the rest of the fiscal year to fund the positions that Ms. Caldwell was just talking about. So we incorporate it all in one to make it simple. Um, if you approve those, great. If not, we'll leave those amounts um, just unspent uh, for the rest of the year. I will say that every golf course that we talk to, and we've talked to several, uh, the golf course superintendent is the king of the golf course or the queen of the golf course. Just so happens that the several that we've talked to are all been men who have been that in that position. But if you don't have good conditions at the golf course, Whatever else you do doesn't matter. You can spend all the money you want on marketing. You can spend all the money you want on trying to do promotion, promotional programs for leagues, uh, individual play, tournaments. But no one's going to come if your golf course isn't worth playing. So we've kind of, we used to have that spot way back when. And we've had a gentleman from Parks and Rec who has been helping out tremendously at the golf course um, with the greens and uh, the fairways and that type of thing and making sure that we do the right um, um, chemical applications, thank you, uh, for fertilizer and that type of thing. He's been helping us out tremendously, but he works for Parks and Rec. He doesn't work for the golf course. And we want someone with turf management experience for golf courses to be able to run our maintenance crews, to be able to know when the equipment's due, to be able to help us uh, deal with the irrigation system and what it's needed, whether or not we need to move greens, replace greens, we need that level of expertise. So our our first and most highest priority is to do that. We would rather do that than hire the golf course manager's position back. So we're listening to golf courses that are making money. We went down to Sandridge. Sandridge has a profit of about $3 million a year. They contract out all of their maintenance to an independent outside consulting firm. They spend over a million dollars a year on that. They have the same number of holes we do. Their golf course is pristine. I mean. There, I mean, we went down there, we were just, when he started throwing around numbers, I was just in, in shock that how much they could do. Um, hey, they're going to do an expansion. County. Yeah, it's county run even. I mean, it's, it's not a private course, it's a public course. So they have two sets of golf courses. They have their recycled water on there like we do. They do a lot of similar things that we do, but their course conditions are in primo condition. And they bring in a profit. They don't have any out-of-the-box thinking like we're talking about with big shots or any of that stuff. Um, but that guy has been doing it. He's been there a long time. He's the golf course manager slash kind of superintendent. Uh, he manages the contract that was out there. And they've been doing the outside contract for years on landscaping. I was like, did you just do this 
recently. He says, we've been, we, he said, people thought I was crazy when I first did it. He said, they bring their equipment in. They bring their staff in. They uh, deal with the fertilizer. We pay them a fee every year that we know in advance what it's going to be. So it can work. Golf courses can be successful. That's not too far from here. Um, and they're doing a really good job at it. So the other um, item is for internal controls, the clubhouse supervisor. We literally have manpower staff on duty without a city employee several days a week supervising them because we've cut our staff so short. We can't do that. <laughs> That's just wrong. Um, we're, we're putting ourselves at risk by doing that. And I don't think that was the intention when it first started. I mean, I think we had the best intention of trying to cut costs and save on pension funds. If you remember that conversation, our goal was to do all that. Um, but we've really kind of put ourselves in a little bit of a box here in terms of relying too much on employees that don't report to, I mean, they report to us because that's the structure, but they're not our employees. So we want to put some a permanent employee in supervision. So we have somebody that's running Crane Creek. We have somebody that's running Mallard's Landing. And we have a golf superintendent that is doing all the landscaping and his maintenance staff and his equipment operators will all report to that particular person. Um, we know the dollar amount is good for the position that we're offering because Cocoa Beach, we know what he makes. He was excellent to talk to. He told us about his golf course. You look at his greens, people brave about his greens because it's a public course, but he knows how to do it. So they have the right grass. We will, I learned more about grass than I probably knew in high school. I'll just say that. Um, <laughs> so I just look at it and say there's just so much that we're trying to do um, in terms of pulling the golf course from where it's at and bringing it forward. Even with a really crummy year this year, and we had everything hit us, as I said in the beginning, I mean, we're still at $165,000 profit right now. If we had the excellent conditions that we had before, a golf superintendent there all year, clubhouse manager, uh, clubhouse supervisor there, honestly, I think we would probably would have really turned a profit because we've been focusing the effort on the revenue, the fee structure. We just need to get the right people in place in order to move the golf courses mm -hmm. forward. Um, we've been working with a focus group. A uh, couple of gentlemen who have played here before, excellent golfers. They're really going out asking their other uh, people that they play with. They're part of that 20-man group or 20-person group that was playing on Saturdays regularly. They've been giving us a lot of good advice, telling us who to go talk to. Hey, go see that course. That course is incredible to play on. Go talk to that guy. He's using the particular grass that we think um, Melbourne should switch to. Um, we've also met with the Golf Course Advisory Board. We went over everything with them that we were going to say here tonight. It's a very good group of people that are honestly so caring about the golf course. They're frustrated. They're frustrated that they don't have resources. They're frustrated that our courses are in such poor condition because we don't have a golf superintendent. They're frustrated that um, you know the golf courses used to make millions in the past and was, the general fund was getting the, the benefit of it. And now it's the other way around. They feel like the, the, it should be in the general fund and treated like a parks and rec program, like the pools are, tennis courts, basketball, oh. um, summer camps, that type of thing. Uh, so they're behind this. We're going to meet with them again tomorrow night um, to keep them informed as to how it went tonight. Um, and I think that that's been a good partnership between us and them. We, want, we need to meet with them more regularly, but we need to get them focused off of the past and what's gone wrong with the golf course and help them get focused on where do we take the golf course from this point forward. So they're really interested in what you're going to decide tonight to see how they can help uh, and, and pick up the pieces there. Um, we've toured other golf courses, lay of the land. We've looked at their budgets. We've looked at their staffing models. We've looked at their restaurants. Um, you know, all the restaurants seem to be about the same. Uh, we've done research on off course golf opportunities as well. Um, we've looked at uh, community development department. Um, Ms. Dittmer's not here, but her and Mr. Dombrowski uh, did some calling around to find out, you know, What's it take to do a franchise at Top Golf? What does it mean to be a big shots uh, location? How many acres do you need? How many dollars do you need? Um, we provided you with like a one page summary of their findings. I played Vero, I went down over the weekend um, with a couple of kids and a friend of mine too, Vero big, big Shots, just to see what it was like. I ended up walking into the managing partner that was there. Talked to him for about 45 minutes about, he's helping Martin County, I'm gonna talk about that in a minute, but 
they have a 30 bay place down there um, in Vero Beach that is 90% occupied all the time. I mean, it's just a phenomenal operation. They have 30 bays, 13 acres. Um, they have got a good funding. He, he struggles with staffing too. He said that's the hardest part for him is keeping regular staff. Um, so we're, we've done some of that research. We're, we'll do more. COVID kind of slowed us down, frankly. We were on a really good roll for a while going out to courses and then COVID hit and it just slowed us down with everything else we had to take care of. But we'll get back on that now that COVID's over. Martin County, I showed you the article that's there. Mm -hmm. They're building their own version of Big Shots. They're gonna, they just got a five to nothing vote by the county uh, commission. I, I can't quite grab the dollar amounts. The person that I talked to who was at the golf course, he's like the second in charge of the golf course. He said that it, he thought it was about four million. The article that I gave you said five and a half million in January, but I think they've done a couple iterations of that since then. They think they're gonna make a million and a half dollars in gross sales a year just from their version of Big Shots with a four million plus four to five and a half million dollar investment on behalf of the county. So they're taking that step uh, in order to go that route. So we're gonna continue to do the research on that to see if that makes sense for the city. Um, and we're gonna continue to work on all the aspects of the golf course operations um, as they go along. Anything else you wanna add? Okay, um, with the exception of asking the city manager if she wants to add anything at this point, we'll be happy to take any questions okay. you may have. Um, and then the five action items that we're looking uh, for city council to take are um, approval of the creation of a full-time position titled golf course superintendent, the addition of a full-time position titled clubhouse supervisor, which would make a second clubhouse supervisor in the city, uh, the addition of a full-time maintenance worker one, um, and we will uh, downsize the uh, contract workers uh, that we use for that purpose and especially important to give the city manager the flexibility to probably delegate to staff to work on specials and promotion programs like leagues will come in like that 20 group people they'll go and say hey how much will you give us off if I bring 20 people here every Saturday in the morning for six months or three months they kind of like go out and bid their group of 20 people and try to shop it around to the courses that they like to play we don't have that flexibility in our fee schedule and we really need it. We need a discount card program. We mm -hmm. need something that gives us the opportunity to really be flexible, work with people, tournament play, the whole nine yards. I mean, we wanna really take this to the next level as if we're running it like a business. That's the way it should be run, even though it's gonna end up being in the general fund. So we want you to give the flexibility to the city manager um, to delegate to probably staff to come up with a flexible discount, pro uh, sorry, flexible marketing, promotional, and uh, maybe discount program in order to uh, enhance revenue generation. And the last thing is to approve the budget resolution to close the, general, uh, close the golf course enterprise fund and establish the divisions in the general fund um, and move the funds. And then we will actually take all the actual transactions administratively as of probably July 1st after we close the month of June and put those in the general fund if you approve that particular resolution. All right, thank you, Mr. Town. Did you wanna say if Anything, uh, Ms. Lewis? Well, I, I think that Mr. Town and Ms. Caldwell covered most of it. And what we tried to look at is that city council's direction, uh, the last formal direction was a desire to keep both courses open, but it was also very clear from council members that you wanted us to consider um, other options such as the Top Golf and the Big Shots and things that we may be able to look at at perhaps Mallard's or perhaps elsewhere in the city. So uh, I wanna say thank you to both Jeff and Nikki for doing and a lot of the legwork um, behind the scenes to find out that information. Um, secondly, the golf courses are community assets. They're financial assets for the city. And so long as we have them and maintain them, we need to maintain them properly. And so in talking with staff and, and the priorities of the golfers, the course conditions continue to be the most important thing that we need to focus on. And so I would agree with the staff recommendation that we focus on that position first and then when we get the courses up and running and we can bring on an additional person to be the golf course manager that's fine um, but right now we want to rely on the city staff that we have with those new positions 
and um, one, as Jeff mentioned, would transition back from a temporary employee back to a city employee, and the intentions were that the city was going to be able to provide, and, and I know when council discussed it, there was a desire to provide the same level of service utilizing the temporary staffing to save dollars because there would be more flexibility with the hours that those individuals worked. What we found over the years is that flexibility really, um, while it may have been there, wasn't fully utilized because you may have periods of the day where it might rain for an hour and you send everybody home and then an hour later the sun comes back out and now you've sent them home. So we never realized the savings that were originally anticipated and we have certainly lost some of the control and the ownership over um, city employees providing that function. And again, you know, the city council has been um, clear to, to me and to staff that we need to protect our city assets and I think from an accountability standpoint we need to have some city oversight you know at least a city supervisor that's there um, in order to to manage the city's resources and the temporary staffing so happy to answer any questions as was discussed if this is a moment in time and this is where we think we are we think it's important to keep you updated on both the short and long term based on your previous discussions and is certainly something we would continue to look at on a month by month basis. All right. Thank you, Ms. Lewis. So any questions for Ms. Lewis or Mr. Town? Yes. I do. Finest? I, um, first, I have a trivia pursuit question, if I may. On page 256, it has, in the heading, it has um, Snicky as the interim parks. Is she still the interim parks director? That's my mistake. Uh, she is not the oh, interim not. parks she's director. <laughs> I used an old memo for my format for this memo, and I didn't change her name either, so I apologize, Ms. Caldwell, the Caldwell, parks recreation right. and golf director. Okay, you answered it well. You passed the trivia pursuit question, okay? Thank you, Cut. Um, also, the the, um, the 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 individual or the the uh, employee who says works for Parks and Rec, um, but he's doing an excellent job of using a skateboard going back and forth between the two um, uh, courses. Um, it seems like to me that he has a lot of experience um, with golf courses. Um, and this is the manager's call, the director and the manager's call. Will he be considered to be uh, superintendent? Or are we looking at some, someone that's outside and put him back in parks and rec? So this individual has been temporarily assigned to assist within the golf courses. And if he desires to apply for the position, um, absolutely. We would always like to hire from within. Mm -hmm. um, for individuals that meet those qualifications. I agree, he's been doing a great job. I don't know if that's something he wants to do permanently or not, but absolutely, um, we're always interested in hiring internally. Okay, right, that was my roundabout way of asking internally, okay. Um, the fertilizer, um, did, were we using the right fertilizer on there? Do we at any time get the incorrect or the wrong fertilizer to put on our greens? No, not that I know of. Oh, okay. So it was always been the right. Okay. The greens are just very old at this point. Um, so when we've spoken to people that replace greens, um, they usually last about 12 years, and mm -hmm. ours are 18, I believe. So it's just time. Okay. So I'm there's excited. There's only so much you can do at a certain point. <laughs> right. Okay. I'm excited about moving forward. Thank you. All right, Mr. Thomas. Yeah, and, and so Jeff, how much money have we spent, in particular on Mallards, over the last, let's go the last seven years on Mallards? How much money have we spent on Mallards? In what regard, sir? It, well, as far as, uh, obviously, the, the big uh, producer as far as income for golf courses is Crane Creek. Mm -hmm. So let's say over the last seven years, how much have we had to defer from Crane Creek to make up the, uh, the, uh, the offset from, from Mallards? Um, I would say that over without having the numbers right in front of me, I would say that it's been about 150 to 225,000 every year that Crane Creek has produced more revenue 
bottom line than Mallard's. So Crane Creek, as we've discussed at previous meetings, has been covering um, Mallard's losses, if you will. Um, so I would say it's probably somewhere between 150 and 225 every single year. Right. So over, definitely over a million dollars. Uh, yeah, I would say since um, since Mallard used to be the money maker long time ago, according to the Golf Advisory Board, yeah. Mallard's Landing was way better than Crane Creek. And at some point in time, and I don't know the history, and we we kept talking about you know 15, 20 years ago, and finally I was just like, time out. I don't want to talk about 15 and 20 years ago. I want to talk about where we're going. But you're right. Old history. It's been. You're right. It's it's been. A reversal at first Mallet's Landing was making more money than Crane Creek bottom line and now Crane Creek is making more money but this year Mallet's Landing has been doing better than Crane Creek because of the course conditions okay and this this is not a gotcha question but when's the last time uh, you, you were out at Mallard's and actually saw it it's probably been about six months okay and and so for the rest of the council members what I'd really encourage you to do is go down and take a look at Mallard's um, I was out there today, and I didn't get a golf cart. Just went, walked around, walked around the course. I bumped into two golfers. Um, the, the first golfer introduced myself, told him I was just out checking on the golf courses, asked him what he thought about the golf course, and uh, he says that uh, that that Mallard's Creek is the worst uh, golf course in the county. Uh, the reason why he plays there is because it's convenient to where he works, and he's an, just an avid golfer. So for convenience' sake, uh, he goes there to play. Met another golfer, almost the same situation. Uh, worked locally, uh, very close where the golf golf is, uh, the golf uh, uh, Mallards is at, and that he goes there just to get a couple of rounds in, you know, every every couple of days. And uh, they all said the same thing, you know, this that it's an ugly looking golf course, and it's a shame because, as you have said, the aesthetics mean something. If you have pretty fairways, you have pretty greens, people are going to want to play on the course. And just as I was talking to one of the golf courses, I looked and he said, look, that's a gopher hole. And sure enough, I looked and I felt like I was in the movie Caddyshack. <laughs> and so sure enough, I saw this little furry creature pop his head up. And there's, there's got, and there was several gopher holes out there. And so, I, I, I mean, and, you know, I get, you know, uh, I, I kind of agree with the, the cash transactions. I'm all about that. I think that's a good move. The move to the general fund, I mean, apples, oranges, I'm not sure what good that's going to do. Because bottom line, I think it's not a, a matter of, of even the personnel issues. The bottom line is that irrigation system's got to be replaced. It's 34 years old. Um, the hydraulic tubes are bad, the signals are bad out there, and I know from a very good source who's very familiar with that golf course, you're looking at about $1.3, $1.5 million to replace the irrigation system. So At one you, course. Uh, at one course, that's right. And so again, all these personnel moves, I mean, we, we've been there, done that before. Uh, I think my first year on the council, Kevin was talking about, well, hey, for us to break even, what we can do is we've got these full-time uh, city employees, they're gonna retire, we won't, we won't backfill them, we'll, we'll, we'll put uh, replacements or temps in there uh, to, to kind of make up some extra money to, to go towards the golf course. Then one year it was the cost allocation plan. So what we found out was Mallard starts off about $100,000 in the hole because of money that, that they have to pay for IT support. And I think the, the number I remember from the IT was somewhere like $34,000 or something like that. It was crazy. But they started off $100,000 in the hole every year. So we went back and looked at that. The staff looked at it, made some changes so that wasn't as near as bad as it was before. Okay, so now we're, we're talking talking about adding positions again that we took away you know, four years ago, thinking that that's going to solve, solve the, the problem. When it's not, it's a matter of resources. It's a matter of having money, uh, money to do the irrigation. And I tell you, with this COVID-19 stuff going on, and limited resources are going to be even more valuable because there's not that much money going into the general fund now, how in the world are we going to run two golf courses? And even uh, and both of these golfers, by the way, that I talked to today were very complimentary of Crane Creek. But even Crane Creek, the greens, the greens are going to have to be replaced, okay? So again, we've got to really look at that, the resources. And I'll be honest, I was ex expecting a little bit more tonight because, I mean, this is really not out of the box thinking what we just went through. Uh, I was expecting a lot more of maybe some recommendations that y'all would have to go to what maybe Martin County is doing or bringing in a big shot. So maybe I've already done some coordination to kind of get, you know, price quotes or whatever we could do to start leaning forward in the foxhole that way. But there's nothing really new here other than, okay, the cash transactions, I'm all about that, move the general fund. But the bottom line, is we're still going to have to pour tons of money um, into these golf courses to be able to, to get them up to where people want to play them because aesthetically right now they're ugly. And don't take my word for it. Go, go check it out yourself. 
go check out Mallards. Uh, and so that's kind of where I'm at on it. I got kind of a little frustrated because I almost feel like, you know, uh, you know, I hear you, but I ain't listening sometimes. And, and uh, especially with the COVID-19 stuff, the, the limited money that's in the general fund now as a result of it, uh, I don't see how this is going to help that much. So. As it relates to the, the top golf component, you know, when you look, the average capital cost of that is $18 million. Um, the drive shack is a capital cost of about $30 million. The big shots, 9 to $12 million. So in the internal discussions that we had, and again, as, as Jeff was talking about, as we began to look at that, there are opportunities at Mallard's based on the size of it and the restrictions that are not there that are at Crane Creek. So we do have a deed restriction on the Crane Creek golf course that it has to be utilized for that. And if it's not, we need to provide a similar course elsewhere in the city. Um, and so that's part of the discussion tonight because the last direction that staff received from the majority of council was that you wanted to maintain two courses. But as council member Thomas said, and, and I think a couple other council members that night was what other opportunities do we have? And when we've talked internally, we don't have the city resources to spend in particular with what we see the upcoming year to be for us to construct the big shots type of facility. So if that's the direction that council would want to go, what we would need to see is um, really a, a feasibility study just to find out what we would need, where we would need it, and how we would put out a request for proposals in order to partner with a third party in order to do that. With the capital um, investment costs of anywhere from nine to 30 million, that's something that from a staff perspective we would be looking for a partner to do that with and so that would require the city council's authorization to begin to implement the feasibility study and put together an rfp to go out for that public private partnership well i'll, I'll just say this because of COVID 19 my priorities again are roads water police and fire and again with the money that's going to be required to get these aesthetically to where they need to look for people to want to play there and not go to turtle creek or go to sun tree or wherever it's going to be an ex an, an exor exorbitant amount of money that, that we're not going to be able to that really we shouldn't we shouldn't do that um, and because we're going to have other competing priorities as a result of uh, the general fund being hit pretty hard because of this COVID 19 stuff so that's kind of where i'm at with it and um uh, I think we need to have one golf course and 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 uh, you know use those limited resources that we have to get make it the best in the county, and uh, and try to do something else with Mallards because what we've been doing over the past seven, ten, fifteen years, whatever, it's not working. And uh, I think we'll be right back here again next year if we go ahead and do this and stick to the plan that's been presented, uh, move to the general fund. I think we're still going to have the same issues, and we're just kicking the can. All right. So. Anyone? Yeah. All right, Mr. LaRusso. Thanks. Um, great insight. Um, uh, I believe, uh, Mayor, you and I, when we first stepped on council in 2004, our first year, uh, we faced this very same challenge. And we went through a, 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 a PR firm and we changed the names, changed of course, names. from Harbor City to Crane Creek, et cetera, et cetera. And it brought back a lot of the players uh, and a lot of the uh, prestige. Uh, shall I say. Um, so I, I'm not ready to throw in the towel, shall we say. Um, I, I'd like to know um, how long um, these courses have been enterprise uh, fund, uh, how, how long they've been an enterprise fund? Uh, for as long as I've looked back, it's been 15, 20 years easy as far mm. as back as the CAFRs go in my office. How long? I'm sorry? 15 to 20 years easy. It yeah. 15, 20 years. Yeah, maybe even before that. Probably before that, don't yeah. you think? Yeah, I would think, I would so. think so. I, I only go back when, so when, when were they first established? Do you even know that? We're, we're ready to throw them under the bus, but we're not ready to know where we started from first. I think it's like 1960s. Well, that's okay. I, I don't need to know that right yeah, now. Yeah, I think it's the 60s. But, but, but these, are just these are just conversation pieces. Uh, you want to start this on June 30th, um, uh, take it out of the Enterprise Fund, issue and put it right on, on July 1st and make it part of our uh, general fund. Is that what you're proposing right now? Uh, what would be the, um, there's four issues here that you've identified for me, okay? Clubhouse superintendent, uh, maintenance one, uh, Crane Creek, um, cash, uh, and you identified theft. I'd like to go into that one. Um, and um, of course, um, the uh, marketing. 
uh, the, the for city manager to have the, the free uh, the fee structure and the marketing abilities and everything else. And where do we draw that marketing expertise from? Uh, we'll draw do, do we have a mar do we have a marketing uh, uh, person on staff that we can draw from and 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 pull down and and say what are the what have we done in the past? What's the other ones done? How do we how do we uh, uh, implement it? What do we try? What have we uh, what do we charged uh, three years ago? What are we charging today? What, et cetera, et cetera. There's so many moving parts on this thing that it. Just, and I'm a little, uh, you know, reminiscent about it. You know, I, mean, I, I, I like the fact that Melbourne has two golf courses. And I understand that we've got some challenges moving forward. But just because we have challenges doesn't mean we've got to throw the towel in, okay? It means that we got to do it differently. So I'm, uh, we have all this information here right now. And I didn't have a chance to uh, speak with the uh, city manager based on uh, some of these moving parts. Um, and let me ask you, if we move that, that date from June 30th to July 31st, would that be an incredibly hard thing for you and your, and your department to do? So that it could give me another 30, or give us another 30 days to really, there's so many, so many things in this thing. You know, you've, I mean, you know, you, you spoke for 20 minutes, 25 minutes, and you know, I'm, you, you never took a breath. <laughs> so, <laughs> Can't, I only have limited time. I know, I know, I know. You're, you're, you're a hockey player, that's why, you know, so. And I've been running a lot, so I can. Yeah. Um, I mean, would The would reason it, why we want to do it at June 30th is so that we can prepare the budget and present the budget with wherever it's going to be, whether it's going sure. to be in the enterprise fund and we keep it there, or it's going to be in the general fund. And June 30 makes the most sense because we're doing the departmental reviews starting next, uh, the following week, and the city manager will have to present a budget to you uh, in uh, late July uh, in order for you to start acting on it. So we want it to be wherever it's going to be placed for fiscal 21 uh, now. Right, so, so, uh, so uh, um, uh, Crane Creek is uh, 160K, give or take, in, in, the, in, um, in the green, right? That's what you said, they're gonna make about 160, uh, they're at that about right now? The whole, the whole golf course right now is at that. Uh, both courses. Both courses combined. Both courses Correct. collectively. All right. So, um, uh, and and our fiscal year ends in September thirtieth. And is this a is this a projected number or is this a a, a, a today number that you just just open up the book and you know what it is? That's March thirtieth, twenty twenty, and I'm predicting that we're going to be flatlined at best at year end because the summer months are here. You really want to do this, don't you? I really do. You want to you change it over. I want to take it to the next level. I mean, you 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 charged us with the majority of the city uh -huh. council charged us with operating two golf courses. We're doing our homework. It's going to take time. I mean, like you said, these golf courses have been around since the middle 60s. Um, I've only been here three years. I've been tasked with this to help Nikki, who's also new within the last six months to a year of really saying, hey, dive in deep. What are other people doing to address your other questions about who's going to be the marketing expert? We're, we're going and seeing successful golf courses, and we're going to mimic them. Why reinvent the wheel? Mm -hmm. Sandridge is more than willing to help us with whatever we need. That guy was incredibly... Can you tell me where generous. Sandridge is? It's, it's Vero Beach. And what is their median income uh, at Sandridge that come, surrounds mm -hmm. them versus what surrounds us? Uh, Are they $80,000 a year in median um, uh, income versus our 36000 or something like that? I'm not sure the median income exactly where they're located. They're located actually. It's on. It's in Wabasso. It's between Sebastian and Vero. I, virtually. I got it. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. I, I wanted to. Yeah, it's, it's kind of. You know, there, there's some big dollars down there. You know, I mean, it's. Big yep. <laughs> there's big dollars, but their fee structure. Try, but not here. Okay. But their their fee structure is not much different than ours. They don't charge more, so that the same round of golf is producing more income for them. They just have better court conditions, course conditions, and people are playing them. And so they're willing to step up to the plate and help you move through that process? Every single person we've talked yeah. to has been like, we don't care. We want golf as an industry to be successful. It's talking about training programs, kids' programs, women's programs, school programs, tournament play. I mean, they really want to have it so that we're taking people from early ages 
and making them golfers so that they want to play when they get older. So it is like a whole new way of thinking. Even the PGA, their focus is on kids now. Well, as, as long as Tiger Woods keeps playing, the, the, the golf stuff goes up. Yeah. You know, we know that. I mean, just so. Uh, um, but so. Tom Brady doesn't embarrass my team anymore, but, well, he's not. Well, that's your problem, anymore, not mine. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> However, I will go, I will say that uh, um, uh, the last question I have, and I don't want to uh, elong this any longer than it is, is that what are the, what's the benefit, you've identified the benefits, okay, of moving it into the general fund, okay? What is the, uh, what's the detriment by moving it into the general fund? Uh, the potential debt detriment, and I think we've mitigated this, is that you lose track of the golf courses. You know, we talk about, you know, the losses that Mallard's had over the years. By moving into general fund, it becomes part of the general fund. It's not like standing out in its own fund where you can just look at the audit and say, here's the number. We'll have to do more work to track that number, but by the way we've set up the divisions and by the way we'll set up the fixed assets and convert them into the fixed asset group and the capital items associated with the golf course, we've mitigated that possibility of saying, oh, well, you know what, the golf course is still losing 200, but nobody's really paying attention to it because it's part of the big general fund. So we've mitigated that. That was my biggest concern with my staff is saying, no, we're going to set it up so it's in divisions so that we can still look at Crane, still look at Mallet, still look at both restaurants, and be able to track the capital improvements and the maintenance that's needed for the golf courses so we can see where are we, what are we making, are we still making money or not. But with the reality of it that it hasn't been self-supporting, so it really can't function in enterprise funding. Anymore. You've spoken a lot about uh, the staffing, okay, um, the, the, the lack of, thereof, okay, and, and the ability to, to fund that staffing. So if it goes into the general fund, is that an opportunity for you, Nikki, to be able to move people uh, if, if I, I'm just going to make it up as I go. You know, you're, you're done mowing the grass this week. I mean, your, your chores are done, and after 30 hours, you've got 10 more hours to fill your 40. You're going to, we're going to send you over there. I mean, can you plug and play that easily with with city staff where you couldn't before with enterprise? It'll be a lot easier to do that. We'll still charge the, the various divisions, but it'll all be in one fund, and we'll be able to do that as she deems fit and necessary in order to maintain both Parks and Rec and the golf courses. We'll still charge it. If we have somebody who's typically 40 hours in Parks and Rec and now they do 10 hours and 10 hours in the golf course, we'll make sure that they're, um, when we put in our new time and attendance system, we'll make sure that those 10 hours go to the golf course divisions. So we'll have a much better tracking system when we do the time and attendance system. But yes, we can do that. And it gives her a greater flexibility for like, if we have a major issue, boom, dump a whole bunch of people there, clean it up, then put them back to the regular duties. We can still do that now, but we charge it off to the enterprise fund and it just makes it look ugly. Yeah, sure. All right, I've, I've made up my mind. I, 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 you know, because of my background, I, I would just love to see what the marketing uh, looks like. You know I mean? Not that you have to get approval or anything like that, but I'd just love to see what that looks oh, like, we'll you know, at, to, moving forward. We'll be happy know? to bring it back to city council yeah, and tell I, you what our I mean, even are. individually, I mean, it, we, we don't have to have this big, long conversation about it, but I mean, certainly it's, it's very in, enticing to me to be able to uh, plug into it. One other key thing, if I may, Mayor, is that Ralph and his crew, they have to do the reclaimed water, and they're supposed to dump so much reclaimed water out into the system every single year. Mm -hmm. Mallard's Landing takes a lot of that reclaimed water. So if we were to close Mallard's, for instance, just so you know, that would have to be one more thing that we'd have to be responsible to try to figure out what are we going to do with Ralph's reclaimed water. It has to go out by DEP regulations. And so we have to produce so much and distribute it. So that, that's a lot of water that we use. And the water fund, thinking outside the box, we were thinking and going back and forth, because Ralph needs to get rid of his reclaimed water, we charge the water and sewer to fix the irrigation systems that were in the water that were in the golf course fund this year. So we took it from water and sewer funds because it's his water that needs to be dumped. So oh, that's we, a good we, idea. Did we did think outside the box on that in order to get that. And we might think outside the box on some of the irrigation yeah. repairs that affect reclaimed water because Ralph wants to help. Ralph, plus he's a golfer, Ralph wants to help <laughs> because he really needs to get rid of reclaimed water. He's always looking for more ways to get rid of the reclaimed water. So that's an important critical component to that. It was creative on our part this year in order to try to get that done. So that's Ralph a good idea. was really great to help work with us on that. And I've got one question. We've got a, 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 a brain trust of sorts of golfers, you know, and golf, uh, you know, the advisory yeah. um, uh, board. 
are you looking to eliminate that or oh, no. still keep that in, in oh, force? No, keep that, keep that in force. Okay. Absolutely. They, yeah, I mean, they, they bring they a hundred years worth of, of knowledge to the table. I'd actually like to bring some new blood onto that too. I mean, it seems like it's been a core group of people. I would love to expand that and just say, hey, and promote the golf course advisory boards here. Come talk to them. Mm -hmm. Let's work collectively. Anybody who's interested, I know the two guys that we had been working with in the early part of going through this, they've got a team of a whole bunch of people that want to see nothing but golf courses thrive in, in Melbourne. So everybody's willing to help. Outside people, inside people. We've been fighting this for so long. Show me. We really have, right? I'm Missouri. Yeah, show show me. me the money, right? <laughs> show yeah, me. But, and it's called term limits, just like we have to up here, you know? Uh, oh. Vice Mayor Elfrey. Yeah, I've been down to Vero and I've looked what they do with the big shots and such. And even my, my daughter, my teenage daughter, loved it. So uh, I think we tasked our staff. We tasked, you know, Nikki, our new park director. I know she's been all over it. I mean, uh, I mean, our city manager, Jeff, I mean, I, I trust him. And I, I know this is not going to be an overnight fix. And if this was going to take to at least start to get the conversation and move forward, you know, they're going to be coming back to us. I support this. I want to move forward with this. Okay. Uh, Ms. Sanders? Okay, so um, first I want to thank you both for the amount of time that you obviously put into it and the passion that you have to uh, make this a go. Um, but us as council, we tasked our staff with coming up with a plan um, to possibly increase revenue at both golf courses and to save both golf courses. Um, and I think this is just the first step, as you said, uh, in doing so. So I would like to give our staff the chance to um, to do that and do what we've asked them to do and to finish uh, what we've asked them to do before we pull the plug on it. Okay. Uh, Ms. Thomas? You know, um, the six years that I've been on council, this has been brought up every single year. We are already know what hasn't worked. At least I know it hasn't worked in the six years. And I think that we are now coming up with a plan that could very well work. And I would love to be able to see it um, come to fruition. Um, I like the fact that um, Mr. Town, that you and Nikki are both working together on this. I think having the finance side of it along with the park and rec side of it and merging those two together, especially with this going into the general fund, I think that's wonderful. And I think the two of you have already shown that you're very excited to get involved and help make our gol golf courses better and profitable. So I, I, I trust you guys, and I think that you guys will do a great job. Remember? Mr. Thomas. Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I see the reclaimed water thing is, is huge and probably the reluctance of the staff to go further than that because the reclaimed water goes into the Mallards golf course. Um, so what's the plan for for those, the, the, the irrigation system to be replaced? So we go ahead, we move it to the, the general fund, uh, we approve the positions, so then, so then there's gonna be a, a commitment to replacing the irrigation system and then also getting the greens uh, to where they need to be so people want to play, especially on Mallards. Now, Crane Creek's not far away, but, but Mallards in particular is, and go, go look for yourself, uh, fellow council members. But is, so what's the plan there? Our plan is to bring before you a CIP plan that includes irrigation improvements, greens, re greens replacement on both courses, and it's a timing issue. You can't obviously shut them both courses down at the same time. Right. So you got to bring them down. Recommendation from everybody we've talked to is close them down, close, do all 18 at one time. Don't try to do six and six. I mean, don't try to do nine and nine. Don't try to do like the front nine. And then the next year, do the next nine. It'll take you four years to do both courses. Shut down golf course, do the greens replacements, put in new, better grass that is working really well in Brevard County and in Florida. That's less maintenance, less prone to um, fung fung fungus and insects and um, um, we control, I mean, they, they really have this new uh, grass that's out there that is really much better than the grass we're using. And also things such as cart replacement, our equipment, um, and uh, the irrigation system working with the reclaimed water division to try to see what portion of, because that's going to be expensive, we'll probably have to go yeah. out and finance that. Yeah, no what portion of that is there would be their responsibility and what portion would be the general fund's responsibility. So it's definitely going to be a mixed bag in terms of funding and recommendations that come back before city council, but they will all be on the five-year capital plan. And as far as the greens go, uh, uh, they gave me a recommendation, USGA greens are the greens that you need to put out there for the golf courses, USGA greens. 
Um, and so, I, you know, I'll support this. And again, I'm feeling like Missouri tonight. Show me. Um, and I'll give this an opportunity to work, but you know, um, there's going to be a substantial amount of money that's going to have to be invested to get these, in particular, Miles Creek uh, course the way it needs to look. So, and again, competing resources, I and mean, we don't know what the outlay of uh, COVID-19 is going to be to the general fund, and a lot of competing uh, resources out there are competing priorities with very limited resources. So, we'll, we'll see how it goes. All right, I have a question. Um, the clubhouse. Um, you said, did you apply for an alcoholic license, or are you in the process of? We have it now. We're you all set. have it now. Mm -hmm. Okay, on both, um, on both Mallard courses. and Crane Creek. Okay, and it's, it's our beer license. You know, it's our oh, it's beer license. and wine. Uh, beer and wine. Yeah, beer and only. Wine. All right, so you can't yeah. sell alcohol. Into when I say alcohol, liquor, I didn't right? mean to say we we're applying for something greater than we had before. We had turned it. We had allowed the outside vendor to get their own, yes. so that they could sell the beer and wine at Crane Creek, and now we're we got it back. You got um, it so that's in okay. the city's name again. It was okay. always in Mallard's, but when the outside vendor came in to run the restaurant at Crane, yes. they took over that. Now we have it back. It took okay, us a little while, so but it's back good. So it's just beer and wine. Right. Which somebody yes, right. beer and wine. Right. If you need liquor, I know five guys that are selling liquor license, okay? But that's that's my world. <laughs> Since I had to sign off on that and get fingerprinted, it's under my name. We're going to stick you can beer and wine. Uh, <laughs> like some liquor right about now. I, I got it. No, I, 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 I see that all day long. I can use a Cuban um, sandwich. <laughs> uh, the greens, though, you, you brought up a, a good point. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the greens and then the reclaimed water. Um, and not just knee jerking and saying that we should use this and we should use that based on what's good in Brevard and what's not good in Brevard. Um, it, it may pay for, you know, to get a consultant uh, if you're going to go that far mm -hmm. and you're going to shut down the course for that long and you're going to make this investment into those courses that you get somebody in there that says the recl this reclaim water based on what I, I've analyzed that comes out of your faucet based on the grass that's going on into the grass. So that it's just like, you know what I'm saying. You know where I'm going. So we're just not knee-jerking stuff here. We've done you know? some of that research with okay. other, with other uh, golf courses that also use reclaimed water. And the reclaimed water that they use with the type of uh, seed that uh, the grass that we want to use is very similar. So, But we will confirm that all before we actually go I'm out and get it. I'm just thinking out loud. This so all. if you're going right. to shut yeah. the golf course down, I guess you would do that during the summer months when it's hot. Yeah, it would be spring months so it grows through the summer months. There's okay. a time that you have to do it. Okay, there is a time. All right. Mayor, one yeah, more thing. Ms. I just want to say I have two yeah. millennial sons that are avid golfers, and um, I know for them, back to the marketing idea in here, everything that they do, they go, I have an app, and they go on that app, and they look what's on sale that weekend or that weekday, and that's the golf course they're going to pick. Mm -hmm. And that's millennials, the, you know, this day. So just for food for yeah, thought, you good. know. Perfect thought. Yeah. yeah. Perfect thought. We've been that's talking a good about idea. that with the Golf Course Advisory Committee. What we have now is really weak, and we need to get into the modern times with all of those apps. I vote aye. Yeah. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Any other uh, discussion? Seeing none. All right, council, we need uh, some uh, okay, mayor. action. All right, so let's start with number one. Okay, mayor, move for approval of, can I just read all of them and we do it all in one? That, yeah, that, that would be, be a good idea. Creation of a full-time position titled golf course superintendent, addition of a full-time position titled clubhouse supervisor, addition of a full-time position maintenance worker one authorization for the city manager to develop modify and maintain a fee structure that allows for promotional special and discount programs to enhance revenue generation second, second. all right and then we'll uh, vote on number five for the and then we'll do b separately yeah i guess we'll do that all right so uh i have a motion for approval um items one through four as stated in council's package by miss thomas and then miss Ms. Sanders. Oh, I thought it was Ms. Sanders. Mm -hmm. Second for uh, Ms. Sanders. Discussion? Seeing none. Those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, and I vote aye, and the motion passes. Item number five, approval of resolution number 3936. Mayor. Uh, Ms. Thomas. Move for approval of res resolution number 3936, <laughs> a budget adjustment to close the golf course entertain enterprise fund and create golf course divisions within the general fund. A second. All right, I have a motion for approval of resolution number 3936 as stated in council's package on item number five by Ms. Thomas, second by Ms. Minus. Those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed and I vote aye and the motion passes. All right, item number 21. Item 21. 
All right, discussion regarding the reopening of city facilities to private events and activities. And uh, Vice Mayor Alfrey has yes. put this item on the agenda. Yeah, All thank right, you, ma'am. Thank you, real quick. Um, I wanted to bring this uh, in front of council for discussion. Um, I, I know we've been kind of going in a very quick motion to open up different events, venues. Our staff have been working diligently. The rules are coming out, you know, phase one, phase two. Um, and, and so, you know, everything's moving quick, and I, and I know we, we kind of opened up the, uh, uh, some, of the, uh, some of the facilities recently. And what I wanted to bring forward is, is I've, I've started getting a lot of calls, and I mean more calls than I, I, I expected to get, but it was regarding the gun show on around July 4th. And, and uh, so I started getting calls, wanting to know, well, why can't we have it and stuff? And, and actually the, uh, the gentleman here, he'll come up and speak. He, he puts it on every year. And uh, looking into it, it just appeared that there were some issues that well, I feel like to be addressed by council. And I don't know if they're actual or they're perceived, but I figure it's a, you know, with a sunshine law, we have to bring mm -hmm. board and talk about it. Now we do know that there has been a, a direction through the state of Florida Florida by by government, local government to, uh, and I'll go here, uh, resolution that was sent to our city last, about a year ago, a resolution calling upon local government to prohibit gun shows on government property in Florida. Uh, this resolution that was adopted in, in South uh, Miami um, basically states that they hereby call on local governments to prohibit gun shows on government property, uh, and they go on to say that they forwarded a copy of the resolution for us uh, so if we wish to follow it. Um, I don't, and I'm sure most of my council uh, don't. Now, talking to the gentleman up here, and I'll have him come up, the, the promoter that puts it on, um, it appears to me uh, that there's been restrictions put on the gun show that makes it very difficult to operate. For example, years ago, you used to, could, you used to be outside. You, you know, used to put up the VFW and such, and you can rent tents and stuff outside. That's been taken away from them. Now, if you know, like earlier today, I mean, we approved the MCA to be used, and likely there'll be a 4,000 people there. I mean, we it, it's really the people's venue. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I wanted to discuss that with my council because these are Second Amendment rights, and I value all the rights, First Amendment, Second Amendment, but these are also my rights. I mean, if I'm not if I'm not up here fighting for my rights, then I shouldn't even be up here. Uh, so I, I kind of would like some direction. I would like myself, with many other people, including the promoter, would like to see the gun show uh, move forward on in uh, next month. And I'd like for him to come up and address uh, some of the issues and stuff that he's ha he's had. Okay, so I have Bill Page. Bill, oh, yeah. And your it's sports show. Is that what you have here? My name is Bill Page. I've been running gun shows here in, uh, at the Melbourne Auditorium since back in the 80s. Wow. We have probably put on well over 200 shows at that location. <coughs> right now, I'm not sure exactly who did it. We have a new individual running the shows. If any of you wanted to run for election, I cannot put you outside. They have restricted us from putting anybody outside. I have judges who want to run. I have uh, oh, council yeah. members he, from he Palm Bay that. all over. I cannot put anybody outside. We used to put a table on the sidewalk. Right. Yep. Any mm -hmm. veterans group, any uh, anybody mm -hmm. who is looking for, for uh, contributions to any organization, we cannot do that. They have restricted us inside so that we no longer can use the front lobby, which I have been using for 30 years. I mean, we, we've been here since the 80s. I can't remember exactly when, but October 85, I was in a show there, and I think we took over probably in 87. Now, I have had a state of Florida police officer at my show, which works all of our shows, and I know this person very well. I don't have to train people. That person knows exactly what we have to do, what we expect of them. We even let that person count money for us. That's how we trust that person. So I want you to understand. All of a sudden, I have to put in a Melbourne police officer. Why? I don't know. But they made somebody made a directive out of this organization 
I don't know who it is, but now I have to do that. Now the next thing is, starting in January, I have to put in two Melbourne police officers. And here's the next problem. The new contracts are saying that we cannot open our doors at 9 o'clock in the morning unless two police officers are on site right there. What if there's an emergency and I can't get a police officer? What happens if he has an accident on a wife or the wife or something? We can't open the door. The Melbourne Auditorium, our gun show runs $24,000 to put on. How do I tell my people we can't open because I don't have a police officer? Now, we've had a couple of incidents. If I have a problem, my police officer takes care of it. And I, again, this police officer does three of my locations with us. And I think that police officer has been with us in excess of 15 years. That's how long I've had it. Now, we don't have a lot of problems at our shows, uh, maybe three or four in the last 15 years that I know of. But if I would say, if, sir, what I would say right here, uh, if I may, uh, real yes, quick, sir. and, and that's, that's standard everywhere, though. That's any event. That's not your show. That's any event. That's and right. I know we discussed that in your office. And uh, my question, what other gun shows do you put on around the state? We do West Palm Beach. We do Eustis, DeLand, and Melbourne. I will tell you right now, St. Lucie had a show two weeks ago. Not a lot of people came, but the Civic Center had their show. I will tell you that Burnell had one, and I believe Ocala had one a couple of weeks ago. Tampa, the fairgrounds, is opening up on the 20th. Fort Myers is opening the next weekend. Now, these are big facilities. Melbourne is not that big. Melbourne is a 250-table show max for us. Our facility down in West Palm Beach, we can do 800 tables. Right. Now, now if I may ask you now, sir, real quick, the uh, the... A lot of the people are renting space from you. They're private contractors, I assume, correct? All of our people are individual private. Generally, most of our people are, are better. About half of our people are in their 60s. So they use their Social Security money. Then they come out and subsidize their food, their living with that. You, we all know that Social Security, on average, it pays a little bit less than $1,000 a month. Right. And, and I did receive a call from a handful of, of vendors basically saying because of COVID-19, they haven't really, they've been kind of starving out there because they rely on you to have your show, which is pretty successful. Now, so would you say in your opinion that you're being choked out by in the city of Melbourne? I don't know what's going on, yeah. but all of a sudden they started putting restrictions on mm -hmm. us right. and more and more. So who's we try they? to keep our show reasonable. Yes, ma'am. So who is they? Who's Pardon? who is they? You're saying that they're putting restrictions well, on your show. Well, it starts with the new manager, and then there are people above them that may be making decisions. Okay. Now I had a lady call me last year during this hurricane that didn't hit us. We had a show scheduled that weekend, the hurricane that wound up down in the Bahamas. Yes. Now, I don't know who the lady was, but she called me because at 3.30 in the afternoon, the manager of the auditorium called me and said, you can't do a gun show because we're in a state of emergency. And I said, that's wrong. The governor or the sheriff has to state that firearms could not be sold during emergencies. That did not happen. So I started at 3.30 in the afternoon canceling the show. We got everything done the next morning. It was over. At 2.30 in the afternoon, I get a call from the individual stating, why aren't you here? And I said, you canceled our show yesterday. His, man, his exact words was, make your case. I had the paperwork in front of me that has the laws, the rules, the regulation. And I'm telling you, in my business, we have to follow everything. I have ATF on speed dial. I have the sheriffs. I know our sheriff. I have a police officer who does my concealed weapons course, a sergeant that's on your police department. This all happened. Now, that little cancellation cost me over $8,000 because all the billboards are out, all the radio stations are out. How do you cancel something? 
that close to being put on. And the hurricane, of course, never hit. And when it would have hit, it would have been Wednesday, Thursday, the next week anyways. So we would have been gone. Mm -hmm. So this was out of my own pocket. Now, somebody is making decisions. And I don't know who it is, but I had a call from a lady from the city who apologized to me for canceling the show because I don't believe she wanted me to put a lawsuit out, which I would not have done anyways. I'm not into that. Well, and, and another question is, you, know, you pay all your fees, or you get, you, you, how much do you pay the city a year? In uh, fees? Our city fee is about $5,200 a show right yeah, now. And so, I can remember starting out when we were 2000 or right. 1800 yeah. or something. It used to be the first of the up. month, too. Right. And, 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 and the parking lot would be so full every time I drive by. Well, now I had an individual come in and say, when we rent the facility, we don't rent the parking lot. And that individual went back and read the contract and says, we do rent the parking lot. Here's another issue. I get a call from them. I have to have a parking permit for any trailers that are left out in the parking lot. And I'm saying, OK, no problem. We have to get a special permit from the city to leave the trailers out. Never had to do that before. This is under the new management. All right. Well. I think the individual thought that we could not make this up. I took every contract I had for the following year. We made up every permit for that. I walked in and I handed them nine permits. And it was like, oh, that's the expression I got. Like, he didn't think I was going to do that. Well, we're a very professional office. I own three businesses. And we just built eight buildings in the city of Melbourne, down on uh, just south of the Pioneer. Mm -hmm. We are very professional what we do. This is not something. I've been doing this since 1968, folks. A lot of you people weren't even around no. at that time. That's how long I've been doing this. Well, and and and, and I understand, and I and I thank you, and, and thanks for taking the time. But I've received a lot of calls, and their question is, "What's wrong with oh, your city?" Let me, let me get a little bit. Good, sir. This business is not about us. You have to understand that it is not about us making money. I do very well, folks. That is not about us. Our business is about people. People coming to a show, doing a good job putting it out. But it's also about vendors who come who need the money to live. Mm -hmm. That's it. I've been down for a little over three months. That is roughly five to six thousand dollars in sales taxes that you don't have. Mm -hmm. And don't tell me this says it doesn't need money. I just listened to some of the golf course issues. OK, and I've been listening to that for years. I don't play in politics, not interested in politics, but I've been here for 35 years, folks. So I know what, and I follow a lot of this stuff. So I have a pretty good idea what's going on. I have a pretty good idea with the economy. I read the Wall Street Journal cover to cover every day. And I get a lot of information. But I know that we need to produce, and we need to get out there, and we start making money Let's get this economy going. Well, and, it, and it's also about customer service. And again, it really bothers me to, to thank, sir, it bothers me to think that, you know, that many people ask me, well, why don't we have the gun show? Uh, what's wrong with your city? You know, it, we're supposed to be customer friendly. And really, I, I wanted to bring it up to council because that's what I do. I bring up the issue. I mean, it's really great from where we sit. I mean, everything's great. Everything's wonder, wonderful. They tell me how funny my jokes are and how, you know, how, how I'm growing hair now. Well, you know what? It's not true. And the fact is, I, I want to help this gentleman and help our residents. And, and again, okay. you know, that, that's what I want to do. Paul, All right. at one time, I was 34% of that auditorium's income. The, new, the newspaper used to call me every time the new facility was talking. I said, yes, we need a new facility. We need 40,000 square feet. I need at least 30,000 to run the shows. But I know you don't have the money to do that. I know what buildings cost. Like I said, I just built eight. I know. I'm only, I'm only here to help finance this and, and, and make things work. 
Well, and also, you're, it's my agenda item, sir, and I'm not going to have my Second Amendment constitutional right stepped on by anybody well, while I'm up here. So, to honestly, at all due respect, sir, it's a little bit further than uh, over, over, over you. It's my rights here. And, and the, the dozens of people from Royce Bartlett and everybody to call me and go, what's wrong with your city? And I said, well, I'll find out. Because as long as I sit up here, I'm going to be a problem solver, just like my fellow council members are. So I know, Mr. Thomas, yeah. you, you had something, All right, sir? Mr. Thomas, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I'm, I'm still confused. Yeah. Who is doing this from the city? Is this a city employee that's doing this, <laughs> or? Well, well you city. know, sir, uh, Mr. Thomas, we are the city. The fact is, the staff, you know, we we give direction, they follow. But the fact is, that we we've had we've had a a director that didn't really do well, and they were replaced. I mean, a director can change how people feel about the city. The fact is, I think it's a bigger issue now. I mean, you have a a, a show where again it's earlier we can you know we we can allow a, a group to use the whole outside and four thousand people, but no, he can't use the outside and he can't use the lobby. And we have other cities saying, well, we can't you know exercise our Second Amendment rights. So we're here, I'm here to get this right. All right and so you're saying staff is dictating the rules here. Is well, apparently, I mean, unless you have answers, well, Mayor. Well, it's okay, that's what I, I'm trying to. Then it goes to the next person, and the next person goes right up the line okay. through parks, I, I right. assume. Mayor. That's how it goes, uh, doesn't Mr. it? Thomas, are you done? And somebody's making this. I would love on, to sir. sit yeah, down. Hold on, sir. One more thing, Mayor. Yeah. Or whoever. Hold on, sir. Sir, uh, let, let's have a discussion, sir. Yeah, and then the other thing is, because I can remember the first time I ran for office in 2012, all the candidates mm -hmm. had their little That's tables right. and canopies set up out, out there. And I think yes. we paid yeah. $50 or something, I think. Uh, to be able to set up our tables and so yeah that's another venue that really people need access to as well as you as well as the veterans groups that want to come out and yeah. and try to you know do stuff so um yeah I, i'm interested to find out how we can get this fixed okay. and who's responsible so we got um miss thomas and then miss julie and then so i guess my question is what is the ask here what are we trying what is the full yeah. ask of what exactly that we're wanting to well, happen no, the ask is easy i mean it's ask is easy why is this group uh you know limited on what putting on a show when other group when other groups can okay. so what is that specifically so you want the show to happen well yeah day, absolutely right to ha be able to happen yeah. is it next month yeah. yeah, without then, limitation, without the limitation so, that's being be placed on them. And the parking sure. lot. Sure, I mean, why not? I mean, I mean, we, we give it to other groups, which I'm proud to do. That is, that's what it's there for. It's the people's building. Here's another thing. Do all other shows have to have two Melbourne police officers? Other shows don't have to have it. Our old contract said if you sort alcohol, then you had to have it. But we don't have alcohol. We don't, for right. we don't have it. Okay, I won't let it in at all. Does other shows have to have police officers? No. So are we being discriminated against? If nobody else has to have it, how come I have to have it? You made a comment, is all we need is somebody bonded with a concealed weapons permit and a security license. Mm -hmm. By law. That's all we really need. But I have a police officer who I like very much, and I'm fighting for that individual tonight to put him back to work in our shows. If I can't get it, fine, but that's what I would like. My question is this, I guess it's to the city manager. Um, obviously something has changed because as uh, Councilman Thomas had mentioned before, there used to be tables outside. It used to not be this difficult. What changed? I have no desire to set anybody outside, young lady. Okay, Mayor. I have no desire to do that. I'm not making money from that. I want people to set outside politicians, uh, people. That's what I'm saying. There's been a change from before. Like now you're, you can't have anybody outside before you could. So I'm asking the city manager, what changed? So this discussion here tonight is the first that I'm hearing of it. So I've not had an opportunity to talk with the Parks and Recreation Director to find out what has happened and, you know, how we can work to solve that problem. Um, and without having that information in front of me, we're very happy to work with Mr. Page and work through the process. If it appears there's a sticking point, you know, I think we can work through it. Not having that in front of me and not knowing what the issues were going to be, I, I just... I don't know the answer to your question, um, but we can certainly find out what has transpired. And I'm, and I'm, a, oh ma'am, yes. So Ms. Sanders, are you 
just uh, we have the director of park and recs here correct yes. i mean do you have anything that you can add hi good evening again um i received an email today in response to the gun show being held on july 3rd to the 5th um, where kurt who is the manager of the auditorium spoke with mr page and due to the covid um, restrictions of 50 percent capacity of the auditorium we simply recently asked him for his plan to be able to hold the show in july and this email illustrates you know his plan so we were going to go ahead with this plan for the july show i just got the email today though and you know um kurt did mention that he told mr page that there is a council meeting tonight and we'll have more guidance and direction and get back with him so so as, my question is on the two officers why is that required um we have been going by guidelines that are put out um for special events okay and depending on certain criteria whether it's a fair or a play or a gun show or a concert it has certain criteria of how many people you expect and how many police officers you should have um, at the function. It was and that's just like a national special event, uh, sort of like a graphic, um, just illustration of how many people you should have at that point. So that's what we've been requiring for at least six months now for in that criteria. Yeah. Whatever type of event it is, we've gone by this chart. Hmm. All right. What about the parking lot use and being able to be outside I'm, with tables? I'm not aware of when that might have changed, or and this is the first time I've heard of anyone requesting it. So I'd have to look into that. Okay, the mayor, can I can I can I have some direction? So real quick, if that's all right, um, I would I would ask or counsel the director of staff to work with the, uh, with the gentleman here and and you know clear up any issues uh, you know in regards to um, you know making it difficult to operate for for the uh, the gun show and stuff. So I, I would ask that and whatever perceived, I want to remind the staff that these are also my Second Amendment rights and I don't tread on them lightly whatsoever. Uh, and I'm sure some of the other uh, uh, members may feel that also uh, that way also. So that's what I'm asking. Uh, I know again things are moving at a fast pace, and you know we're now in, from one to two, and really we had to have that conversation because we're we don't meet again this month. Right. We're coming around the corner. We actually we don't meet again until after the show's over. So it's one of those things that's got to come up. We can discuss it. Their staff can work with them, clear clear any problems up. They can be fixed, and we'll move forward. I mean, are you okay with that, sir? Sir. All right, Miss Minus. Mayor. I'm very receptive to anything you would like to do. Thank you, okay. sir. Okay, Miss Minus. Now. Okay, um, I, I think I heard uh, the city manager said that tonight, this is the first time that you've heard anything about this or even from the events that's happened before. This is the first time that you've heard this, mm -hmm. like us or the rest of the council. The concerns that have been brought up by Mr. Page, yes. Okay. And we will, like we will with any of our residents and customers and, and those folks that we transact business with, we'll, we'll do our best to, to make things work. That's what we try to do. Um, the only thing, you know, without having the, you know, the, the ordinance in front of me that I know offhand that um, is in the governor's order as it relates to auditoriums is the 50% capacity. If that changes by the time of the date of the show, um, then then certainly we would change just like with any of our other facilities. And, and we're very clear from council that, you know, we are not to be any more restrictive than what the governor's order said. So, you know, we're clear on that. If there's been a misunderstanding, we can clear it up. If there's a rule or a regulation, um, then we'll work through that and, um, you know, right. can can keep you updated just via via email since we don't meet individually. 
And, and, and if I may, Miss Minus, and, and, that's, and that's a good point. The first time she, she did hear of it, uh, there's actually been emails going going out back and forth about it. I spoke to him just a couple days ago, been getting a lot of calls. I've been very busy. I know you're very busy with everything going on, and it, I figured it'd be easier. Not putting a city manager, she's done her job. I'm very happy. I'm not complaining about the city manager or city attorney, mm -hmm. but the fact that it's a lot easier to speak here, get him here again. We don't meet again for another for another probably another month so again 14 you know it, it's really it's like earlier when you know when you know we made the decision we made earlier it's the first time i heard a lot of stuff and they come in and we got it all hashed out so my my goal was to work with my fellow council members come to a great solution have a direction i feel like i've done that okay oh, thank you okay. ma'am okay yeah. i uh, i yeah i just like to keep you know the city manager just don't like for her to be blindsided if you will on certain things so you know, now, and I know uh, this council will work with the Ralph Snake. You know, we'll get it resolved, you know, uh, and, and hopefully amicably. Um, but um, I, I just, you know, uh, it just bothered me that, you know, she said that this was the first time. I understand everybody's super busy. You know, we're all chasing our tails. It's, we're so busy, you know, but um, Thank you. I, I look forward, you know, uh, you know, to come into the gun show so I can buy another one. Okay. <laughs> so. Okay. Very good. All right. So thank you, thank Mr. You Page. Very much. We'll so they, work with thank you. you all. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank so, you, Council. Council, it's 11 o'clock. I need a motion to extend our meeting. So move. All right. Second. I have a second. motion by Ms. Minus, second by uh, Ms. Thomas to extend our meeting to uh, for the rest of the uh, agenda discussion. Seeing none, those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, and I vote aye, and the motion passes. Okay, so we're into board appointments. Item number 22, 22A, appointment of two regular members to the Citizens Advisory Board. So, Mr. McEwen. Thank you, Mayor. This is for the appointment of two members to that board, and staff's recommendation would be to appoint the first alternate, David Walker, and the loan outside applicant, Diane Penley, as regular members. All right, so I need a motion to appoint. All right. Second. I have a motion by Mr. LaRusso, second by Ms. Minus. Discussion? Seeing none, those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? And I vote aye, and the motion passes. Item B, Code Enforcement Board. This board has four members whose terms expire later this year and one alternate member vacancy. So. Uh, staff's requested action is one motion to reappoint Arthur Derrico, James Teal, Thomas Sam, and Ralph Durham, and a second motion to appoint the loan outside applicant Michael Fournier as the second alternate member. Okay. So, council. So move. Second. Second. All right. So, we have a motion um, on the first bullet by Ms. Minus, second by uh, Ms. Thomas. Discussion? Seeing none, those in favor say aye. Aye. Those op opposed, and I vote aye, and the motion passes. And to appoint Michael Fourier as the second alternative member. Council? So moved. Second. All right, by Ms. Sanders, second by Ms. Minus. Discussion? Seeing none, those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, and I vote aye, and the motion passes. Item C is the historic and agri uh, art, no, I was going to say agricultural, mm -hmm. uh, architectural review board. <laughs> I love so, it. I'm, I'm thinking make, of vegetables. Make your own yes. word. <laughs> so move. Second. All right, I have a motion. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. So <laughs> move. That, that All right, was, Mr. McEwen. I, I thought you were changing the name to the, <laughs> the, the agriculture <laughs> board. I was going to chime in there. All right, so. Mr. McEwen. What we'd like council to do is uh, the, fir the first alternates term on this board will expire later. Later this month, he is not seeking reappointment, so there are two alternate member vacancies. We have two outside applications on file, so that is staff's recommendation to appoint Sarah Brangan and Krista Bennett to the alternate member positions. So move. Second. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I have a motion for approval by Ms. Thomas, second by Mr. Thomas. Discussion? Seeing none, those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, and I vote aye, and the motion passes. Uh, D D is the old O'Galley Riverfront Community Redevelopment Agency Advisory Committee, Mr. McEwen. So again, four members of this board have terms that are expiring uh, this month. 
they would all like to be reconsidered for appointment. There's an alternate member vacancy on this board as well. There's one outside applicant. So staff's requested action would be to reappoint those current members. And then a second motion to appoint the lone outside applicant, Cameron Mitchell, as a second alternate. All right, thank you, Mr. McEwen. Council, what is your pleasure? So moved. Second. All right, I have a motion for approval by Mr. LaRusso, second by Mr. Thomas. Discussion? Seeing none, those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, and I vote aye, and the motion passes. All right, the second motion to appoint Cameron Mitchell as second al alternate. Council, what is I'll your pleasure? Move. All right. Second. I have a motion for approval by Ms. Thomas, second by Ms. Minus. Discussion? Seeing none, those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, and I vote aye, and the motion passes. All right, E, Planning and Zoning Board. Okay, last one of the night. There are multiple members, uh, multiple vacancies on the Planning and Zoning Board right now. Uh, I have an update to your agenda report. You might see a blue memo on the dais. We received an application from a qualified individual to serve on this board late, late this afternoon. So that application has been provided to you for consideration. So the actual motion is we only have two uh, applications on file. So staff's recommendation would be to appoint uh, Stefan Brugeman and um, I have Diane Kalea as regular members to the Planning and Zoning Board. So move. Second. All right, I have a motion for approval by Ms. Thomas, uh, second by Mr. Thomas. Discussion? Seeing none, those in favor? Aye. Say aye. 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 Those opposed? And I vote aye and the motion passes. All right, we are done with that. Okay, petitions, remonstrances, and communications. Mayor? Yeah, Ms. Tom, uh, excuse me, Ms. Minus. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. That's my sister. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Your sister. Yes. <laughs> nicer one. <laughs> nicer sister. Mayor, uh, I, just, right. I just like Minus. to take a minute to uh, please bear with me, Council, if I may. I know we're packing up, ready to go, but please just allow me a, 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 just a quick second. Probably should have done this earlier, but um, it's just on my heart. I, I need to get this out. Um, the recent weeks since May 21st, 25th have been a nation and a world of protest and unfortunately looting and arson. As I've stated before at another function, my heart was hurt immensely to see the video of George Floyd's life being snuffed out by a cold-hearted police officer. And on top of that, his fellow officers stood there complacent while George Floyd was repeatedly saying, I can't breathe. What hurts me even more was that in his final breath, he called out for his mother. Personally, as many of us on council are mothers, was that I can put myself in his shoes and ask myself, what could I do to ensure that this doesn't happen to minorities in my community? More so in his calling out to his mother. George was really calling out to America. He was calling out to her to show her what injustice looked like. Let us not be silent in these dark times, but let us strive to be that beacon of light that our nation and our world needs right now. I read our city manager's letter today, which was addressed to all city employees. And I genuinely am very grateful for the compassion and empathy that she has shown. Furthermore, Mm -hmm. I have the utmost faith in our police chief, command staff, police officers, this city council, because of the relationship between the community and the police, police department is one of respect and trust. Let me be very clear. I'm not saying that we've gotten it right 100% of the time, but if there is an issue or concern, the police chief, Melbourne Police Community Relations Council, the NAACP, and community leaders sit down at the table and work things out that is agreeable to all parties. 
I'm here to see continuous work and improvements to the police department, for there is yet still much work to be done. Lastly, I want to invite each of you, and I look forward to our city council and staff attending the Community Relations Council meeting this Thursday at seven o'clock. Prior to that meeting is a March at 6 p.m. We're gonna walk around the community, probably three quarters of a mile or less. And we're gonna begin at Joseph Davis Community Center and we're gonna end there. Okay, just making a circle around the community. The meeting will start promptly at 7 p.m. Social distancing is enforced, strictly enforced, and masks will be worn. The temperatures will be taken prior to you entering the meeting. So after you finish walking, please stand in the shade so that the temperature will be less than 99 or a low grade fever. I say that my heart is heavy and I'm, I'm very excited about where we're going, where the council is going, where our city manager is taking us, where the police department is taking us. But there's still work to be done. We can remember the police officer who had the chase in Palm Bay made the disparaging remarks. And the city manager, police chief and all, immediately addressed that and resolved that issue. We've had rogue policemen in the past, and those were also aggressively, and those were resolved to the council and to the community. I'm asking that we continue in that format. If we continue as a council to be abreast of what's going on, not only for black men, can go for white men as well. But I'm asking for your compassion and understanding as we go through these days ahead. We still have more um, marches, Black Lives Matter, Blue Lives Matter, all lives matter. All of it counts. But right now, black lives are the ones across the world that has the issue. And I'm just asking for your compassion. Thank you. Mayor. Thank you, Ms. Minus. Mayor. All right, yeah, uh, Vice Mayor Alfrey. Uh, Ms. Minus, thank you so much. Um, I'll be there Thursday. Uh, I helped Corey with the, uh, putting, helping with that, uh, put that together early at six. Uh, thank you very much for everything you've done for, for Thursday. Uh, again, I will be there. Uh, addressed our city manager. That was a very mm -hmm. thoughtful and caring message you gave out to our employees. Uh, that really uh, hit the heart. That that came from your heart, and you could read that. Yes. You you know we all can read something if it you know if it's it's buttered up. But I'll tell you right now, that was a very that's probably one of the best statements I think I've ever read from any city manager. And I read a lot. I read more. I read more than you think I do. But so I just want to say kudos. That was outstanding. Mm -hmm. uh, lastly, um, had been a very busy week for me. I did meet Green Gables down. Uh, they had contacted me. Uh, if you've been in there, they've got numerous roof leaks. Very bad. Um, I am the past president of the Space Coast Life Resor uh, License Roof Association. Uh, the, the current president, Justin from Huff, he went down with me. We surveyed everything. We put a drone on it. And then we had a meeting on uh, Thursday night where we're going to, uh, Mr. Jackson was there. We're going to all get together and, and try to redo the whole thing for him when it comes to the coatings. Uh, it's extensive work. There's a lot of rotten wood. There There's is. probably tens of tens of thousands of dollars of work. But you know, we our last project, we we donated a roof for a veteran, put it on and off in like two hours. Everything was done, you know. So we got enough manpower. So, but they had mentioned you, Miss Minus. They mentioned you, Miss Sanders. They mentioned you know you, Mayor and Debbie. They, I mean, they're very friends of the council. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I just want to let you know that that's that's one of the busy. 
there's a lot of work for this week, and, and uh, that's something that uh, we're going to address. The only thing we're waiting on that real quick is they're trying to adjust the uh, uh, the, fr the frame, try to get the frame straight, uh, get it leveled, and from then, because if you do that, if you don't level first, and yeah, you know, that's right. so they're doing that now. So we, uh, Justin is making the, uh, uh, he's putting everything together right now. So just want to let you know. Yeah, good. I'm just uh, going to backtrack just a little bit, um, <laughs> Mr. Alfrey, in that uh, a few, maybe a few council ago, we talked about the money raising for Green Gables, mm -hmm. and they did meet their goal. I don't know if um, some of us have seen that online or whatever. So they met their grant matching goal. So now it's in the grant's hands to uh, match that, which they're very confident that they will. So that's why now all of this building and construction and fixing it is starting to go. Oh, so stay tuned for different functions that they're going to have a renaissance fair out there to raise some money and they're going to have some pretty neat things coming up. All right, I got Ms. Thomas and then Mr. Thomas. I just have a question back on the Community Relations Council, the meeting in the March. Um, have we got it set up with Melbourne PD or anybody to help um, with parking issues? I'm just thinking that um, we might have quite a few people attending and I know just even when we do the big community relations meeting that we do out there when we have the judges and all the officials come in, um, the parking gets completely taken up just from that alone. And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm thinking they'll probably have at least triple that amount of people at this. I don't know what the plan is, but I know that there was a coordination meeting today and there'll be follow up through the week. So we'll make sure that if it hasn't been addressed already that it will be. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, Mr. Thomas. Yeah, and this is to go uh, with uh, Paul uh, Councilman Alfrey referenced in one of the Facebook posts there about our parks. They thought that were closed, that were really open, and so Galley basically shut down their youth baseball league for, for the summer. So that has really bothered me. Uh, so I contacted uh, Mr. Ed O'Neill, who's basically the district administrator uh, for the Little League system here in Bavard County. Sure. And I was asking him if, if there's any way that these kids that are in Melbourne that, that were shut out of O'Galley, if they can transfer and play some, uh, some other place here in the county. And they can. They can go to West Melbourne and play. They can go to Melbourne Beach and play. They can go out to Bureau to play. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to work with Councilman Alfred to get that information of, as far as the points of contact for each one of the leagues, get it on his post. And if we can, I don't know if we can post it on the city website too, for any uh, kids here in Melbourne who were shut out of O'Galley, they could go to these other places and sign up and play. So, uh, but it, it has really bothered me, these kids, I mean, the Melbourne kids are the only ones that are shut out right now in Brevard County from being able to play Little League Baseball. And so whoever that league president is in O'Galley, they need to go. Well, and, and <laughs> if I can piggyback, there was some misinformation put out that the reason that the O'Galley Little League canceled because of the city of Melbourne would not allow them on the field, which uh, our Nikki, our parks director, had talked to them, asked them for their plan, waited, they never heard from them, and then they made the decision afterwards. I kind of did some uh, clarifying, tried to, I did it nicely, this, I mean, we're here for you. Uh, the city manager said, I'll make myself available on a, you know, she told me that on a Sunday. We all jumped through hoops and their final decision is, and I think it, it comes down to, you know, they just, they just, they're, they're going to, they're going to try fall ball. Now there are challenges and that's on them. That's on their board. That's not on me, but I just made it perfectly clear to them that, Hey, we're as a city of Melbourne, we're here to help you. And, and, uh, so there's that. And I would miss minus want to bring one thing up here. Uh, there is some credible information that there's going to be a group requesting to defund the police at your at, at the Community Relations Council. So I just want to give you a heads up on that, that uh, I know I'm not for defunding the police, I'm but I just either. want to let you know um, that it, it, it's it's from credible from Corey that, that, that they're going to try this. They're going to come. They're gonna oh, they're definitely right? coming. Okay. okay. All right. Um, I would actually if make I, a motion when it comes about to increase the budget to the police. Actually, um, everyone is invited, and uh, this is the this is uh, I know we get get, get, get ready to go. No, we um, got time. <laughs> um, the format is that the, everyone will have a card. We got that concept from Coco where you have an index card to turn in your, you know, your, your uh, question, all right? Everybody's not gonna have a mic, you know? I mean, you're not gonna come up and just 
you know, hog the mic. Um, you hand your, write your question down and hand it to me or whomever, and then it'll get to the moderator who's Leonard Ross. Uh, the Mr. Leonard Ross, who is very well versed in all of this, mm -hmm. okay. Um, so we will have control. They, we, if they want to bring their signs or whatever, but you know, it, it will be very well managed. We talked about that in the in the nine o'clock meeting this morning. Oh, okay, but if they're going to bring so, signs, make sure they're not blocking people's views, and you know. Okay, thanks for that. How about no okay. signs allowed? Or yeah. Like in here. No signs yeah, we don't because you're blocking people. So I, I'm, that's just a suggestion. And I, I, I believe Miss Minus, that's your call. Yeah, right. you can I support you on whatever you want to do on them. Just letting you know. Inside the building, yeah. Like outside during the walk. Whatever. Yeah, doing the walk, but yeah, Absolutely. not yeah. in the meeting. Yeah, yeah. but in the okay. meeting, if you have it, like you're blocking out everybody, even though we're doing social distancing too. Right. Okay. You know? But okay, I, I'll um, I'll definitely pass that on. Yeah, no signs. Yes, ma'am. All right. all right, make sure you check your temperature on your way in. You're checking my temperature. Yep, that's right. <laughs> Anything else? Uh, you know, all right. <laughs> all right, let's, it's all right, right. so I'm going to adjourn this meeting at 1122. Uh -oh. All right, good night. Good night, ready for a margarita now. I might have to wake up my husband. Good morning. Hey, that was a long meeting. Yes. Yeah, it was. 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 attending before I got on council and they would go to uh, not planning but when I come attend a council meeting I mean they would be talking about the the uh, budget the uh, consent agenda they would pull the arms of the special